Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the members of the public. We welcome you to the regularly scheduled meeting of the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors. Today is Tuesday, April 18th, 2023, and we take note that a full complement of the board is present, the chief executive officer, the county council, the executive officer, and the sergeant at arms are all here to assist. And we will begin today's board meeting with our county's land acknowledgement. The County of Los Angeles recognizes that we occupy land originally and still inhabited and cared for by the Tongva, the Tataviam, Serrano, Quiche, and Chumash peoples. We honor and pay respect to their elders and descendants, past, present, and emerging, as they continue their stewardship of these lands and waters. We acknowledge that settler colonization resulted in land seizure, disease, subjugation, slavery, relocation, broken promises, genocide, and multi-generational trauma. This acknowledgement demonstrates our responsibility and commitment to truth, healing, and reconciliation, and to elevating the stories, culture, and community of the original inhabitants of Los Angeles County. We are grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on these ancestral lands. We are dedicated to growing and sustaining relationships with native peoples and local tribal governments, including, in no particular order, the Fernandino Tataviam Band of Mission Indians, the Gabrielino Tongva Indians of California Tribal Council, the Gabrielino Tongva San Gabriel Band of Mission Indians, the Gabrielino Band of Mission Indians, Quiche Nation, the San Manuel Band of Mission Indians, the San Fernando Band of Mission Indians. The invocation this morning will be led by Rabbi Denise Eager, Congregation Kolami from the Third District, and that will be followed by the Pledge of Allegiance led by James Silva, Gunnery Sergeant, United States Marine Corps from my district, the 4th District. And if you're able to join us and stand, please do so now. Today, the Jewish community observes Yom HaShoah, our Holocaust Memorial Day. We mourn and remember the six million Jews who were violently murdered by the Nazi fascist regime during World War II. We will remember that Jews were blamed for the ills of German society. Raging anti-Semitism resulted in the near annihilation of European Jewelry. On this day, we remember also those of other races, ethnicities, and sexual orientation, the differently abled, the Roma, gays and lesbians, political prisoners, union members, who were also tortured and imprisoned and targeted by the hatred in the name of the Nazis. As anti-Semitism rises in our own country and here in our own county, as racism and misogyny and anti-LGBT legislation is enacted around our country, today I sound the alarm here in this place. Together we pray we will stand tall for one another, learning to love our neighbor as ourselves. We remember what happens when good people close their eyes to those who are suffering and so we pray, holy blessed source of the universe, send your abundant love and care to all who reside in our Los Angeles County. God, there are good people struggling each day. Hear their prayer and their cries as you once heard the cries of the Israelites in bondage. Too many have no shelter. Too many are ill without the resources they need. Too many are living in fear, having immigrated to our land without papers. Too many people addicted to drugs and alcohol trying to numb themselves from the pain of each day, and too many trying to make ends meet while caring for themselves and their family. Show us the way forward to love our neighbors. Show us the way forward to welcoming the stranger. Show us the way forward in love to healing your world. Teach us to honor each precious human being, gay and straight, trans and non-binary, black and white, Latino and Asians as your holy creations no matter our station in life. And guide these, our Board of Supervisors, with compassion and wisdom. 
grant them good health and stamina as they help to solve these thorny and difficult issues through good government, government that cares and government that serves the people of our county. And bless all those who toil in carrying out these policies, all who work for our LA County, from clerks to commissioners, from our sheriff's deputies and firefighters, from assistants to janitors, send your blessings to all who dwell in service of your people here in our great county of Los Angeles. And help us to remember to be extensions of your hands here on earth. We can affect the promise and hope of your love. And let us say, amen. Please place your uh, right hand over your heart and repeat after me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good morning, everyone. I want to thank Rabbi Denise Egger from Congregation Kolami in West Hollywood for joining us this morning to lead our invocation, which is particularly special because today is Yom HaShoah. Rabbi Egger was raised in Memphis, Tennessee, graduated with honors from the University of Southern California with a bachelor's degree in religion in 1982 and three years later received her master's degree from Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion and was ordained as rabbi in 1988 at the New York campus of HUC. Rabbi Egger is also a senior rabbinic fellow of the Shalom Hartman Institute and received her Doctor of Divinity from Hebrew Union College in 2013. She received a Doctor of Philosophy from Ben-Gurion University of the Negev in 2022. Rabbi Egger believes that activism is at an important part of her rabbinate. She has worked extensively with people with AIDS, including work on advisory boards, committees, and organizations championing the work, and continues to facilitate Kolami's Jewish HIV plus support group monthly. Rabbi Egger was also instrumental in helping pass the March to March 2000 Central Conference of American Rabbis Resolution in support of officiation and gay and lesbian commitment ceremonies. She is co-author of the official reform movement gay and lesbian wedding liturgy and in June 2008 had the honor of officiating at the first legal wedding for a lesbian couple in California. Rabbi Egger's work and accolades are profound. Throughout her career, she has served on, and let, served on and led dozens of committees, worked with numerous professional organizations, and worked tirelessly to support the Jewish and LGBTQ plus community. She is widely published with dozens of articles in some of the most well-known magazines and newspapers and contributions in numerous books. She has also received dozens of awards, including the Human Rights Campaign Equality Award in 2011 and 2014 City of Los Angeles Pioneer Award during Pride Month. I wanna personally thank Rabbi Egger for the work she has done for the Jewish community, for our LGBTQ plus community, and all of Los Angeles County, and I am grateful to call her a friend. I'm very proud she is with us today. Thank you for leading us in prayer. Thank you, Rabbi, for being with us t this morning. And thank you to uh, Mr. James Silva, who led us in the Pledge of Allegiance this morning. James served in the United States Marine Corps from 1992 to 2013 and ended his service as an E-7 gunnery sergeant. He was part of the Marine Transport Squadron 1 VMR-1, where he worked on search and rescue helicopters. He was deployed 15 times, including nine combat deployments, seven of which were in Iraq. His awards include the U.S. Meritorious Service Medal, as well as an award for Operation Iraqi Freedom. 
Mr. Silva graduated from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in 2006 and has been serving in the aerospace industry for 30 years. Currently, he serves as a quality inspector for SpaceX, supporting the reliable and safe launch of the Falcon 9 rocket. Mr. Silva is a longtime Lakewood resident. In his spare time, he also volunteers as lead trainer for veterans and first responders, an organization that offers free training, collars, and leashes to veterans and first responders and their service dogs. He's proudly trained over 100 dogs. And here with James is his service dog, Sierra, a six-year-old Belgian, Herman, keep it down. Uh, Six-year-old Belgian, now I gotta understand the pronunciation, the Mal Malinois. Malinois, Malinois, well you guys know that. Uh, James, thank you and Sierra for your service and dedication, especially as we look towards recognizing National Therapy Animal Day on April 13th. And we've all been back here uh, with Sierra since you've been up on the dais for, for the last 30 minutes. Sierra is a well-behaved dog, and uh, I've been learning how she supports you. And it's, a, it's really a great story. So thank you, James. And on behalf of a very grateful Los Angeles County for your service, and especially for being with us this morning and leading the pledge, I have the certificate for you and Sierra. Now, Madam Chair, I would like to introduce two sweet sisters, Pebbles and Daisy. These are Chihuahua Terrier mixes, and they are 10 weeks old. And um, they are both staying at the Downey Animal Care Center. And if you'd like to open your heart and your home to them, you can call 562-940-6898 for details. And then this month, um, if you like big dogs, the Department of Animal Care and Control has a special program going on called Bring Out the Big Dogs. Fees are waived for all dogs, 35 pounds or bigger, now through April 21st. Big or small, there is a dog for us all, and I would encourage you to go online and, um, and uh, meet many of the animals. I think we've got a lot of kittens, don't we? We've got a lot of kittens, and if you don't want to adopt, you can foster to help us uh, give these beautiful animals a loving home. So this is Daisy and Pebbles. Oh, they are Thank you. Which one's Daisy and which one's Pebbles? This is Daisy and this is Pebbles. Oh, right? Very cute. Yeah. It has got car sickness, so he's holding it tight. Oh. <laughs> okay, come on. Oh, they're so cute. <laughs> Thank you. Um, all right, we're just going to remind everybody in the audience that um, we're not going to have people um, speaking out out of turn in the audience, and uh, uh, we'll be watching you because we want to make sure this meeting is run uh, respectfully and in an efficient manner. So that is kind of everybody's first warning. Um, Executive officer, uh, let's move on to today's agenda. Can you please call the agenda? Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the board. Today's agenda will begin on page two, consent calendar, Board of Supervisors, items one through 31. On item one, this includes an addition as indicated on the supplemental agenda. On item four, Supervisor Mitchell would like to abstain from the vote. On item five, Supervisor Mitchell requests that this item be held. Also, this includes a revision as indicated on the supplemental agenda. On item six, Supervisor Barger would like to abstain from the vote. On item seven, Supervisor Hahn requests that this item be held. Also, this includes a revision as indicated on the supplemental agenda. On item 10, Supervisor Hahn requests that this item be referred back. On item 18, Supervisor Solis requests that this item be held. On item 19, Supervisor Mitchell would like to abstain from the vote. On item 21, Supervisor Solis requests that this item be held. On item 22, this includes a correction as indicated on the supplemental agenda. 
On item 23, Supervisor Mitchell requests that this item be held. Also, this includes a revision as indicated on the supplemental agenda. On item 24, this includes a revision as indicated on the supplemental agenda. On item 26, Supervisor Mitchell and Barger would like to abstain from the vote. On item 27, Supervisor Horvath requests that this item be held. On item 28, Supervisor Mitchell and Barger would like to abstain from the vote. On item 29, Supervisor Horvath requests that this item be held. Also, this includes a revision as indicated on the supplemental agenda. On page 17, administrative matters, items 32 through 80. On item 42, Supervisor Barger declared a conflict pursuant to government code section 84308 and recruits herself from the vote. On item 50, Supervisor Horvath requests that this item be held. On item 63, Supervisor Barger declared a conflict pursuant to government code section 84308 and recruits herself from the vote. On page 46, this includes miscellaneous additions to the agenda, which were posted more than 72 hours in advance of the meeting as indicated on the supplemental agenda. On item 78D, Supervisor Mitchell would like to abstain from the vote. On item 78E, Supervisor Solis requests that this item be held. On item 78F, Supervisors Mitchell and Barger would like to abstain from the vote. On page 47, budget matters. On item 81, this item will be held for discussion. On page 48, special district agendas. This is the agenda for the Los Angeles County Development Authority. On item 2D, this is a recommendation to adopt and instruct the chair to sign a resolution authorizing the issuance, sale, and delivery of tax-exempt multifamily housing mortgage revenue bonds <coughs> or notes in an aggregate principal amount not to exceed 41680300 to finance the site acquisition, construction, rehab rehabilitation, or development of West LA VA buildings 156 and 157 apartments located in the unincorporated county of Los Angeles. On page 52, this is the agenda for the Regional Park and Open Space District. On page 53, notices for closed sessions. The requests for referred backs through CS2 are before you. Thank you. Moved by Supervisor Solis, uh, seconded by Supervisor Barger to approve these items. And without objection, that will be the order. That completes the reading of the agenda, Madam Chair. Okay, Executive Officer, please play our code of conduct. Ladies and gentlemen, may I please have your attention. The meeting of the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors is about to commence. A code of conduct will now be read, and we request that you comply with it to ensure the efficient administration of the meeting. Members of the public, it is your right to participate in today's board hearing and the board encourages such participation. However, the right of the public to address the board must be balanced with the need to ensure that public comment does not interfere with the orderly course of the board's business. All are reminded to abide by the following rules. Speakers must cease speaking immediately when their time has ended. Public comment on agenda items must relate to the subject matter of that item. General public comment is limited to subjects within the jurisdiction of the board. Public comment does not include the right to engage in a dialogue with board members or staff. Please remain respectful of the forum and refrain from uttering, writing, or displaying profane, personal, threatening, derogatory, demeaning, or other abusive statements toward the board, any member thereof, staff, or any other person. Members of the audience should be respectful of the views expressed by speakers, staff, and board members, and may not clap, cheer, whistle, or otherwise disrupt the orderly conduct of the meeting. Any person engaging in conduct that disrupts the meeting is subject to being removed from the board meeting. And finally, if you witness conduct or behavior by other members of the public that disrupts your ability to remain engaged or participate in this meeting, please notify the sergeant at arms or other county staff. Thank you for your cooperation. Okay, thank you. Um, today, we're, we're doing something a little bit different. We're going to go first into closed session. 
Um, and then when we return, we will begin with item 81, the recommended budget. Then items 5, 7, and item 18, which will be taken up with item 21, followed by items 23, 27, 29, and 50, and ending with item 78E, which were held by supervisors, and finishing with the remaining items not held by the board and general uh, public comment. But bef uh, before, are, we, are you reading the call-in? Okay, so before we begin, Executive Officer, please read the call-in information that was also provided on the agenda and explain the speaking rules. Uh, but I think we should tell people that we're going into closed session first so they don't think we're taking up items right away. That is correct. We're reading the um, instructions for the uh, public comment on closed session before we go into closed oh, session. Oh, this is for closed session. Okay, thank you. For members of the public wishing to participate remotely, as indicated on the agenda, please call 877-226-8163 and use participant code number 133-6503. Members of the public per participating remotely and in the boardroom, you will have the opportunity to address the board throughout the meeting. You will receive one minute to address the board on items held by supervisors and up to a total of three minutes on all remaining items and general public comment for a total of six minutes for this meeting. Please monitor your time and the items you're signing up for as your name will not be called once your time has elapsed. For members of the public joining us remotely, when the board moves to the item you wish to address, promptly press one then zero to be entered into the speaking queue. Please remember to turn down the volume on your device as soon as the moderator calls on you or there will be an echo. You will need to press one, then zero for each item on which you would like to speak. To ensure we hear from both in-person and telephonic speakers, we will alternate between the two speaking cues. Members of the public who are in attendance, when you hear or see your name displayed on the screen, please come down to the front of the boardroom and staff will assist you. Please do not approach the podium until directed to do so. We will begin by calling in-person speakers, and while they are coming forward, we will take telephonic speakers. Okay, what, who's the, uh, do we have any speakers for closed session? Yes, um, but before we do that, uh, for members of the public on the telephone, please plus one and zero, and uh, now to comment on closed session items only. So well, Herman, Herman, please come forward and staff will assist you. Moderator, may we have the first remote speaker, please? Our first participant is Eric Previn. Please go ahead. Uh, it's Eric Previn, and I know you're going into closed session. I just wanted to remind you that you have an enormous agenda, including item 81, and I'm not really clear why you would make everybody wait uh, to go into closed session in advance. Uh, it's a very eight unusual behavior, and it's part of these cancellations, which I'm really not a big fan of. I, I love that you like to have everybody together and have multiple recognitions for months, weeks, and days, and hand out all the good stuff, but we have to have the meeting, and people can't be waiting around for hours while you're in closed session talking to the unions. There's a lot of time for those kinds of negotiations. What are they so it's rushed? They want to get to the press? I mean, it's just, it's not appropriate, and I'm very upset. But have a great morning. Our next participant will go to the line of Jose Martinez. Please, you may begin. Hi, I'm here for general comment. Um, I live in District 4. I'm an LA County employee and a Christian. On March 7, 2023, the Board of Supervisors approved Agenda Item 15, raising the progressive pride flag at LA County facilities during uh, the entire Excuse me, I'm sorry. This is, um, this is only for closed session items. Sounds like you're speaking on general public comment, so you're gonna have to wait. Yes, Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. This is for closed session items only. Next speaker, please. Next participant is from the line of Genevieve Claverell. You may begin. Yes, uh, good morning, Board of Supervisor. I just, you know, I have my same complaint to have equal session CS1 about department head is, you know, does not meet. 
the requirement of the Brown Act where more information is needed. But thank you for doing it. What concerns me is that when you go back and look at the preceding uh, board supervisor, there was no report about either. You know, so that's concerning me. But anyway, have a good day. Talk to you later. Bye. Madam Chair, there are no other speakers in the queue to address the board. Okay, we'll go to in person. Herman, Herman. So we're looking at two settlements, one for $450,000 and the other in the case of 19 STCV 42076. Uh, uh, no, no, that, that's not close set. That's not what we're talking about in closed session. Well, Madam, can you hold my time? What are you, t what are you referring to? Because I'm on closed session here on this large print agenda. Do, do, you, want, do you want to show me where, where you're talking about? Because apparently this doesn't have what you're trying to explain. Oh, that, to yeah, that's, that's what we did last time, last meeting. So this is about today's closed session. Well, is, which, which number is it then? It's CS1 and CS2. Okay, so, so we're dealing with the Department of Head Performance Evaluations, right? Correct. And basically uh, under 42 U.S.C. 1983 in the color of law 242 in section 245, I'm going to refer to the issue here as a dirty nigger because it is my okay, civil Okay, thank you. That, you're that's your second warning e so far excuse today. Excuse me, Madam Chair. Second warning. I'm putting it into the record. Second warning. This you're you're a, being offensive, and by the way, we're getting complaints from this, the public. This so is strictly one a, more this is strictly offensive a case, remark, and this we'll is strictly ask you a to case leave. that I'm referring to, and you continue to interrupt me when I'm not using offensive, vulgar language. I'm repeating a Supreme Court case under That's Brandenburg not what we're versus talking Ohio, about U.S., in closed session. 295, 444, 1969, Okay, well, you're off record. topic, so thank you very much. So uh, we're done. We're done here. Um, next speaker, please. There are no other speakers, Madam Chair. Okay. Um, so that concludes our public comment for closed session. Um, while we're in closed session, we'll be showing some video presentations. Supervisor Barger has a video presentation recognizing the Armenian community and Warner Brothers' 100th anniversary. Um, and we ask the public's uh, indulgence as we go into closed session first, but we will be back out um, as soon as we can. Bye. In accordance with Brand Act requirements, notice is hereby given that the Board of Supervisors will convene in closed session to discuss item CS1, Department Head Performance Evaluation, and item CS2, Conference with Labor Negotiator Fiza Davenport and designated staff as indicated on the posted agenda. The purpose of Armenian History Month is to recognize Armenians who have made significant contributions to the community. I have three honorees this April. First, I'd like to recognize Dr. Anne Kar Karazakian, who was nominated by the Armenian Evangelical Union of North America. She is currently the head of UCLA's Energy and Propulsion Research Laboratory and is also the director of the Joint UCLA Air Force Research Laboratory Collaborative Center for Aerospace Sciences. Anne also serves as the inaugural director of the Promise Armenian Institute in UCLA, which gives me chills because that is an amazing institute. So now I want to recognize Silvana Fartunian, nominated by the Western Diocese of the Armenian Church of North America. Silvana is a founder of Nehruj, an organization based in Burbank that connects young Armenians with mentors in the Armenian Church and diocese. The relationship nurtured by Nehruj support an upcoming Armenian gen generation by helping them grow spiritually, personally, and professionally. And last but certainly not least is Dr. Eric Israelian, who is nominated by the ANCA Western Region as a longtime generous supporter of ANCA's efforts to promote the Armenian cause around the world. Dr. Israelian and his colleagues produced and released The Promise, a historical film set during the Armenian Genocide of 1915. Dr. Israelian allocated a portion of the film's proceeds to launch The Promise Institute of Human Rights and The Promise Armenian Institute at UCLA. We have a truly vibrant Armenian community in our county. I will do my part to help you thrive and succeed in the years to come. Since 1923, 
Warner Brothers has dazzled and delighted our screens with unforgettable stars and stories. This year, as the studio commences their centennial, they're looking back at all the shows and movies that have marked fond memories for generations. The brothers who started it all, from a family of Polish Jewish immigrants, revolutionized the industry. Four years after its founding, the studio was the first to introduce the sound in the jazz singer. The studio made its mark with classics that are still revered today, bringing big feelings through everything from Casablanca to The Exorcist, and big joy in everything from Looney Tunes to Friends. They're the revolutionaries who brought us Harry Potter and the DC Universe, introducing entertainment, action, and huge fandoms to the next generation. The studio has kicked off its centennial campaign, celebrating every story to honor their beloved and iconic characters. Since April is Arts Month, I cannot think of a better time to celebrate their extraordinary contributions to Los Angeles County and the world. I'm honored that their studio is now in the Fifth District, in the heart of the entertainment industry and creative economy. They mean so much to us locally, but their impact spans 220 countries and 50 different languages. They have always been the home of bold, impactful storytelling to entertain, inform, and inspire. I know this will continue to be the legacy in the next 100 years to come. I am proud to present Warner Brothers with a scroll on behalf of the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors. I'm joined today by Daphne Sagala with Warner Brothers, who will share more about the 100th anniversary celebration. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Supervisor. It is an honor to be here today and to accept this scroll. Warner Brothers looks forward to the next 100 years here in LA County.
gosh. Okay. Okay. Uh, good. Uh, is it still morning? Yes. Good morning. We are back in open session. Uh, Executive Officer, please read the report of action. The following is a report of action taken in closed session on April 18, 2023. Items CS1 and CS2, no reportable action was taken. Thank you. Okay, um, as previously indicated, uh, we will begin with item 81, the recommended budget, then items 5, 7, item 18, which will be taken up with item 21, followed by items 23, 27, 29, 50, and ending with item 78E, which were held by supervisors and finishing with the remaining items not held by the board and general public comment. So let's go right to uh, item 81. We're gonna begin with that item. Uh, our fiscal year 2023-24 recommended budget. And I would like to call on our Chief Executive Officer, Fizia Davenport, to present the fiscal 2023-24 recommended budget, after which I will open it up to my colleagues uh, to make remarks. And for members of the public on the telephone, press one then zero now to comment on this item, item 81, and Fizia. Yes. It's all yours. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning, uh, Board of Supervisors. And thank you for the opportunity to present our recommended budget for 2324. I have a very brief PowerPoint presentation to share with you this morning. But before I begin, I'd like to take a few minutes to air the latest in our series of animated videos explaining the Los Angeles County budget. This is our continued effort to really uh, simplify what is a very complex topic. Appropriately enough, this video is entitled A Very Large Budget with Strings Attached. Can we, uh, can we cue the video, please? LA County manages a multi-billion dollar budget. That might make it seem like the county has deep enough pockets to easily pay for every program and service imaginable. But look closer and you'll see that most county funding comes with strings attached. In other words, to receive the funding, we must provide certain important services to our residents. The biggest chunk of LA County's funding comes from the federal and state governments. Most of these funds are designated to help us provide required health and social services programs, paying for things like public hospitals, child welfare, and assistance to low-income families and individuals. And nearly all of this money comes with restrictions. It cannot be used for any other purpose. For example, the county can't take Medicare dollars and use that money to fix potholes no matter how critical the need. Another sizable portion of the budget is tied to the fees the county charges to cover the cost of providing specific services, like animal care and control, fire protection services, and sheriff's patrol services. Most of the balance of the county's funding comes from locally generated revenue, like property and sales taxes. This funding has fewer restrictions, but there can still be strings attached. These can include state and federal requirements that the county pay out of its own pocket to maintain certain levels of services. The spending associated with locally generated revenue is often described as net county cost, or NCC. NCC means the funding we must spend on programs and services that have no other revenue sources available to support them. The county also must draw on local funding to meet its contractual obligations, including operating agreements, building leases, and legal settlements. After all its obligations are met, the county has a pool of funding left that is truly unrestricted. In recent years, that pool of money has totaled a small fraction of the overall budget. Here's where things can get complicated. As the governing body for Los Angeles County, the Board of Supervisors must decide which programs to fund with these unrestricted dollars. Because there are always many more deserving programs than funds available, tough decisions and trade-offs are usually required. 
Launching a new program can mean moving money away from an existing program or having to search for new revenue sources. Since the board has no authority to impose taxes and Proposition 13 limits property tax increases, voters may sometimes be asked to approve special measures dedicated to funding specific efforts, like supporting parks or fighting homelessness. If approved, these dedicated funding streams become part of the county budget with their own restrictions on how they're used. To help make tough budget decisions, the board receives recommendations from the chief executive officer and also hears testimony from the public to learn about residents' priorities. And that's a quick look at where county funding comes from and how it all comes together to serve our residents and move L.A. County forward. For more information on the county budget, go to co.lacounty.gov slash budget. Thank you. Uh, as indicated at the end of the slide, uh, that video is available on the CEO's website and it is uh, available in both English and Spanish. Um, all of our videos have been translated into uh, Spanish. So um, I think that for those of us who know the county budget well, this video is a good reminder of the restrictions that are attached to most of our funding and of the tough decisions your board faces in allocating those funds that are not restricted. I'd like to thank our countywide communications team for developing this ongoing series of videos and also give a shout out to Angela Singover, Singer, who's the voiceover artist who so clearly explains the complexities of our county budget to the general public. She even makes plain sense of concepts like net county costs, which we all know is no easy feat. And as stated earlier, the video is available on our website. Now on to the details of this year's budget. If we could now bring up the presentation slides, please. So our theme uh, for this phase of our budget is sustaining commitments and building momentum. This year's recommended budget supervisors is all about sustaining our commitments to our ambitious work underway and to supporting our county workforce as we build momentum on key board priorities. Next slide, please. All budgets are milestones in their own way, but this year's recommended budget marks a particularly significant moment in time. It is our first budget since LA County emerged from the COVID-19 emergency and also the first since your board's declaration of the homelessness emergency. Supervisors, as you are no better than anyone else, LA County has been a very busy place over the past few years. Yet the pandemic did not slow our pace of innovation. If anything, it accelerated our progress as we brought new programs online and expanded the scope and reach of our services to the public, especially over the course of the last year. You'll see on the screen just a few visualizations of the multifaceted work underway from the 988 Alternative Crisis Response Line to our efforts to infuse equity into county processes through ARDI, our anti-racism, diversity, and initiative inclu inclusion initiative. You'll also see the four new departments, which were all launched in 2022, that are now up and running and serving diverse populations, older adults, as well as our young residents, people with disabilities, the justice involved, and those seeking economic opportunities for themselves and their businesses. We also launched the Poverty Alleviation Initiative and one of the nation's most expansive guaranteed income programs called Breathe, which is now underway. And of course, to carry out this board's vision of Care First, Gels Last, we created and are investing substantial resources in care first and community investment known as CFCI, which I'll discuss shortly in more detail. More than anything else, this recommended budget is built to sustain this essential work. Usually at this time of year, we would highlight new projects and programs recommended for funding. But this recommended budget reflects above all else a commitment to staying the course and to supporting and expanding upon this critical body of work that is now underway as we build toward truly transformative change. I'll take the next slide, please. 
balancing positive factors and future risks. The economic outlook that underlies this recommended budget is mixed. It reflects modest increases in property and sales tax revenues, although at a much lower growth rates than we saw last year. And the assessor, whose official forecast is anticipated this May, is concerned about how the current economic conditions will impact the local housing market and changes in assessed valuation. Beyond that, we're in a period of growing fiscal uncertainty, including uncertainty about the impacts of the state budget deficit, a dramatic slowdown in local real estate transactions that affect property taxes, and an unsettled economic environment in which recession remains a very real possibility. I'll speak later in my presentation about some of the specific pressures and risks on the county's short and long-term horizon. Next slide, please. These are the key facts of the budget before you. The total amount of the recommended budget is $43 billion, and that's $1.6 billion less than last year's adopted budget. This reflects lower fund balances in both the general fund and especially our special funds in district budget groups. Despite that, I am pleased to report that we have added 514 positions to help support critical work. For example, in providing more mental health services. For a total of 114,106 budgeted positions in our county workforce. Offsetting that positive news is that once again, funding requests from our county departments have exceeded our available resources. Although we are recommending $551.7 million in new funding, we received more than $1.9 billion in unmet needs requests. Of those, we are, refer we are deferring $813 million to future budget phases, leaving $1.1 billion in unmet needs. The new funding is recommended primarily to do a few things. Pay higher employee wages and benefits agreed upon during last year's contract negotiations. Cover increasing public assistance caseloads as part of the county's role as the provider of an economic safety net. Pay our contractual and legal settlements. And address a few departmental structural deficits, including the loss of federal child welfare revenues by DCFS and the end of the state CalFresh waiver match by DPSS. County matching funds are now required to draw down these benefits. And as I mentioned above, our new funding supports policies and commitments that the board has already prioritized. I'll take the next slide, please. Here are some more details around the most significant allocations in this recommended budget, which include $692 million to more urgently mobilize our response to the homelessness emergency. As you know, we are focusing intently on encampment resolution, close collaboration with our cities, providing additional interim and supportive housing, and expanding mental health and substance use disorder services. $288.3 million to fund year three of CFCI. This is ongoing funding and represents the fulfillment of our commitment to allocate 10% of locally generated unrestricted revenues as promised by Measure J. And I'll talk a little bit more in detail about that allocation in a later slide. We're also recommending nearly $50 million to improve conditions in the jails and nearly $7 million to support continued Sheriff's Department reforms, including reestablishing the Office of Constitutional Policing. And I'd like to highlight on that note, the $50 million that I have uh, just referred to is really um, aimed at supporting our obligations to provide constitutional policing in our jails and that is required and which is the focus of our DOJ consent decree. I'll take the next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit more about uh, CARE First Community Investment Funding. 
I wanted to make sure that the public has a full understanding, not just of the magnitude of the county's investment in CFCI, but also in how we arrived at the $288.3 million in ongoing funding for this board commitment. As a reminder for the public, although Measure J was overturned by the court, your board committed to fulfill the promise of Measure J by investing 10% of the county's locally generated unrestricted revenues by June of 2024 in CFCI programs to provide alternatives to incarceration and to provide direct community investments. We have achieved that commitment with this budget recommendation. Measure J, which is now known as CFCI, represented a sea change for LA County, an opportunity and a mandate to address the disproportionate impact of racial injustice through community investment and alternatives to incarceration. Although it did not defund any department, it did prohibit using the set aside funds for carceral systems and law enforcement agencies. I mentioned this background to help contextualize the substantial funding we are putting towards CFCI. And to help visualize this funding, the circles on this slide show that if CFCI were a department, it's dedicated ongoing annual funding from the county's general fund would exceed all but five of our existing departments. You'll see that the 288.3 million allocated for CFCI accounts for more net county costs than the departments of the district attorney, the public defender, public health, parks and recreation, and the alternate public defender. And all other departments with the notable exceptions of the sheriff's department, health services, DCFS, DPSS, and probation. We offer this illustration not to make uh, our other departments with less NCC envious or to obscure the large portion of NCC that is still dedicated to the Sheriff's Department, but rather to underscore the seriousness of the board's commitment to funding CFCI programs. To date, we have allocated $676 million for CFCI which reflects the total funded over the first three years, including one-time funds from the American Rescue Plan Act dollars. While some advocates remain dissatisfied, moving from zero to more than a half a billion dollars in funding in the space of three years is unprecedented just for just about any county initiative I can think of. We typically match new funding to the new organization's ability to put the money to work, and any new effort takes time to operationalize and to implement. In this case, the county has committed to a huge influx of funding into programs that are, quite frankly, still being ramped up or initiated. That has ramifications in terms of the pace of spending. As of March, $26.7 million of the CFCI and ARP funding has been spent, and another $89.4 million has been encumbered and is therefore on the way to being spent. We are making this trade-off to underscore the importance of investing in the community in this extraordinary way in order to honor the board's commitment to Measure J. And we are also working to accelerate the pace with which CFCI funds are being spent. Our detailed calculation of unrestricted revenues available for this funding will be repeated every year. And the amount of CFCI will vary accordingly. Though it will not be less than the 10% of the county's locally generated unrestricted revenues mandated by your board's budget policy. So to put it a different way, Every year, we will be required to calculate our, determine our locally generated revenues, further calculate the amount that's restricted and unrestricted, and then determine what the CFCI set aside amount will be for that budget year. 
the CFCI Advisory Committee will be making recommendations to the CEO for a year three planning, spending plan very soon. And I will return to your board with specific recommendations reflecting that input. Um, I'll take the next slide, please. As we consider our recommended budget for the upcoming fiscal year, I am mindful of the need to look down the road and at what's ahead of us. To create the heat chart you see on the slide, we needed to break out in more vivid colors just to illustrate the full gamut of risks and pressures that lie ahead, some manageable and others that will frankly demand extensive planning and probably some trade-offs. Items in yellow boxes on the grid represent impacts in our budget that are meaningful but are readily managed over time. These include our commitment to additional investments in youth jobs programs and affordable housing. As the text gets larger and the colors get redder and more intense, we are entering much more challenging territory with greater impact on our budget. This includes the expiration of the $1.9 billion in American Rescue Plan Act funding, which will be exhausted by 2026 and will not be renewed by the federal government. Items in bold are those that, regardless of the scale of impact, require more complex solutions. And in the upper right corner, you will see our most critical concerns. Perhaps the most significant of these risks are the potential settlement costs for more than 3,000 claims that have been filed against the county under AB 218, some alleging childhood sexual abuse at McLaren Hall, which closed in 2003. Our very preliminary and rough estimates of the county's potential liability range anywhere from $1.6 billion to $3 billion, and County Council's analysis of claims and potential settlement costs is still underway, but that gives you a rough order of magnitude. Beyond the traumatic personal impact on the survivors of abuse, these cases could have a profound impact on the county budget for decades. Since the global analysis of these cases is still ongoing, we will return to update your board when we have a clearer picture of the budgetary ramifications. Next slide, please. The recommended budget is only the first step in the county's multi-phase budget process. You will see key dates on the budget calendar in the months ahead, including public hearings in May, the phase known as final changes in June, when changes to the recommended budget are adopted by the board, and the supplemental budget phase in October, which results in the county's final adopted budget for 23-24. Though in recent years, these future phases have been opportunities for additional programming and funding, only the most critical new programs and services are likely to be able to be considered this fiscal year for all of the reasons that I noted earlier. Building this massive spending blueprint is a complex undertaking that rolls out over the course of many months, and we could not do it without your leadership and our close partnership with your budget deputies, Tammy Amoto Frias from the 1st District, Kirk Shelton and Kofi Kwasi from the 2nd District, Maeve Giza and John Leonard from the 3rd District, Carlos Ariola from the 4th District, and Michelle Vega from the 5th District. Their insights and collaboration have been invaluable. In addition, I would like to thank the department heads and their budget and fiscal teams that helped us put this massive budget together. And this year was not, no easier than any other budget year. We are starting to see the impacts of retirement, retirements in our administrative ranks for those folks in department land that prepare the budget. And so we really are grateful for folks who worked overtime and came in on weekends and did whatever they needed to do to get their budgets in um, on time. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge our CEO budget team led by Matt McGloin and including Mason Matthews, Sheila Williams, Erica Bonilla, Renee Phillips, Kiwan King, Yolanda Ramirez, I'm sorry, Yolanda Reyes, 
Anthony Baker, David Seidenfeld, Cheyenne Yin, James Yoon, and many more analysts and staff who worked tirelessly, tirelessly for months to complete this recommended budget. This concludes my presentation, Madam Chair. I would be happy at this time to receive the board's comments uh, take any, and respond to any questions that you may have. And um, thank you. that's it. Thank, thank you. you. Um, colleagues, we're going to go in order um, uh, for your remarks. So we'll start with uh, one, and then two, three, five, and I'll be last. So um, Supervisor Solis. Yes, thank you very much, Madam Chair. And I also would like to start by expressing my appreciation and gratitude to the CEO, Bija Davenport, and her entire team, Joe, Nikita, Matt McGloin, Mason Matthews, Tom Piscatello, and Yolanda Reyes. I also want to acknowledge the CEO's budget and operations management team for their efforts and for their work with my staff also. And I also want to thank our county department heads who may be watching right now for their leadership and their budget staff working alongside with many of us. I also want to recognize our labor partners. I know that this was a tough nego negotiation for many of us and that we don't always see eye to eye, but nonetheless, uh, we are all, I think, on the same path to help provide improvements to the livelihoods of our members and our workforce and our communities. I also would like to thank my colleagues and their budget deputies who collaborate and work well with my staff and my own uh, budget deputy, Tammy Omoto Frias, and all of Team Solis that uh, dedicated their time to help serve our residents for the first district. I've said uh, many times, but I'll say it again, it really does take a village. Uh, we can't do this work alone. The county has done, in my opinion, an excellent job in recovering from the health and economic impacts of the global pandemic. And I know that this is largely due because of the longstanding fiscal policies established by the board and the boards before us, as well as a willingness for all of us to work together. And I would also like to uh, acknowledge and thank President Joe Biden and Governor Gavin Newsom for the American Rescue Plan and all of the assistance that they provided the county. Had it not been for them, our budget, I would uh, dare say our county economy would be in a different place right now. And as we turn the corner of the pandemic, we must remain vigilant to address what continues to be our most pressing social issues, getting our unsheltered residents into housing and treatment and supporting our most vulnerable unhoused residents and those that are housed from falling, from preventing them from falling into homelessness. Residents across the county of LA continue to struggle with the high cost of living and housing in LA. With over 69,000 Angelenos experiencing homelessness here in LA County, we need to do everything that we can to help stop the inflow into the streets. And that's why I will continue to fight to ensure that all Angelinos have the protections they need to remain housed. In my district alone, the first district, there are over 19,000 people experiencing homelessness. And that includes the 4,400 on Skid Row alone. Our unsheltered residents languish on our streets and in our jails. In fact, over 70% of unsheltered residents have some criminal justice involvement and many desperately need mental health and substance abuse treatment. The county, as you know, must urgently increase the number of every type of bed, beds with treatment services, interim housing, permanent supportive housing, and yes, of course, affordable housing. And we have to prepare to meet these dawning challenges in new ways and using our own county assets as we have done. One example is the Care First Village, which is 232 units of interim housing built out of shipping containers. We built that in six months with approximately $60 million, primarily through federal CARES Act funding and some of our own discretionary funds. The county property is going to be used to build, it was gonna be used to build a parking uh, structure for the new jail. But guess what? We don't need the land to be used for that anymore. There's also the county's iconic general hospital that we see on television daily, which was damaged back in 1994 in the Northridge earthquake and could no longer operate as a hospital. The building is almost 100 years old, but it can't be torn down because it's a historical preservation building. It has approximately 1.2 million square feet of potential space. And we have a solicitation out right now to convert that building 
into possibly 500 to 700 units of housing, including a minimum of 25 to 30 percent affordable housing. Recently, we opened up recuperative uh, care beds, 96, and 64 crisis beds also on the campus of LACUSC. We need to do more, though. We have a plan to open up another 128 for mental health urgent care centers, and we know we need this because if we don't, these individuals end up in our emergency units, which cost the county two or three times more. We just can't afford it. We have to do better, and we have to put our money where our mouth is. Instead of discharging people into the streets, we can continue to provide them treatment. And what I know is really important is providing that step-down system known as the continu continuum of care that we envision at LAC USC. Additionally, across the street from our campus, we're also working to develop another 300 units of affordable housing, and 150 will be permanent supportive housing. I think these are good things that we can continue to do, but many in the public don't realize how hard our county staffs uh, and our stakeholders are working. So I just wanted to share that with you. But I know that we're gonna have to work harder, um, just as I was present yesterday to hear our mayor across the street, uh, Mayor Karen Bass, uh, talk about the accomplishments that she's made. I know that we need to work hand in hand because homelessness is our problem and we have to work together and we need to advocate together. We need to go up together to Washington, to Sacramento, and to talk to other uh, philanthropic groups to help us provide an ambitious program. We have to be ready too, because we're gonna be sponsoring the World Cup and the Olympics here in Los Angeles. And we wanna put our county and the city on display so we can drive more tourism, but also improve some of those infrastructures that need the funding and a rehab so that we can attract people and keep those facilities available after the Olympics. So a lot of work to be done. Um, and I wanna give a shout out also to our mental health director, Dr. Lisa Wong. She is the first AAPI director for the County Department of Mental Health. She also has years of experience working with homelessness on Skid Row. She's also gonna help us, I believe, address the issues of homelessness in our, in our and the health that's needed, mental health in our jails, as well as our hospital emergency rooms. I also want to uh, say that I look forward to working with our new sheriff, Robert Luna, and I'm very pleased that he was already uh, on his way to help creating the Office of Constitutional Policing, which is established to eradicate deputy gangs that have terrorized our communities for decades. And today's budget adds 24 new civilian positions specifically for that office. I hope very much that the Sheriff's Department will serve our communities in the way that we know. And I hope that, um, that we can make our residents feel that they, they will be kept safe and that uh, no future harm will be passed along to them. There's a lot of things that we have to do, but we do have to prepare for the future. And we know that um, there are impending things that are hanging over our head too, and some of which our CEO mentioned, but one that I wanted to bring out was our jails and our juvenile halls, which are at risk of receivership and under consent decrees as well. If, for example, that takes place, that will impact our budgets. We won't have money. We won't have the liberty to be able to provide vital services, as was noted by our CEO, through our health department, our housing, our parks, youth programs, employment opportunities. So now is the time for us to act as a board. I also want to say that I'm happy that this budget does include almost $50 million to help address the consent decrees and ensure a safe and humane treatment of people who are in our care, in the carceral system. Uh, we need to do more. Um, I will just say that um, I look forward to working with my colleagues and with our stakeholders and making sure that we do our very best to see that we put our communities first, especially those vulnerable communities. So with that, Madam Chair, I would like to uh, turn the mic back over to you and thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you for, for those remarks, Supervisor Solis. And we'll move to Supervisor Mitchell. Thank you um, very much, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you, Ms. Davenport, your team, our collective teams. You know, I think developing a spending plan for the county is probably the most important task we undertake um, as uh, elected leaders of the county 
and the staffs who support us in delivering services. So the budget time of year is when we all have to step up and pay attention and engage. Uh, I love the video, Ms. Davenport. I hope that we'll be able to um, include it on our websites as well because it makes it really plain about the sources of money the county relies on, how it's categorized, you know, the limited slice of the budget pie that we have direct control over in terms of new programming, your chart that put into perspective our CFCI, I get the measure, CFCI, formerly known as Measure J, funding into perspective, that was all really helpful. I think your chart um, that shows our priorities one quick question I would have of you before I go into uh, my comments, if you could tell me what percentage of our budget these four priorities are, if you don't have that, uh, you can share it later. But I just think, again, it gives us a perspective in terms of the, the, the budget in totality, what percentage of our budget we're spending on these items um, that we all feel are a priority. Supervisor, we'll get that information to Thank you. you. I appreciate that. And we will that. break it down by overall budget as well as by NCC. NCC. Yep. Because you know me, I'll be carrying this paper around with me as we go through the budget process just to yes. remind myself and to inform um, my work and my conversations with my constituents. Thank you for the impact um, and the risks for tomorrow because like tomorrow is here when I look at your darkest red box and understand you know, the liabilities that may not always be front of mind and transparent as we're talking about the budget process. To think that we could have a $3 billion um, liability is sobering and must remain front of mind as we continue to talk about how we leverage finite resources for a incredibly needy 10 million people. So thank you. Those are the charts that will be in my purse <laughs> as I traverse my district. But again, thank you to all for all the work you do in shaping um, the budget documents for us to review. Uh, just last Monday, I both hosted a virtual budget town hall as I do every year. So my team can share um, some of our budget priorities, our view of the landscape with our constituents and solicit their feedback in terms of how they think um, um, their resources should be prioritized. We had about 150 participants. Uh, we'll be doing another one in May. We'll continue the process. And some of the reoccurring themes we heard um, from our constituents were support for job programs, youth development programs and services, workforce development, small business support, alleviating food insecurity, services for seniors, and of course, how we address the moral issue that we all confront each and every day is how we house our unhoused family, friends, and neighbors. Common themes that we hear um, year after year. It's clear to me that the challenges our communities face are, are deep and real. And sometimes, quite frankly, the county government is the safety net. We are the last hope for far too many people. And so I remain committed to continuing to fulfill our legal, economic, and moral obligation to our constituents, despite a slowdown in the growth of our new county revenues, cost increases in every aspect of our operations, and the challenges we face in funding and finding funding for new programs. You know, I envision a county where Individuals have the opportunity to go beyond just surviving, but to actually thrive. And in order for us to fight against and disrupt multi-generational poverty and houselessness, our residents need access to basic tools and services, mental health services, effective transportation, safe and welcoming parks, and reliable and affordable internet. And again, homes, all kinds of different housing arrangements from ODR beds to board and care, to permanent affordable supportive housing, to permanently house people and get people off the treadmill of temporary housing or being unhoused themselves. 
I think it's important that we continue to ensure that our young people who are justice involved and are in our foster care system are not only treated with dignity, but they are really offered a true chance um, to succeed. So the support of our Office of Diversion and Reentry, the Department of Youth Development, and other programs that offer constructive alternatives to incarceration must continue to be our priority. Our constituents also need us to prepare for the impact of climate change and what it's had on all of us. When I think about the heat indicator in South Los Angeles, communities that I represent that don't have adequate tree canopy, it's a real cause for concern. The number of people who have died um, because of ex uh, excessive exposure to heat is staggering. These recent atmospheric rivers and the historic heat we experienced last summer show us that we need to operate differently. Therefore, I'm really hoping that the county will play its part by providing resources for our Climate Resilience, Resilience Initiative and the Office of Climate Health. The constituents I serve have a vision of a more economically thriving LA County, and that vision starts with supporting workers and small local businesses so more jobs that pay a living wage are created in, in our communities and our constituents can learn the skills needed to perform those jobs. Overall, the county needs our resources to go to our communities and issues that need them the most. As a county, we need to regularly include measuring our effectiveness at serving constituents into how we design our programs. Tracking and measuring our impact is how we can best use our resources to most effectively address the issues our neighbors face. The reality, as every level of government must attest, we've got limited resources, which is why data must be our guide. We can make better decisions about how to allocate funds to support the most impactful programs. So data-driven decisions along with measured outcomes with high standards must be our start. So I'm looking forward to working with my colleagues, the CEO and Artie, to really think about how we can and should make outcome measures an integral part of our policymaking and service delivery apparatus. So I think there's a critical role that the public can and should play. Um, you acknowledged and had on your slide the May 10th hearing opportunity provides an opportunity for county residents to make their voices heard. And I hope that we hear from county residents, um, particularly those who don't typically engage, who don't have the luxury to come to the board meetings as regularly as others, um, but who will find a way to participate either in budget town halls that we host, the May 10th hearing, to understand the process, to understand what's really at risk and fully engage. Uh, Ms. Davenport's presentation discussed the slowdown in the growth of new county revenues. That should be of concern to every county resident. This is an important reminder that we cannot rely on economic fluctuations and unexpected new revenues. We also don't foresee any additional significant revenue windfall on the horizon. The $1.9 billion from the American Rescue Plan Act, one-time dollars, was indeed a godsend. Once that money is gone, it's gone, and we don't anticipate federal dollars coming in again at that level. That was unprecedented, which created an opportunity for our county departments to do unprecedented work that I'm very proud of. But we have to understand that was one time. And then we look at the state. The January budget proposal at the state reflected a $29 billion deficit. And the message to our state partners is, don't cut us. It may be counterintuitive, but we can't cut funding to entitlement programs in a recession because that's when our shared constituents rely on those services and programs the most. So, you know, while we may not be asking our state friends for additional investment, I want us all to collectively send a message loud and clear. This is not the time for them or us to take our foot off the accelerator and investing in services that help people stay housed, help people stay healthy. So, you know, I'm clear that all of our goals and visions must fit into the level of resources that are available through the budget. Um, so to bring those visions and those commitments we make to our constituents to reality, we've got to be strategic and disciplined 
and act within our means. Um, I look forward to the ongoing um, process. Um, again, I hope that uh, members of the public share the video that you made available because it really is a helpful um, way for people to understand how the county budget is created, property taxes and underfunding sources, other funding sources, how it is limited, how just because we have checks in the checkbook doesn't mean we have money in the bank. <laughs> and so we've got to be strategic and thoughtful about how we allocate public resources to benefit the public fundamentally. Madam Chair, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Supervisor Horvath. Thank you, Madam Chair. I too would like to thank our CEO and all of the county departments who participated um, in developing this budget uh, over the last many months and uh, will continue over the next many months to ensure uh, that the budget uh, works for everybody. And I also wanna thank my Director of Budget and Board Operations, John Leonard, for his help in our office. I appreciate the expenditures that have been included in our recommended budget, including cost of living adjustments for our county staff, wage supplements for in-house supportive service employees, funds for increased social service cases, and dedicated funds for care first and community investments, which are all necessary and must be included in our budget. These are all critical expenditures that benefit our community and employees on a daily basis. I'm also happy to see we're making investments in affordable housing, homeless and mental health supports, food as medicine and care, and a variety of employment and economic opportunity programs. I know it can be difficult to raise new revenues, so I would encourage our budget staff to carefully look at each department on a routine basis for efficiencies. If we're to help our unhoused, prevent more homelessness, reform our jails and juvenile halls, address climate change, and provide the necessary health and mental health care to our constituents, we'll need to take a closer look at our budget and how we allocate our resources. We have some significant challenges, it's safe to say, as well as large expenditures in our future. And in order to balance our budget while still providing necessary services to our constituents, we need to take a very close look at all of our expenditures. Based on our current budget, and uh, the upcoming phases, I have a few questions in five areas. First, homelessness prevention and assistance for renters. Through the county's declaration of a local emergency, we are taking steps to assist individuals experiencing homelessness, but we know that preventing homelessness is also critical. So I would ask what steps are we taking with this budget to prevent homelessness, particularly through stay housed LA, rental assistance, and the right to counsel? Yes. Thank you for that, Supervisor. So a uh, couple of points. So earlier this year, on January 24th, the board authorized um, CEO to allocate about $5 million in uh, ARPA emergency relief dollars to continue funding Stay Housed LA rental assistance, and that was $2 million, and to establish a non-mortgage mom and pop landlord assistance program, that was $3 million. Additionally, the board also directed my office to identify and allocate an additional $40 million to establish a new rent relief program that would provide assistance to mom and pop property owners who are owed back rent due to the COVID emergency. So that's one area. The second, I think, is this issue of uh, this, this uh, concept of right to counsel. So in September of 2022, the board directed DCBA to engage property owners, tenants, and other relevant stakeholders, and to report back with an implementation plan to make the expanded eviction defense program, Stay Housed LA, a permanent program within DCBA to meet the growing needs for countywide eviction services. And most recently on April 8th, DCBA provided recommendations uh, to adopt a right of council ordinance, a right to council ordinance for the unincorporated areas of the county, and then a complementary universal access to legal representation program, using, of course, the phase in approach to full implementation. Thank you very much. I would ask that each department 
uh, look at all of these areas and what resources could help them further prevent, prevent homelessness in our county and uh, thank you for highlighting those areas in particular. Second, um, I wanna talk about jail consent decrees and juvenile halls and probation. As we move forward with corrective actions related to juvenile halls and the probation department consent decrees and settlement agreements, uh, what assurances do we have that the resources allocated in this budget will successfully address these concerns? I know we've addressed, we've invested in these issues uh, over a number of years and yet we're still here. So what assurances do we have that we're getting closer to resolution? So Supervisor, uh, there is $30 million uh, being allocated in this budget unit, this budget uh, to support the home-like environment changes to some of our camps and halls. In this particular instance, Supervisor, I don't think it's been an issue of the board allocating resources. I think it is. it has been um, implementation. Right. And so we have worked with ISD to put together a small project management team that would be dedicated exclusively to probation to do a number of things. One, to work on some of the capital projects and modification needs uh, of our halls and camps. And two, to prioritize those are those that are most pressing and those that are most urgent. So I don't think it's a funding issue. I think it's an implementation issue. And we have worked with ISD to put, um, I don't know if they are, have started yet, but we have worked to put a team together and put them in place and they would be devoted exclusively to probation. I'm glad to hear this won't be a resource issue um, according to what I heard in your answer. And I uh, would ask that we all stay dedicated to making sure that full implementation happens immediately given um, the issues that we're facing uh, imminently. Um, the third area I would focus on are uh, our residents' health needs. Can you speak to some of the investments we're making to address the growing incidence of STIs in the county, as well as the increasing need for mental health services, not just with our unhoused community members, but with our general population as well? Yeah, sure. Um, so let me start with the um, STI. Um, so the Department of Public Health um, was allocated one-time funding of $7 million in 22-23 final adopted budget. So that was just last October. And it could be used to address a range um, of issues. Our office will continue to work with DPH. We want to look at their take-up rate, their spin-down, how quickly they're going through resources, and then go back and evaluate uh, what additional resources might be needed on a go-forward basis. The budget, this budget also includes an additional $2.5 million to DPH to support the county's response to the rise in sexually transmitted infections, which is targeted towards disproportionately impacted uh, communities. And I, I think the second part was uh, related to mental health yes. services. Um, so this recommended budget includes 195 positions for the Department of Mental Health to support innovative approaches to serve the community in need of mental health care. And there is a specific allocation of $1.2 million allocated to the Women's Reentry Center. This adjustment expands women's reentry services to assist integration in the community um, of women formerly involved with our justice community. Um, looking ahead, there are a number of county funded projects uh, that specifically address uh, women's health and mental health and those will be uh, rolled out in future budget phases. Um, the hun uh, let me go back to the 195 positions. Thank you. That will um, be used to support a number of things, include, including projects such as uh, Hollywood 2.0 um, to provide additional mental health services for in some of our other areas. Uh, DPA, DMH previously uh, had some challenges hiring, but they have under new leadership have really amped up their hiring uh, practices and they've hired about 500 folks uh, under the leadership of the new director, uh, Lisa Wong. And those positions are an increase, they're not the total number. Correct, those are an increase of 195 positions. Right, thank you. Um, and I just wanted to note this year we saw monkeypox disproportionately impact our LGBTQ plus community. And I would ask that our mental health, our public health and social service departments closely examine the needs of specific communities like this example illustrates, including our LGBTQ plus community, our young people and our women who um, uh, we need to ensure uh, are not missing any critical needs uh, in this county budget. 
Um, fourth, I wanted to ask about our climate and water infrastructure, uh, specifically what investments are we making uh, to meet the goals and keep us on track with the county sustainability plan? Yes. I'm sorry, was that the water infrastructure or the? The, the climate and yes. the water infrastructure. Yep. And, and my second question is related to water infrastructure, yeah. so I'll just give you that one too. Are our levels of investment in water and stormwater infrastructure um, enough to attract federal funding? I know yep. we welcomed the vice president to our district earlier this year. She expressed interest in investment uh, in the county in this area, but I wanna make sure that we're also making meaningful investments so they know that we're taking this issue seriously. Yes. Um, so so let me talk a little bit about sustainability. Um, that, uh, the lead on that in the county, um, at least on the operational side, is ISD. And I think their efforts fall in three different areas. One is electrification, transportation electrification. Two is energy efficiency. And then three is renewable energy and resiliency. So I'll go through those really quickly. On transportation, ISD leads uh, the installation and management of approximately 1,100 electric vehicle charging stations across the county that will enable the electrification of county fleets as well as employee and visiting and folks visiting uh, our county facilities, switching from gas cars to electric vehicles. I was just talking to um, Director Hollins the other day and he shared with me that they are helping over 1,000 county employees navigate all of the incentives and all of the information uh, that is designed to incentivize people to actually move to um, an electric vehicle. And so they're actively engaged in that. On the issue of energy efficiency, um, with funding that we've received from the California Public Utilities Commission, ISD runs an organization called the Southern California Regional Energy Network, SoCalRIN, and what they do is they support multifamily and public agencies to make their buildings more energy efficient. Just in 2022, SoCalRIN, SoCalRIN's multifamily energy efficiency program achieved 4.9 million in kilowatt hour savings and paid out over $5 million in CPUC, Utility Commission, incentives to multifamily property owners throughout Southern California. And the majority of properties were located in disadvantaged communities and over 15,704 apartment units were retrofitted with energy efficiency measures, including lighting and HVAC upgrades. And then finally, on renewable energy and resilience, ISD has installed over, uh, has installed solar power electricity equipment on several county buildings, saving the county electricity costs and reducing our carbon footprint. There are six other uh, sites under contract for solar and over 50 in the interconnection queue. And I would suspect that the chief sustainability officer and uh, her department um, are um, also involved in these efforts oh, as well. Absolutely. Um, I think that the Chief Sustainability Office, they have a magnificent sustainability plan um, that sort of guides our general direction and these, and these initiatives. And I look to ISD to be the implementing arm to implement what's actually in that plan. Great, and my last area is on the community assistance after COVID. We heard very clearly from my colleagues, um, you know, these were one-time funds. So I would just say, um, I would ask that we use our time between now and when the supplemental budget is approved in October to assess the county's needs after the end of the COVID-19 emergency declaration. Um, now that COVID-19 related protections and funding programs expired, there will be many communities and individuals that are in need and we're gonna start to see uh, the areas in which those needs will emerge. Um, I would ask that you work with um, all of our county departments uh, to identify where those uh, needs exist and make sure to um, surface at, in as real time as we can um, where those needs are emerging so we can make sure to allocate funding accordingly to respond to the needs we're seeing on the ground. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. Thank you. Supervisor Barger. Thank you, and I too want to thank you, Fizia, for an incredible job that you've done, and, and all the budget deputies, especially Michelle Vega in my office. And then I always have to do my shout out for Matt McGloin um, to embarrass you, I think, more than anything now. Um, but thank you for the work that you've done and your entire team. Um, and of course, Joe Nikita, uh, you 
you are also an instrumental part of this process. I recognize the considerable growth outlined in the budget and the significant resources we are able to allocate to the most pressing issues that the county is facing, namely homelessness. And I echo what everyone said, so I'm not gonna repeat it as it relates to um, you know, what we're doing to house the homeless, what we're doing to support um, uh, our acting sustainability officer, which I think we're pushing to make our sustain chief sustainability officer in terms of how we are moving forward in this county. Um, but you know, I think that, that it's important that we all know that, that homelessness is not just affecting the county unincorporated, it's all of our 88 cities. And I know the difference has been that we are all working together um, to address this as um, with a sense of urgency. And earlier this year, as was said, uh, I joined Supervisor Horvath in declaring um, homelessness a local emergency. Since, this, since then, this board has been working with our partners at the city and at the state level to coordinate resources, ensure we are working together in lockstep to bring people off the streets and into supportive services. And I love what you said about, it's not a one size fits all. We're gonna need board and care. We're, get, we're gonna need all types of housing to support those that we're gonna be, that we are gonna be um, sheltering. There is no greater urgency here in the county, in my opinion, and with that sense of urgency, I believe it is critical that we move forward with the creation of, and I say standalone, but you know, I'm not stuck on a department. I want an entity that's going to be accountable and make sure that all of our departments are working together, collaborating, breaking down the silos, because we're making promises to the public with precious dollars, um, Measure H, and I wanna make sure that we are getting the best bang for our buck. So when I talk about you know, a department, I, call it what you want. I just wanna make sure that we've got accountability because the buck is gonna stop with us with Measure H because we are the, we are the, the ones that are the, the uh, doling out that Measure H dollars. Today's budget recognized the creation of additional departments and staffing resources for youth development, justice, economic development, and aging. As the safety net for residents of Los Angeles County, we should be progressing with our homeless with that same sense of urgency. Again, I'm not calling it a department fees yet, but I do think we need to have an entity that's gonna make sure that all departments coordinate and work together um, because there are a lot of moving parts and it's not a one size fits all when it comes to um, dealing with the homeless. Along those lines, there are several areas within the county that we should continue to look for operational efficiencies and staffing resources to help alleviate housing concerns and improve accessibility to affordable housing. This includes appropriately staffing the Department of Regional Planning so that they can facilitate housing projects and enable the county to act nimbly and efficiently. Um, I am pleased to see that today's budget includes ongoing funding for the Sheriff's Academies and the board, as the board previously approved. It is essential that the county retain a pipeline to recruit and train quality, ca quality candidates for the Sheriff's Department so that we can maintain necessary staffing levels for all of our stations and in our jail facilities as mandated by the Department of Justice. I also appreciate, as was said by Supervisor um, uh, Solis, sh uh, Sheriff Robert Luna's commitment to addressing deputy gangs through the creation of Office of Constitutional P Policing. The dedication of these resources and leadership of Eileen Decker is an important indicator to the level of the commitment to this initiative. I'd also like to take a moment to thank Sheriff Luna and, and his team for their collaboration with the county to restore fiscal responsibility to the Sheriff's Department, especially through the appointment of Jill Torres as its financial officer. Our budgeting practices are one of the most critical aspects of county government, and so that we can continue to be the safety net for our 10 million residents, it is, it is imperative that we must do the right thing each year. To that end, I would like to take a moment to reflect on some of the significant financial liabilities in our county, and I appreciate that chart. In recent months, there has been a lot of talk about a potential recession along the concerns around inflation, stagflation, raising interest rates, and the slowing housing market. These are all valid concerns through which we should be cognizant when developing our budget. And that's what you've done, actually, and that's what you mentioned in your, in your remarks, um, Bezia. And in addition to these global issues, we must uh, have local concerns such as a very significant legal liability we are facing from past incidents at McLaren Children's Center and their probation halls and camps. There is no doubt that we take these allegations seriously as a board. As we begin the legal process on these cases, 
we know that, that they might have a profound impact on the county's finances and our ability to continue to provide critical safety net services for our residents. Early indicators are that this will be a financial toll that the county will be obligated to pay over a long period of time. A lot is still unknown as the legal process uh, has only just begun, but I appreciate that this has been included in the budget uh, report to the board because it is undoubtedly going to be a factor in our financial decisions moving forward. With that in mind, I will continue to advocate for fiscal responsibility in our budgeting and maintaining a commitment to save money for our reserves through the rainy day fund to weather any potential storms, which is what we've done in the past, which is why I take great pride in the fact that we didn't have furloughs and layoffs during the last slowdown because we were able to weather that storm. Um, I, I do have a question, Fizia, because in your slide, DCFS, you know, I know that the, that the caseload has pretty much stayed the same and that I think that um, uh, the caseloads are for each social worker is, is within uh, the parameters that we've agreed upon. Where are we with the Title IV-E? Um, because when that goes away, that is a fiscal cliff that we're facing, correct? So, yes, thank you for that question, Supervisor. So the Title IV-E waiver has ended. The Families First uh, Transition Act has been implemented, and then there was like a bridge statute to allow uh, everyone to start implementing. Because of the way the funding works under Family First, Family First is focused on prevention and keeping people out of the system rather than those you have under your jurisdiction. And so our original um, structural deficit was scored at 340 million. We did receive uh, from uh, the governor and the state legislature 200 million, uh, but it is one-time funding. And so what DCFS uh, should be focused on, and I hope that they're focused on, is there are a number of programs and services that they provide, that they provided under the waiver that we believe will qualify under Families First. And so as they start to um, get approval from the State Department of Social Services, that is important so that they, it's included in the plan and they're able to then draw down funding under Families First, and we hope that that will help close the funding uh, gap, the structural deficit. Okay, that, that, that's good news. And then as Supervisor Horvath mentioned, I was gonna ask about the STD, STI. Um, you know, I, I really um, wanna better understand that um, moving forward because that continues to be, we continue to see numbers going up, and I wanna better understand what public health is doing. I'm told that they're not receiving financial support from the federal government. Um, so I, I question what we need to do to further that discussion, if in fact that's what's yeah. taking place. So one of the things that we can do, Supervisor, is we can ask, and we saw DPH do this during COVID, <clears throat> we can ask them to do some forecasts and projections. I think part of the problem you know, with plans is they're almost always wrong, but they're sometimes helpful. Right. So she can give us sort of a North Star of what we might be looking at and then we could figure out how fast are they spending down the funding uh, from last uh, fiscal year and then start to plan to allocate additional resources uh, once they become available. And then last but not least, where are we with the 1115 waiver for DHS? Because I know that that's something that we're depending upon um, in out, out years. And when I look at the chart where it gets read in 2027, I'm just concerned we're gonna have a lot of things converging on us at one time um, that are financial uh, necessities that we have to backfill. Yes, so my understanding, and I'll, we will get a more specific answer from DHS, my understanding is that the uh, state um, has submitted our, our, at one point it was delayed, um, and I believe that, they're, that they have submitted our request for the 1115 waiver, I'm not exactly sure where um, CMS is in terms of responding to that request. Because I think, does it expire in 2026 or 2024? I don't know, yeah. but I think we need to be cognizant of that because that's a lot of money to DHS. Yes. Um, and, um, and without that, um, there's a huge gap. Yes. All right, but again, thank you and your whole team and the whole, all of our team actually that, that work together to, to bring this budget together. It's appreciated, thank you. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Um, 
uh, to all my colleagues for, for your remarks and your thoughts and your uh, keen insight uh, into this year's budget as well as um, looking forward um, to um, our, our fiscal world in years out. And again, thank you, Fija. Thank you for your team. Uh, again, great budget deputies on all of our staffs. Thank you, Carlos, uh, for your work on this. You know, the, the sheer size of this budget <clears throat> is, is striking. Uh, I was thinking that when I was first elected in 2016, uh, the first budget I voted on was 30 billion. Uh, so today, this is a $43 billion budget that's been proposed. Um, we do have massive resources at the county's disposal to serve our residents. Um, but sometimes even the numbers don't uh, totally capture the reality of what we're dealing with. For me, one of the striking things is that this budget funds uh, a total of 114,106 county positions, but we have 17,000 vacancies uh, in those positions across the county. And while um, I always love to talk about our workforce is our greatest asset. I mean, this is who delivers uh, all of our priorities. Everything that we think about here and pass motions on and, and consider our pri priorities, it's our county workforce um, that really gets it done. So I do think that th these vacancies uh, in our departments are a big challenge, and I do think um, it's holding us back in certain areas. Um, this budget includes new positions for mental health, uh, but in the past year, uh, we've, been, we've been hindered in our ability to respond to our mental health crisis because we haven't been able to hire enough people to fill those 988 response teams. I do like it, Fiesa, that you um, said that under Lisa Wong, you seem like uh, she's uh, really putting some effort behind hiring, and, and so far that seems successful. Um, we also have struggled to hire enough lifeguards to keep our county pools open. And so there we have an initiative where we all felt it was important to keep our pools open longer, and yet we were having difficulty staffing it with lifeguards. Um, so, you know, anybody that's listening to this budget uh, presentation or, or looks at it on the website, with everything else we're talking about, we're basically saying, um, we're hiring, right? The County of Los Angeles is in the is in the mood to hire. Um, so if you're out there looking for a job, particularly if you find yourself um, aligned with the county's missions and priorities and serving people, um, this is this is your your place. We would love to be your employer. And what's interesting yesterday at um, Karen Bass's State of the City, they're finding the same thing over the city. They're also having difficulty hiring. So again, the word goes out uh, that we are hiring, uh, particularly many people think, what can I do in life? You know, I want to give back or I find myself in a position to, to really feel like I could offer something. Now's the time. We're hiring. Uh, come see us. We need to fill these uh, uh, positions, and I really appreciate the part of this budget that invests in the future of our county workforce. Um, it's been mentioned, but I like it that we're funding eight sheriff academy classes so we can fill the vacancies in our sheriff's department. Um, I appreciate that this budget includes raises for our in-home supportive service workers that, who have been underpaid for their incredible work. Uh, for far too long. Uh, I think we all would like to see these IHSS workers get up to $20 an hour, but I think the raise that we have in this budget, and I know you've worked really hard on that, Fisa, is a step in the right direction, um, and we could use some help again with the state uh, in maybe reworking the formula. Um, this budget includes thousands of funded positions that we need to fill. Um, there's also, for me, I noticed there were some departments that would lose positions under this budget. And for me, uh, I was um, keenly aware that it's the al alternate public defender and the public defender are seeing positions being cut. And I understand it's because they were one-time uh, funded positions, but, you know, these jobs are so important to, again, the fabric of our safety net. Uh, is a, the public defender and the alternate public defender are a huge part of that. So I'm hoping um, that 
at uh, Physio, we can find a way to restore these positions in the final changes, and I'll, I'll be looking to, to see that. Just on that particular piece, Supervisor, uh, when you see the decreases for public defender and alternate public defender, it's more of a budgeting convention. The staff that are funded by those positions remain in place. What we do is we remove the one-time funding that was awarded last year, and then we put it back um, again every year. So, so they're not really losing positions. That is correct. Okay. Thank, that's good to know. I don't feel like it was worded that way uh, in, in your budget, but that's good. That's a good clarification. Um, we've all talked about meeting the moment of um, our homelessness humanitarian crisis that we're seeing. Um, and I, um, you know, the funding, the $692 million um, that you talked about is up from last year's $532 million. And so... You know, we know that means more investments in mental health services, transitional housing, support people need to get housed and stay housed. And I really appreciate, it feels like there was a budget a couple of years ago that I voted no on because I didn't feel like it met the, met the moment. And I know with our uh, own declaration of emergency uh, for homelessness, as well as um, pledging our support to uh, Mayor Bass and the city of Los Angeles in their um, declaration of homeless emergency. Um, I just want to make sure that this budget supports both our declaration as well as what we have pledged to support with the city of Los Angeles. Yes, it does, Supervisor. Um, and I know, um, you know, we, we talked a little bit about, you talked a little bit about this, some settlements that are coming uh, up and how that's going to be a challenge. I, and I know in the homeless arena, we have the Alliance Settlement um, just want to make sure we don't have an agreement yet, uh, but we're, I'm hoping that whatever it is that we can come to terms with, that there will also be money in this budget to support the things that we would like to see done under that umbrella. Um, I, uh, let's see. Okay, another thing that um, uh, I didn't see included um, is, uh, is care court, and I know that uh, we're in that first uh, cohort, um, maybe coming online at the end of this year, maybe by December. Um, and I know, uh, for me anyway, Care Court really is the, kind of that missing uh, piece of the puzzle in our effort to really help people who are unhoused um, to get housed. Uh, and particularly, it will help those who are suffering from serious mental illness from falling into homelessness. Um, again, this is the first phase. I know we are hoping that the state will uh, you know, support yes. us with, with their funding for this? Yes. So, Supervisor, we are waiting for our allocation uh, patiently in the May revise, and I did uh, happen to sit next to uh, Dr. Mark Galley on my way to Sacramento last week and let him know that the board is patiently awaiting uh, our allocation for care court. Good. I love the way fate brings two people to sit together on a plane uh, going to Sacramento, you never know. But that, I know I, I never worry that uh, uh, you will use those times wisely, as opposed to you know reading a magazine. Uh, thank you for using that opportunity. Um, and lastly, I really want to thank you for um, working to find in this budget um, uh, funding to extend our summer pool season. Uh, and again, with the climate change and the the unbearable hot weather that takes us um, sometimes through November. Uh, our pools are not just a place uh, where people exercise or learn uh, to swim. They're a place where people can keep cool on, on hot days. So I appreciate that. Um, and um, hopefully we will have the lifeguards to staff the pool so you can continue to keep them open because I do think that's important for people. Again, it's a service, a recreational as well as a health service, in my opinion, that we can offer with our pools. So uh, even with the signs of economic slowdown, I, I believe this budget sets the county on the right foot for the next fiscal year to keep ourselves accountable to our public. Um, for the job that we were all elected to do, and again, strengthens that uh, safety net that we know the county is um, responsible for to keep people from falling through the cracks in our society. So thank you for that. 
Yes. Do you want to say something? Uh, can I just uh, wanted to follow up on one question from Supervisor Barger. I was getting the waivers mixed up. I was thinking of the IMD waiver. So the, the 1115 waiver, it was actually approved, and we have through, uh, it ends in 2026. You are correct. It is a lot of work uh, for us to um, implement that, and the California's version, manifestation of the waiver is CalAIM, uh, which we are working on in the county as we speak. Okay, thank you. Um, colleagues, any, any uh, before we go to the public, anything else you would like to say? Okay, um, so executive officer, please call the members of the public who've signed up to speak on this item, item 81, our fiscal year 2023-24 recommended budget. Well, A. Sanaya, Antigon Robinson, Byron Jose, Dr. Critical Truth Bay, Jack German, Jaime Alvarez, Laura Koholin, Lauren Natoli, Matthew Inoue, Megan Castillo, Patricia McAllister, Philip Kim, and Sanjita Rayasan, please come forward and staff will assist you. Moderator, may we have the first remote speaker, please. Thank you. Our uh, first participant is Anthony Arenas. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Anthony Arena from District 3 and from the Justice LA Coalition, and I wanted to touch a bit more on the CFCI funding. I think that uh, despite our Care First advocacy, learning that the CAO has proposed cutting Care First community investment funding this year and the recommended allocation of only $88 million, thousand towards care for community investment, which is a meager amount compared to the rate of the carceral crisis in LA County is disappointing. And that kind of funding means that folks, there's only roughly $8 per LA County resident and that's unacceptable. This 88,304,000 is also a reduction in CFCI funding from prior years when the budget stream received 100 million per year and a reduction in vital community funds is pushing the budget and the community in the wrong direction. And the community has provided the county with multiple outlines for how to align the budget with Thank the you. Care First vision. Thank and you. yet once Thank again, you very much. the Thank county you very much. is falling short. Next, next speaker, you. please. Next speaker, please. Michelle King, please go ahead. Good afternoon, you can hear me? Yes, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Um, um, I'm a District 1 resident, and I'm calling to urge the board and the CEO to make um, these budget documents available prior to your um, budget meeting, so we, the community, can review these to provide informed comments. Um, I think transparency and public input should be input should be key. It's fiscally responsible to prioritize funding of universal needs like healthcare, housing, community-based mental health, uh, crisis and intervention, pandemic recovery. We must divest from the murderous sheriff's department that's squandering taxpayer dollars, and we must close MCJ now. I know you've heard it already, but shockingly, in the past three months alone. Seven community members' lives have been stolen in MCJ. In what universe does this make sense? Seven community members in three months. Thank you. Months. Thank you. Thank you very much. Where else would Thank this be allowed much. to continue? Close MCJ Next and invest in community resources. Thank you. Your Thanks time has expired. Time. Next speaker, please. Next. Next, we will go to Jessica McNeil. You may be. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I'm just, I'm just to meet Neil. Um, you know, it doesn't make me feel better to see that several of the less funded departments include public defenders and alternate public defenders on the chart. But just for context, if we put law enforcement, like sheriffs, on the left of that model, it'd be too big to put on the slide because it's like the sun compared to the earth. It's 17 times larger than CFCI funding. 
They were in here every week fighting against more funding for those departments, despite them getting billions yearly, and CFDI getting just over half a billion over three years. I sat in a CFDI meeting last week where community-based orgs were fighting for crumbs because the county couldn't find $20 million anywhere to make up for the gap in expected funding, and our community's bare bones, not even our bare bones needs, the baseline number. Crucial life-saving services were cut that night. Which brings me to that 17,000 vacant budgeted positions. Like, are we celebrating those positions being open? You know, we know in probation alone, like those vacancies that have Thank been you. open for years. This Thank isn't you. like a job posting went up. Thank Can't you. Fill it. Next speaker, please. 75 million. Thank you. Your probation. time has expired. Next speaker, please. Roy Humphreys, you may begin. Uh, thank you for the proliferation and pathetic, pompous, profane pandering uh, with little relationship uh, to fact, reality, and math and to the homeless issue. You have uh, failed to develop a county-controlled system of campsites to get the tents off the streets and provide services. Uh, we <clears throat> can't uh, uh, forget uh, Supervisor Horvath that wants to clear the jails and uh, dump them onto the streets. We should take them to the supervisor's neighborhoods as a la Texas. The statement that it's not funding is absurd and ridiculous and delusional. It's all about funding. Uh, Supervisor Solis can't even get the uh, Martinez burned out uh, houses uh, taken out of Roland Heights, and they are now uh, homes for the homeless and blight. And he's uh, $3 billion for the juvenile <clears throat> lockup sex play. You think about think about legalizing sex work so you can get that $2 billion. Instead of going to organized crime, go to the, the county and, and the state and, and have fewer babies Thank born you. with syphilis. Thank you. Your time has Thank expired. You. Next speaker, please. Next, we are going to go to the line. Excuse me one moment. I'll queue up. Uh, Timothy Hepburn, please go ahead. Actually, this is, can you hear me? Yes. We hear you. Uh, I'm actually calling on item 1D. Is this part of this now? Uh, no, we're on item 81. So you'll have to go back in yes, the queue. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm okay. Sorry. Thank All you. Right. Next speaker, please. Oh, we're in person. Hello. Hi. Wait, we're having a hard time hearing you. It looks like it's on. Check. Yeah, there you go. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Hi, my name is Laura Cahol, and I organize with La Defensa, White People for Black Lives, and Reimagine LA, and I reside in District 2. I want to express my opposition to the over $135 million increase in funding for the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. I'm concerned about several aspects of this allocation. First, instead of adding more positions to the department to try to comply with consent decrees, simply remove dollars out of the department and into community-based care. Second, I'm concerned that this allocation includes $1.8 million new dollars for the Sheriff's Academy classes, this is moving the county in the wrong direction. We do not need to add more people to patrol. Patrol has been responsible for stealing the lives of Dijon Kizzi, say his name, Andres Guardado, say his name, Paul Rea, say his name, and Anthony Vargas, say his name, who is currently his family has been in court for the last week experiencing re-traumatization while fighting for his life. I also oppose the $2 million to renovate IRC, defund the sheriff, and reinvest in community. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hello, Board of Supervisors. My name is Megan Castillo, and I'm the Here. Coalition Coordinator for the Reimagine LA Coalition and a Policy and Advocacy Manager at La Defensa. I am calling to, I'm speaking on item 81. While I know there are some incredible efforts underway to address housing, youth development, and economic development, I am still incredibly concerned about the recommended budget at large. The current budget offers a regressive approach to the Care First Jail's last vision as, and is in opposition to alternatives to incarceration that community members have fought so tirelessly for. It is truly alarming that the county is once again proposing a whopping $3.7 billion to go to the Sheriff's Department. LASD continues to be one of the most well-funded departments in the county, spending billions of dollars to disrupt and harm communities and to incarcerate LA County residents. In recent weeks, we learned that the CEO proposed cutting Care First Community Investment funding this year and only recommended $88 million new dollars. It is time it is not time to cut care first investment. It is time to truly implement care first in jails last. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. I am Sangeeta Rayasam with Law Defensa. I live in uh, District 1 with Hilda Solis. Um, this, you, we responded, your 
in your comments, you mentioned that you wanted to help decarcerate, depopulate LA County jails, but like contrary to the demands of act the actual community and stakeholders, like you're not f allocating funds towards actual community-based services. Like the funding is still full of law of funding for the sheriff's office and electronic monitoring. Like this is not like we should. We need to remove probation um, control from a pr from our pretrial services. The real way to really depopulate jails, if we want to cut down mental and depopulate and lower the population of men central jail, is to ensure that we can ensure funding parity with the. A public defender's office and the alternative public defenders, so that it's it, it, just as much funding as the DA office gets. So that that will truly ensure services and reform and expansive reforms to depopulate LA jails. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon. My name is Antigone Robinson from the AIDS Healthcare Foundation. The recommended public health budget shows an increase of funding resulting from the removal of one-time expenditures that were awarded last year to address COVID-19, MPOX, and sexually transmitted infections. We acknowledge the $2.5 million from the Tobacco Settlement Fund, year 204, which supports the county's response to STIs. However, we ask the board to recommend that some of this one-time funding used to address the STI crisis last year, if possible, be directed back toward testing, treatment, and prevention. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good morning, my name is Byron Jose. I've been a longtime resident of SD2 and I am part of the Trans Latina Coalition. Uh, we've been here since 4 a.m. fielding media inquiries to ensure that the county's budget reflects immigrant communities, but also transgender, gender expansive, and intersex communities. So eventually we got to this presentation. I'm glad we're here. Uh, we're also part of the Reimagine LA, ensuring that the county's budget truly is inclusive of care service budget and no longer criminalizes our peoples. Um, and we're a trusted messenger for the CFCI process. So uh, to the CEO of uh, presentation, yes, it included that graphic, right, that put CFCI at 255 million, yet it refuses to acknowledge the sheriffs, uh, $3,849,071,000 3 for this year alone, per your addendum this morning, Ms. Davenport, and also the probation department's $1,059,218,000. Uh, we need not 80 million uh, for CFCI for three year three, we need 100 million, we need 900 million, and we need this body to truly not just no longer appropriate Thank the you. language and, uh, for our communities, but actually Thank reflect you. it in your funding. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank, Thank you, you. Uh, everyone at the board. Thanks. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon, Jaime Alvarez from the AIDS Healthcare Foundation. Additional funding is, is needed for STIs in LA County. In, in response to Directive 5 in the most recent STD report back, which stresses the need to improve STD screening procedures for populations who infrequently visit providers, LA County Department of Public Health plans to address financial barriers like co-pays and laboratory fees. However, recently, LA County Department of Public Health announced that they would no longer be covering the cost to process STI specimens from community-based organizations at the county lab. Instead, community-based organizations, many of which are struggling to keep their doors open, are expected to incur the cost. This will be impossible unless community-based sexual health clinics begin charging for services, and this will increase the frequency of STD screenings for hard-to-reach populations. Research actually shows that charging a fee at STD clinics reduces patient visits, so we ask LA County Board of Supervisors to, prevent, to protect this preventative measure uh, preventative service, excuse me, by urging LA County Department Thank of you. Public Health to at least continue Thank you. covering the processing costs of Thanks. STI specimens. Thanks. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon. I'm Lauren Natale Good afternoon. from AIDS Healthcare Foundation. Uh, LA County is one of the largest counties in the nation with one of the largest budgets, and yet the public is barely seeing efforts to focus funding for STI prevention. Thank you all so much for bringing up STIs earlier. LACDPH acknowledges that COVID-19 control efforts resulted in high staff, over, high staff turnover and divested the attention away from HIV and STI programs. However, now that COVID-19 efforts are winding down, there are no more excuses for divested focus or funding. As we all saw with COVID, we can make a positive impact on community health when we zero in on the pressing issues. So we hope that with this new recommended budget for 2023, 2024, that more focus is placed on STI prevention and treatment. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon, Board of Supervisors. My name is Philip Kim and I'm a resident of District 1. <clears throat> and I just wanted to talk about last Thursday, I attended the CFCI at a, a meeting and it, it was a really emotional meeting. Um, 
a member broke down in tears because they have to make cuts to programs, including harm reduction in Skid Row. And um, as a resident of Skid Row, I've lost dozens of friends, uh, neighbors to um, fentanyl overdose. And harm reduction has been proven to help people get at least stay alive long enough to get help. And um, I implore you to look at the sheriff's budget where they're landing helicopters on La Brea and you know camping out in front of empty buildings for nine hours, that money alone could have funded the harm reduction program. Um, and you, you see the ask for the 156 extra million, which who knows where that's gonna go. They had, you had to approve 50 million for lawsuits last year and um, that money alone could fund Hi. the harm reduction for multiple Thank you. years. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, I stand here for the homeless families, primarily Lawrence Kizzy, Tracy Jones, Samuel Monroe Jr., Samir Grant, Anthony Simpkins, Yesenia Williams, just a few that came and spoke to Victor Pacheco and Lily Sofiani. Um, the problem is you need to invest more in knowledgeable staff members who's aware of how to house the homeless. Not one person who changes their title every so week. Up until today, we didn't know that Victor Pacheco was not the homeless deputy. That's what was told to us. He's your liaison for Janice Hahn. Can we have five black representatives, homeless deputies, to house families? I don't want to hear another Gomez, Martinez, Rodriguez, no offense, but for Victoria Gomez to say that we didn't want to speak to her because she's Mexican was not only outrageous, slanderous, but damn right disgusting. Okay, thank Let's you. Let's get it together. Thank you. Next speaker, no, please. Hi, I'm Samuel Monroe Jr. I'm here also with Dr. Truth. And um, I, I really don't have too much to say. It's just, you know, I'm here to speak on the budget getting in the hands of people that have a respectable, respectable heart, respect in their, in, in, in their inside enough to know that, hey, look, I'm in a position to do something to help. I should be doing the right thing. Money should be allocated to the, its, its rightful place. And, um, you know, I don't want to throw any punches or anything like that, but I just want to, you know, it, we need to get it together. You know, I'm in the, I'm in the same position as you see somebody on that uh, bus stop bench. Some people can hold it together. Some people don't know how to. Why? Because there are certain conditions. We need to straighten that out, take a look from the outside, not the inside of the house, looking outside, but this idea. That's cool. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hello, I'm Ms. Loretta Lorraine. I represent uh, District 3. I'm from, uh, with Trend, Trend Latina Coalition. I'm 81 years old, and I'm here to help all my transgender girls. They're uh, out there homeless and also in danger, and also a lot of them don't get to be my age. A lot of them died at 50. And it's sad to say that I hate to see your girls they go through what they go through in life, and Trend Latina has been there as a family to help them. And I think that y'all should invest to Trend Latina. You speak a good word, and you speak a good word. But transgender ladies and transgender men are all cast because who they are. But it shouldn't be like that. We are the children of God. We're here to stay and to make this beautiful. And I think y'all can do it. God bless you Thank all. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Patricia McAllister. I've read a lot of budgets. I studied accounting at Chicago State University. This is not what this is supposed to be. I remember when we would get a copy. We want to see what you budgeted last year, the last period, fiscal year, and what you did now. Well, I went online and got it. People, if you want to see the 2023-24 the budget, type in in Google, search Board of Supervisors budget, and when you get in there, click on Chief Executive Officer. Now, I went and looked at a lot of numbers, and one I disagreed with was the Board of Supervisors got a 2% raise, uh, uh, up to $124 million. Uh, what's going on? You're a failure. You're not doing anything. How are you getting a raise? And we got more and more people on the street, 60,000 black people on Skid Row. Now, when you did the census, 
when you did the count for the homeless, you gave one day to, to, to get the numbers for the homeless on Skid Row. So you don't deserve a raise, and, and people go and look at this budget, and I want to know what you actually spent Thank you. and what you didn't spend. Thank you. Next speaker, please. So the proclamation of property taxes and how well they spend your money out of 88 cities, it's called a community investment. But you heard the issues brought up about the negativity of this budget and the vacancies and incompetence of hiring people that are adequately responsible and accountable to spread out the love of money is not happening. So if you care first, I'm gonna quote the second district, stay house, stay healthy. I'm gonna quote the third district, stay house. How do you do that when bonds and grants are allocated monies from HUD, the federal government, the state, are there to help you stay home, help you not become homeless because your fucking house is falling apart. Yes, Janet, I said the F-U-C-K yeah, word, all but right, well, you know, I you, got the floor. It's my protected morning, speech. So. 42 SC 1983 politely. No. Fuck off. We, okay, thank you. I, I believe that might be his uh, final warning. So next speaker, please. I'm Miss Allison. Um, I've spoken to you all several times about um, Los Angeles County DMH and the same thing that these people are saying here. People are fed up. You guys are not going to get it together because the Bible tells you you can't. Man can't govern man. I'm not sitting up here to try to preach, but you guys do need to enforce your Los Angeles County DMH policies and um, re-register the individuals that I ask you to register in that FSP program. You guys have been stringing me along for about seven weeks now. I will file my tort claim at your, at your offices over there. I don't want to keep putting myself in mental anguish and stress and duress. Thank you. Um, did, you did we want somebody here to maybe help her? Have our yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, is there another speaker here? Those are all the speakers, Madam Chair. Okay, are you signed up for the 81? Okay, come on up. The budget. Yes, uh, I have concerns over the budget. It seems that, uh, hi, I'm Donald Harlan. Uh, this is, you said, agenda item number 81 is about yes. the budget. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I have concerns about the budget. It seems that uh, a lot of the properties that uh, LA County is trying to develop or a lot of the money that LA County is trying to claim is on real estate that's no longer on their tax base, that there is an attempt to grab tax revenues from properties in any way you can, uh, street lighting, uh, reap, uh, on and on and on, water, the, the water reclamation and developing riverbeds and all that stuff. You know, if you develop the property illegally, you know you have to have that infrastructure before you do that. And that that's going to cost. Uh, and it seems that you're furthering the crime by trying to claim, illegally claim that infrastructure, that you're doing a lot to claim money that doesn't belong to you, that's been taken off your tax base, that you've committed fraud. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other speakers on item 81? Those are all the speakers. Okay. Here we know other comments. Colleagues, item 81 is before us. Uh, moved by Supervisor Horvath, seconded by Supervisor Barger to approve this item. Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item, item 81 is before you. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Horvath, aye. Supervisor Horvath, aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Okay, we'll move on to item five. Uh, it's a five signature letter to support Assembly Bill 1377, Laura Friedman, which was held by Supervisor Mitchell. And for members of the public on the telephone pre 
please press one then zero now to comment on this item. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I appreciate you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> As I get to my remarks here. <laughs> I know what comes after I appreciate you. Yeah, no, 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 it's not, <laughs> no, no, no. Madam Chair, I intend to support this item. And I think it's a smart approach to ensuring our homeless service providers account for people experiencing homelessness on our transit systems. Mm -hmm. This bill is a Metro-sponsored bill um, that will have positive impact for our unhoused constituents and overall riders on our transit system. Adding transit agencies to coordination of state funding strengthens our ability to achieve a functional zero unhoused system. I ask to hold this motion really to make a broader point about how LA County, the process in which we engage in determining which Sacramento legislation we are going to take action on. On today's agenda, we have 13 motions that ask for the county to take a supportive position. Of those, only about half have gone through an analysis by our ledge affairs team or an analysis by a county affiliated entity, either a department, county department, metro, or some other body that serves the interests of LA County residents. There are another half dozen bills on today's agenda that have not gone through the same kind of neutral scrutiny on what impacts they will have on LA County. Many of the state bills on today's agenda, I looked under Legitech, um, have not even gone through a state legislative policy committee, so I couldn't find an analysis on them at the state level either. So from my perspective, the need and desire to move quickly really has to be tempered with the need to understand the impact of legislation on our ability to serve 10 million LA County residents. You know, I, I it occurred to me when I saw a bill by an LA County member that's gonna have direct impact on um, our budget that other than the times I was carrying as a state legislator at LA County sponsored bill, I quite frankly didn't consistently look through the lens of what will the, this bill have in terms of the fiscal impact on the county. It's just not a lens I use as a state legislator. Sitting here in this chair now, listening to our own budget presentation, I think I have a different perspective. And so all I'm asking is that before uh, I am willing to commit and vote on a five signature letter going to support a piece of legislation, that our ledge team has done an analysis that's gone through our own vetting process um, before we commit um, county resources um, to the bill. Um, so as a matter of process today, I have chosen to abstain from eight motions that support bills that have not had an analysis done by um, our ledge team. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I see Samara here. Did you, do you wanna make any comments maybe on how we could improve this process uh, supporting uh, uh, bills in Sacramento and, you know, D.C., I would think, as well. Yes, thank you, and good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the board. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, as it was mentioned, our staff, uh, when we do, uh, when the legislative session begins, we do look at all of the bills that have been introduced to determine the impacts on the county. Currently, at the state level, we're uh, watching and taking positions on over 1,700 bills. There's been over almost 3,000 bills that have been, been introduced, but about those 1,700 have impacts on the county of Los Angeles. We've prioritized those bills based on potential impact to the county and also have um, looked at whether they've been heard in committee or when they'll be heard in committee. We send those and coordinate and collaborate with the departments. And then we come back and share many of those bills, of course, in our analysis with your board offices. Um, and so that's the way that we have uh, prioritized the analysis and review of bills is based on the impact to the county. And if there was a negative impact to the county, um you would probably not support us supporting a bill. So we follow the direction of the board, but our recommendation is if yeah. there's any potential operational or budgetary impact to the county, then we do wanna make sure that we are all aware of that. Mm -hmm. And then maybe also just for everybody's edification, what does it mean to send a five signature uh, letter in support of a bill? Um, wh what happens 
uh, in Sacramento if that five signature letter comes from the Board of Supervisors? So our understanding based on the feedback that we've heard from members of our delegation and others when they receive a five signature letter, it denotes support from our board. Uh, over the years, there has been a number of five signature letters on a variety of issues. They have signaled to us that it's not very clear um, based on the amount of five signature letters that they've received, which of those issues really rise to the top of being the board's priorities. Thank you. Um, Fizi, would you yes. like to? If I could put a finer point on that, yeah. and thank you for that answer, Samara. I think at the end of the day, it confuses the LA delegation because they don't, they are not able to differentiate what is a priority for a supervisorial district versus a countywide priority. And because we send a number of them, I think that they lose their significance um, in the eyes of, I can't speak for them, but based on feedback that we've heard in the eyes of some of the members of the LA delegation. Uh, yes, uh, I was gonna, uh, do you wanna talk on the, uh, the bigger issue of the um, uh, policy or the actual item five? The five oh, signature letter. But primarily on the policy. Okay, go ahead, because I know uh, uh, yeah. co the, the um, co-author of item five is um, right. Um, Lisa you know, I, mean, I think speak. the difference, and I too am just going to abstain because I, I do have concerns moving forward um, because especially when I hear from Fizia because the unintended consequences of taking a position on something that has not been fully vetted and even on the mental health legislation and I've been guilty of bringing in uh, support letters for legislation but when I do I try to at least drill down to the departments and I apologize to you for not handing it to you and saying we did an analysis. Way back when that was what was done. It was driven by the alleged division bringing forward, um, based on board priorities, recommendations to support legislation. And you know, I, I do have concerns. I think what's different about this item, which is why I'm going to support it, is Metro has fully vetted this. Sorry, this sorry, is consistent. You're not huh? You're not abstaining. No, not on, because oh. Metro has gone oh. through the process on this. It did not go through our ledge, but we do know um, uh, it, there has been um, uh, analysis done. But on some of these, there hasn't, and even looking at them, they they seem fine. But there may be some amendments that our CEO may feel are necessary to accommodate um, uh, possible concerns with departments, and again, unintended consequences. So I would just ask that maybe moving forward, Madam Chair, that we have a process that can be followed um, where when legislation is brought in, um, that we do triage it and see where it falls in terms of priority, but also that we have an analysis done, um, which, which is what was done probably 20 years ago. Um, and I don't, it kind of went to the wayside. In response to your original question, Supervisor Hahn, one of the things that we could do is when we have recommendations for IT, there is a line item on the board letter that like the CIO's office is support, you know, has cleared or vetted uh, this request, we could do something well, similar. Yeah, we could think it worth can think of that. I'm not ready at this point to change our policy, so that's for a broader discussion. Um, and you know, and again, when we send our support as the the largest county, right? I think it does make a difference. And um, I've heard that from uh, from our LA County de delegation, and it also it sort of signals to our legislative staff up in Sacramento. Um, that um, this is something we support, and I would expect that that would um, also um, direct their movements and their interaction up in, up in Sacramento. So we can talk about this as a, as a broader policy. And then technically, I guess, if it's a five signature letter item and one or more members abstains or votes no, then does it, it becomes a three signature letter? or however many, yeah, okay. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Slees, you're, you're the co-author on item five. Did you wanna speak on that? Yeah, I just wanna say on the policy, I totally support this item because it's been something that we have been working over the last few years on trying to address homelessness on our, on our rail system and you know in our terminals. And I think that uh, it has been vetted and I know that this is, uh, you know, Assemblywoman Friedman is, is, uh, holds a very powerful position She's also chair of the Assembly Transportation Committee. So I do think it says something. And even if we only have three members on it, so be it. Well, everyone- well, They're gonna support so this it. one. But I'm just saying that I think this is a good, this is a good piece of legislation and I support it. 
and I guess we'll have a further discussion on the policy, because I disagree with some of the statements made. I've had people tell me, legislators tell me, we get conflicting information from your department, Supervisor Solis, because you'll have a department that's out there advocating for funding, and they haven't told us, and that's competing directly with some of the things we're doing. So this is a big, broader discussion, mm -hmm. but nonetheless, you know, I do think it matters when we do come in and weigh in to support members that we know, mm -hmm. some are friends, but more than that, we want to show support for our local elected officials who oftentimes are just getting started, but are, are uh, pronouncing some, some good public policy that I think uh, helps the county overall. So that's all I want to say. Thank you. Um Thank you, and I will um, add to that, and you're right, I mean, uh, we're always um, saying we, we want our partners at the state level to also take an interest in, um, our, uh, in our addressing homelessness, particularly on uh, our buses and, and trains, and we're seeing all of us sit on uh, Metro, and we see um, how this is impacting, you know, the, the people. We, we, um, you know, we had some uh, some overdoses on, on Metro. Uh, we've been working to keep uh, them from being kicked off at, at the end of the line at one o'clock in the morning. Um, and so we've all realized it wasn't Metro's core mission to deal with this issue, but it has, every societal, societal ill spills over into our, our, met, our buses and our trains. So I like this, that this bill We'll make sure that the homeless providers who are applying for funding through the state's homeless housing assistance and prevention program will take into account how they're serving homeless who are at our bus stops and train stations. So it's, it's, um, it's a small step, but I think just adding that criteria, again, raises awareness of how we need to see our homeless providers addressing this issue and that it is very much uh, associated with, with, our, with our transit uh, agency and, and the bus stops and, and the platforms. So um, it's a Metro-sponsored bill, and um, I think it's important that the county take a stance in support. Again, I think it shows we've been asking for partners at the state and federal level, so when they step out there and, and put a bill that actually does partner with us, I think it's important that we support it. So thank you for your co-authorship, Supervisor Solis. And um, with that, are there members of the public? Oh, I'm sorry. There's, you're, all, you're all up here. Okay, um, let's see. Supervisor Barger, you're done. Okay, uh, Lindsay Horvath. Thank you very much. Um, I uh, am very much in support of this item. Increasingly, we're seeing our unhoused neighbors not only on our streets and sidewalks, but also on buses and trains. And we've heard um, many concerns in our capacity as Metro board members. Um, uh, about people wanting to uh, see action taken to support our unhoused neighbors. Outreach efforts to those unhoused haven't sufficiently included public transit spaces, and LA Metro has invested heavily to fill this gap to ensure that those experiencing homelessness on our transit systems are able to access services and housing. LA Metro is partnering with local municipalities to share data regarding the number of people served, and this item would support AB 1377, which requires jurisdictions applying for the Homeless Housing Assistance and Prevention Program funds to provide reporting that shows how people who are experiencing homelessness in public transit spaces are benefiting from the supportive housing and services. Um, I'm supportive of this item. It sounds like we're in unanimous agreement. Um, uh, the process uh, part aside, and I'll address that in a second, but I do, you know, I, I recognize the concerns um, when uh, duties are placed on our municipalities without the support or investment in being able to do this um, kind of work. I think this, this work is very important for us to collect data and understand what the experience is, but this does mean our municipalities will have to do work that is not being funded, and um, so we should always be mindful of those kinds of requests, just as we're talking about our process for LA County. Um, speaking of that process, for me, uh, you know, as a new board member, I, I came from a place that had 
um, legislative priorities determined that allowed our, um, our legislative advocates at all levels to take action swiftly as a bill might come forward and to help take action on priorities in between the times that we met. Um, if we want our legislative advocates to take action early, um, it's my understanding that this is how we're able to do it. Um, we can do analysis in our individual offices and raise these issues to, to the legislative office, but if we want to be in the game, and I use AB 1090 as an example, that the original draft had language that would have given LA County flexibility as it relates to our probation department, which we desperately need. Um, by taking early action and getting involved, perhaps we might have been able to uh, secure that language either in that bill or with another office. Um, but if we aren't able to take quick action, we kind of fall out of the game. And so um, if we want to have a more comprehensive conversation about what our process is, I'm happy to do that. Um, and I'm clear that that's um, why this item was held to sort of raise that issue for some of the other items that are on the agenda today. But some of those items, as uh, I have seen them in my office, fall within dis uh, designated legislative priorities of this board board, and yet we were told that action couldn't yet be taken because of, um, I'm not sure exactly what the next steps are. And so that's why we're bringing these items forward, um, so that way we can be in the game early, make sure that we're on record, and help influence legislation that we know can make an impact on, on LA County. So for my part, that you know, to weigh in on the process overall, I know that we won't be talking about that going forward on the other items on our agenda today, but thank you. Thank you. Uh, Catherine, are you, are you, oh, oh, Holly, okay, you're back up, but are you back up too, Catherine? Okay. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, seek clarification because I know there's a vast difference between watching a bill, supporting a bill, and opposing a bill. And so you said there were about 1,700, um, um, that you were watching. Just could you, does that mean when you're watching it, does that mean that you've done an analysis in terms of LA County impact if you're watching the bill? I should, I should have clarified, there's over 1,700 bills that we've identified that have an impact to the county. Of those, some of them, and when we are watching a bill, that means that we do send it out to our departments, that it also includes CEO budget, to determine what impacts there are to the county. Um, and there are, so we do have bills that we have already, uh, because we do have administrative authority through the board policy um, based on the approved state and federal legislative agendas to be able to weigh in and take positions on bills via pursuits. And so there are bills that we have already taken positions on in support and also in opposition on behalf of the board. Uh, many of those, of course, before we do so, we do share it with uh, policy deputies in your offices. Excellent, thank you. And, you know, and again, um, I started out by saying I support the measure because it's a Metro-sponsored bill and Metro has done the analysis. Um, everyone can have an opinion on the value of a five signature letter and that wasn't the issue I was raising. I was simply asking that we know, you know, through the legislative process, unlike here, they have a 30 day wait period. And so we do have 30 days before it's heard in its first committee to be able to see it and do the analysis. Um, we all absolutely can do it individually, but if you're asking for a five signature letter, from my perspective, that requires a different level of assessment. Um, as a state legislator, I would get five signature letters. I would get, uh, um, I'd have um, county lobbyists testifying in committee, and then I would get calls from board members, um, sometimes saying very different things. So I'm just, based on my experience, hoping that we have a process by which we all are confident that a county lens has been put on a piece of legislation before the five signature letter goes up because there are multiple ways in which you get individual board letters, individual calls from board members. It, it can be um, confusing, quite frankly, having sat in those seats for 10 years and, and had conflicting information sent to me. So all I'm saying is if we can get analysis with the county perspective, um, that's when I will be more than comfortable to add my signature to the five signature letter. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Berger. So, and I appreciate um, what Supervisor Horvath said, and I would like to get a clarification because we do approve a packet, both state and federal, and that I thought was done to give you the ability to do in real time advocating on behalf of bills. So I guess my question to you is, um, would, these, would these have risen, pick one, um, would the one that we're talking about right now, would that, that would rise to the level of already having pre-approval for you to advocate 
on behalf of this legislation. Uh, yes, Supervisor, that bill we do have an existing policy to support because of the work that uh, your board has done to approve our state and federal legislative agendas. Uh, where we are looking for as part of our analysis, so our team does the analysis, but we do also uh, look for input from county departments, and as I also mentioned, CEO budget, and that's, those are the comments that we do wait to receive to determine as subject matter experts if they have any additional information to provide that would allow us to um, fully comprehend the impacts of those bills. So my ask in real time, because I agree with you that, that, that if we get in early, we have a chance of, of addressing some of the concerns or even strengthening the legislation. My ask would be, I know that departments have their own legislative divisions, so they can't say that, that I mean, this is their job. It has to be done in real time. Um, I mean, most of this legislation, I'm sure they already know about um, or know that it's coming down because I'm, I'm told that they do seek input from us um, oftentimes uh, in terms of, of how we go about doing certain departments and all. So I would ask that we at least look at a turnaround that's fairly quick, especially on items that have already got board, a green light for board uh, approval or support, so that an analysis can be done. Then we can triage and determine which ones are best suited for five signature and which ones are maybe the board goes up, board members go up who have a priority on this item. Um, you know, I mean, because I think to that point, and I've never been in Sacramento, but I think when you get a lot of letters and we all get them, um, it, it dilutes the, the strength of the letter if we're sending in 80 you know, letters a year and we, they don't know, I think it was said, they don't know what our priorities are. I think you said that. So I think it's important for us also to use our voice in areas that we know are priorities, like this with the homeless on, on, um, on the, uh, the Metro, I know there's one on housing, which also is an important issue, but I think we have an opportunity here to really um, use our voice in the best manner possible when we're advocating both the state and federal. Thank you. Uh, Samara, did you want to? Oh, I was just going to say yes, we will continue to work uh, and, and request for departments to turn around their comments to us quickly. Right. Thank you. But, uh, and I, you know, I appreciate everybody's comments. Um, and yeah, that's, you know, we set out um, our board, board priorities um, uh, every year. And that's what, um, you, that's the lens that you're looking at um, this legislation that's happening. And you're right, sometimes we need to act quickly. We need to get in the game. Uh, there's one that bypassed all of us uh, that really impacted the county and everybody sort of missed it. Um, because it wasn't considered a priority. So, the, we, you know, we just got to, our communication has to remain open. Samara, you've got a great team. You're very knowledgeable. You really, I, we'd love seeing you here at the board, to be honest with you. I, you know, maybe we, we get Samara to come uh, more regularly and, and, and give us, uh, you know, what's, what, what's happening. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I understand the idea of we don't want to, dilute our voice, but you know, when we, when we send a five signature letter, I still would tend to believe that it's important. Uh, they listen, uh, and it's a, it's a voice that uh, I think we need to made, make heard no matter how many times we do it on bills that matter. And I think, you know, talk, you can all uh, pick up the phone and call our, our LA County delegation and see, and they probably, some of them probably have a similar experience to Supervisor Mitchell. Or not, you know, I, I know I always get an earful when I talk to our LA County uh, delegation about how we either do or don't support uh, cer certain bills. And you're right, you know, we have, some, we have friends um, and we wanna make sure that um, a as a county we're, we're heard. And I don't believe our voice is diluted every time, every time we, we speak. So thank you for that. And with that, make sure my colleagues uh, are not on the queue. Uh, do we have uh, members of the public that would like to speak on this? Yes. Well, Damian Washington, Dr. Critical Truth Bay, Herman Herman, Mike Greenspan, Patricia McAllister, Samuel Monroe, and Shamir Grant, please come forward and staff will assist you. Moderator, may we have the first remote speaker, please? Yes, our first participant is Geneve Claverell. You may begin.
Ms. Claver, your line is open. Moving along, we'll go to Olivia Shields. You may begin. Hi, I'm just calling in. Oh, this is Olivia Shields from Urban Peace Institute and LA's Uprising Coalition. I'm calling in to remind the Board of Supervisors of your commitment to use Justice Reimagined. Having attended the Board of uh, State and Community Corrections meeting in person, I was really frustrated with the inconsistency um, around what Han shared when speaking about probation, specifically naming hiring 450 more officers by the end I of don't the year. I don't believe you're, you all uh, I, 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 I don't believe this person is speaking on item five. Oh, I am, the recommended budget. No, no, we're done with that. We, this is item five. It's oh. a letter supporting AB 1377. So, thank you. Okay. Uh, next speaker, please. Melinda Kakani, you may begin. Uh, they took themselves out of queue. Eric Previn, you may begin. Thank you. Uh, and I appreciate the, the board's efforts at the uh, working on the legislative agenda. And I, I believe that this is regarding a Sacramento matter, which is why I think it's very important that we defer to Supervisor Mitchell, who is the expert on Sacramento activity. I would also say let's defer to Supervisor Hahn when it comes to Washington-based activity. So that would be a fun kind of way to handle that. And as we know, uh, and I hope that everybody has already started packing their bags and getting their amenities ready, uh, it is dangerously close to liftoff for our big trip to Washington. And I can tell you personally, I am, I'm over the moon with this. I think this is a great opportunity to not just be together and spend time, but to go resource uh, shopping in a way. And, you know, once we get all the resources, later we can worry about how to fill the unfilled positions. Because I know we do have 114,000 positions on the budget, but how many thank you. Oh, that's are your time. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Eric. Uh, and thank you for saying that I was an expert on yeah. Washington, D.C. I would defer to my colleague, Supervisor Solis, who is much more of an expert on Washington, D.C. Uh, than I was in. Yeah, I'm, bad, I'm glad you're, you're excited too. about our Washington trip. Sounds like you're going. I, I hadn't heard that you were on the trip. Okay, next speaker, please. Next, we'll go to Jose Martinez. You may begin. Uh, is this general comment? Uh, no, this is on item five. We're supporting uh, AB 1377. Okay, um, you're, you're in the wrong okay, one. Okay, we'll go back in the queue and you can come back for general public comment. Is there other speakers on item five? In person. Madam Chair, there are no other speakers in queue. Okay. So Snyder versus Helps for the record. Why say this? Because the Democrat from Glendale District 44 talks about transparency and regu regulations off of 300 East Magnolia Boulevard, Suite 504, Burbank, California. This is not a Herman stick on well, yeah. the item. Well, is it the assembly bill based on Ms. Friedman? No, it's not. It's based on transportation Isn't it and homeless. Item number five regarding risk of homelessness and homelessness. It's not about talking about the and, and, author and how of the to bill. deliver it's talking about the this. bill. Right, and how to deliver what so-called fucking housing and fucking uh, All right, transportation thank you. Uh, for the turn fucking off his you're being, sir, yeah. you're being disruptive. No, no we're, you know what? We would listen to you if you would not use that kind of language. So, no, we're not going to listen to that language. So, you, you could, if you spoke to us with respect and dignity, we would listen to you. Next speaker, please. You're disrupting the meeting. You're disrupting the meeting. You just you, uh, Sergeant Arms. We might have to ask you to remove him if he doesn't. If he continues to disrupt, turn him in. Turn him in, Howard. Okay. Uh, next speaker, please. Trisha McAllister. I've uh, been on those trains. We can't even sit down. You let people sleep on it. Uh, they're sleeping in the seats. Uh, it is soiled overdosing on the trains this 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 body here some of you may one one may be for real but the rest of you you you're not qualified I looked at your record Janet before you even came came on this uh, panel you had no history no background in homelessness nothing 
you, I don't, people stop voting for these Democrats. When you go and vote, you click everything Republican, Republican, Republican. We put six Republicans in Congress okay, are this you past speaking midterm to this, are you election. Speaking now, to item about five, this right here, I think this is five. racist. I think this is racist. You want data. That means you want to know how many black people are getting some help. I heard you say, Jen, and I read it, that you said, oh, how, why do we have so many Latinos who are homeless? See, I know the game. This is racist. Next speaker, please. Mike Greenspan. Yes, I, I remember you, I used to go years ago before COVID to the Metro meetings, and I'd always make a remark because I would come in on the red line and say, yeah, came in by the Pullman. And we're talking about 2019, 2020. So, I mean, it's nothing new. The, the red line from North Hollywood is the Pullman car. And you know what that means, a sleeping car. Yeah, the, the officers, they're at the top, and they're at the mezzanine, I guess you'd call it. And then at the plaza, where the people are sleeping in the cars, they're nowhere near there. Let's get real, folks. The other thing, okay, you got the, things like the um, metro thing over there in El Monte. Well, what, what kind of housing do they have built there? Luxury apartments, the Ashton and something else. They're built, they have these transit zones for luxury apartments. We're not going to house the homeless over there at metro. Oh, we will on the train. Okay, thank that's you. It. Your time is up. Next speaker, please. Okay, so Assembly Bill 1377, Laura Friedman, a pro proposed a bill that you should be working on already. All of that that she displayed concerning the need to address homelessness, you should already have that plan. So I don't know what the five uh, signature letter is going to do or the difference it's going to make. Basically, you guys are on notice. The same fate that Mark Ridley Thomas has faced is what we're going to approach on all angles. I try to be kind. I try to be nice behind the scenes. I even call. You got Catherine Barger not even looking. You got Hilda Syed sitting over there with the stain on her face. I mean, can you guys do something after we leave here and complete the transaction? Meaning high, having staff that's knowledgeable on how to communicate would be number one. Homelessness is not a career. It is not a get well bag for you. It should be a solution and it shouldn't be a career for the same faces. Okay? Again, okay, you all know this, so I appreciate it. Uh, next speaker, please. I'm Damian Washington. I'm a citizen of the kingdom. And once again, I'm up here asking y'all to help. And the last time I was up here, I pretty much told y'all that y'all time is running up. Okay, we're on item five right now. This is about a, a, a it's supporting still an assembly bill. asking y'all for the homeless help. I've been homeless this whole time. And instead of helping me, y'all send people out to follow me, to scope and see what I'm doing and all that. It's completely out of line. Y'all need to find something else to do and help the homeless. Okay, if, if somebody, do you, did you, would you like to speak to somebody? While you're here, about I'm speaking to y'all right now. Oh, somebody that could work with you right here in the auditorium. As long as they don't give me the runaround. Okay, can I somebody? Speak to um, won't give me the we'll try again. Can somebody work with him? Thank you. Next speaker, please. Well, um, I'm Samuel Monroe Jr. Um, yeah, and um, I'm in the same uh, position. Okay. Right, you know, so right now, everybody, we're on item five, and. So we're, we're talking speaking, about I'm, supporting a bill. We're not talking about homelessness in general. We're talking about supporting a specific bill in Sacramento. Right, about homelessness. Can you let him get his 40 seconds in, Janet? Well, yeah. Well, you're cutting me off and you... Well, we, we, you know, we, we, have, we have rules well, for you, the meeting. Well, yeah, if it's about homelessness, I'm a homeless man out here in Los Angeles yeah, County. So, you know, to cut me off is very rude and disturbing, you know? Come on, it's, 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 not, it's, it's distasteful, you know, but I'm not going to be belligerent and ignorant like, you know, um, maybe, you know, somebody think I would be, but I'm not. Um, I can, but I won't. But um, in, in, in any event, um, I, I just need some help. Uh, and if it was the shoe was on the other foot, 
and you were screaming in a closet so somebody had you locked no. in. That's how we would like to help you. Uh, you would want somebody to help you. We would like to help you. You would want somebody to help you. Would you be willing to speak with somebody right now? I'm already speaking to somebody. Okay, great. You're here. Look, Thank I'm you. here. I showed up oh, and sir. we're here. Thank you. Okay. And not to, not to be disturbing, but Thank we're here. Thank you. We don't for want to be disrespectful either, but we want, we want to see if we can get you help. Um, Thank you. Do we have others on the. Um, Okay, no more speaking from where you are. We're, you're disrupting the meeting. You're disrupting the meeting. That's your second warning. Uh, we're going to remove you from the auditorium. We're, we're going to remove you so that we can continue the meeting. Okay, next speaker, please. Okay. Um, you know, this is, this is sad. 360 sad you all are antagonizing your constituents you miss Han you have been cynical and snide with me in the past I don't conduct myself that way I try to be civilized but you're you're acting out of frustration you're responding out of frustration I get it some very I do need you things. to speak on item five okay I will but let's I'm, get I'm our emotions you with in respect check. to speak on item five yeah but you're very sarcastic and cynical so anywho you all are talking about these assessments and keeping on the watch no we're I, talking about item five I I understand so hold on don't do that. Well, I'm my my county council. But you're taking my time away from me. One county second. Council, but you need they... to be on topic. So you need okay. to speak about item five, which is Assembly Bill okay. 1377. Okay. okay. One second. I'd like to talk to your county council. I've emailed you. You blocked me. Okay. Thank you. Um, your time Hold on. Is you up took now. you deprived me of my constitutional rights. I was getting to my point. I was talking about the. 2022 annual homeless assessment report. No, thank that's you. HUD. Thank you very much, but that's not on topic. So it is on topic. It no. coincides with what this no. young lady was talking no. about. Um, can, um, but that's okay. I'll add that to my tort claim. Okay, thank you. Is there another speaker? There's the, all the speakers, Madam Chair. Okay, great. Um, and you know, uh, County Council, you can make sure that we, because we do have certain rules as it relates to the public speaking on our items of business, uh, and uh, we do uh, uh, require that people speak on the item. So we just make sure, on topic, so just make sure that you are, are also keeping us on topic. Um, hearing no other comments, item five is now before us. Uh, I will move, seconded by Supervisor Solis, to approve the item. Executive officer, please call the roll. Item five is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Horvath. Aye. Supervisor Horvath, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Okay, we're gonna move on to item seven, building climate ready communities and infrastructure in LA County, which I held. And for members of the public on the telephone, please press one then zero now to comment on this item. Uh, it's hard to deny that Los Angeles County is experiencing more extreme and severe weather patterns due to climate change. We've seen increase in wildfires, heat storms, drought, and most recently intense rainfalls. These extreme weather events are out of our control, but they pose a variety of threats to public infrastructure, which connects and protects the people that we serve, which is why I'm bringing this motion forward to create a countywide climate ready initiative led by our Department of Public Works in collaboration with our Chief Sustainability Officer and various departments to work together and collaborate to bring more climate resilient projects. This new working group will assess infrastructure projects from various departments and find ways that we can proactively include climate change ready infrastructure. By having multiple departments at the table, we will also see additional multi-benefit projects, which are nonprofits and our communities have voiced that they want to see more of. This board has already taken action to respond to climate change concerns, including the completion of our climate vulnerability assessment. This working group will utilize the findings from that assessment to prioritize vulnerable populations and communities most susceptible to climate hazards while also 
identifying ways to communicate these to the communities, they, the risks that they face, and providing them with the information on how they can also protect themselves. I know each of our departments are doing their part to address climate change issues, and this is a way that we can bring everybody together as it relates to our public infrastructure. Um, I, uh, I'm going to have Supervisor Horvath, as the co-author of this, um, speak next, and then I see Mark Vestrella is also at the table. Thank you very ma much, Madam Chair. I appreciate you including me as co-author on this motion, and I'm glad to be having this conversation today, and thank you to our department for your leadership and your efforts. According to recent FEMA analysis, LA County is exposed to more natural hazards than any other county in the United States. Between floods, wildfires, sea level rise, and the most dangerous climate hazard, heat, our communities are exposed to increased harm due to the impacts of climate change. And this is particularly true in my district where wildfires threaten communities from the foothills above Silmar to Malibu, where intense flooding has crippled our infrastructure in communities like Chatsworth, where temperatures rose to a record setting and asphalt melting 121 degrees in Woodland Hills, and our precious coastlines face erosion from rising seas and intense storms. I grew up with climate hazards and I'm ready to prioritize both adaptation to a changing climate and mitigating and reducing the poisonous greenhouse gas emissions that cause climate change. LA County has some of the best prepared and award-winning sustainability and resiliency plans in the nation, but we need to work hard to put those strategies in those documents to work and ensure that they are funded. The climate vulnerability assessment was completed in 2021, showing the specific risks that this changing climate poses on LA County communities. And I'd like to commend our uh, Office of Sustainability's preparation of this plan and our leadership from our Public Works Department as well in its implementation. Armed with this analysis, it's now time to act with specific plans to keep communities safe and resilient, including identification of opportunities for investments that build resilience in our most vulnerable communities. Additionally, we need to consider how our early warning and communication strategies can be improved and leverage community partners and the media. We also need to think strategically about the once in a generation federal and state resources available to us right now to seize on this imperative moment. I would like to see this work con consider both engineered solutions like our flood control infrastructure, our transportation infrastructure, and new technologies like cool pavement, as well as natural solutions such as addressing inequities in tree canopy. I look forward to us continuing our work on climate change adaptation to make our communities as resilient as possible. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. I'm Supervisor Parker. Thank and I'm you. I'm Supervisor Solis. Thank you. And I want to thank you, Chair Hahn and Supervisor Horvath, for this motion. Representing a district as diverse as a fifth, I can tell you that these issues have been at the top of my mind, and I know at, at yours as well, Director Pastrella. Climate resilience is a critical issue for the constituents of the fifth district, and it's vital that we use every technological tool at our disposal. Some of the fifth district communities are still recovering from the effects of the lakes and bobcat fires, which impacted areas from the Antelope Valley to the San Gabriel Valley foothills. The county's climate vulnerability report noted that significant parts of the fifth will face challenges because of climate change. The report makes clear that the fifth district has some of the highest exposure to extreme heat, wildfire, inland flooding, especially in the North County. In addition, the report notes that the North County and the San Gabriel Valley are the most physically vulnerable to impacts of extreme heat due to the vulnerability of our en energy infrastructure. While some of this vulnerability of the North County is due to its unique topography and climate, there has been a long historic lack of investment in the region, which as we know is one of the regions providing a refuge for affordable housing for many, many families. The North County is a significant need of investment to modernize the infrastructure to avoid having these communities be disproportionately affected by the impact of climate change. However, I would be remiss if I did not point out that these are challenges that we are already facing. Much of the Antelope Valley and Santa Clarita Valleys lack the flood control infrastructure to address existing storm flows, let alone the projections of volatile weather events which will likely result with additional inland flooding. In addition, the 5th District is home to more than half of the county's centerline roadway uh, miles. These roads need continuous maintenance and upgrade to ensure 
they can handle projected impact. Also, the county's Water Work District 40 provides potable water service to more than 57,000 connections in the Antelope Valley, serving more than 215,000 people. District 40, like most water districts, is dealing with ongoing drought conditions and the need to deal with the growing regulations for contaminants such as PIPAs and microplastics. We must address the district's lack of capacity to utilize uh, existing water supply and the over-reliance over of imported water, which is what they currently do up there. Our ability to tap into existing water supply can significantly reduce costs, costs being borne by our residents, which is especially challenging for families on lower or fixed income. We need to provide the opportunity for the districts to further invest in capital improvements to increase resiliency of our system. The long-term sustainability of our drinking water resource is a critical component to building resilience and, ba and ensure basic human right of access to safe, clean drinking water. There is a lot of work ahead of us, but I am confident that these efforts will be led, um, have th these efforts are being led by us in the right direction. Therefore, it's vital that we use the tools that we have um, come out of this assessment to build in resilience in our communities. I hope this effort will factor in these historic inequities and the right to the injustices as it attempts to balance the need to invest in, in critical climate resilient infrastructure in all parts of the county. But I do commend you for this motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Supervisor Solis. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Supervisor Horsbath. I also appreciate the department heads that are here today. This is a really timely issue. Just yesterday, uh, we were at uh, Mark Costello. You recall we were at the Clean Tech Center here in downtown and meeting with the vice president. She talked about uh, renewable energy and different sources of energy and to lower our carbon emissions. So it's very timely that this is all coming along at the right time, and it is impactful. And I want to say that... Um, we know how important it is for us to get on the right track. And part of it is our commitment to achieve carbon neutrality. We all know that we have a, an agreement, the Paris Climate Agreement by 2050, that we should try to achieve, and we should do our part here in LA County because we are the largest county in the entire country. But I also wanna say that it's important for us to look at how we deal with this issue in unincorporated areas, not just East LA, not just where there's uh, how could I say, disparities that we know exist, but really looking down and seeing where some of our communities who we thought may have been well off in unincorporated areas, farther east in my district now, Roland Heights, Hacienda Heights, where we also are seeing signs of distress. And we're seeing that we have to provide more uh, tree canopy, more sources of, uh, how could I say, I don't want to say air conditioning, but <laughs> that's not the right word, but seeing where we could have cooling centers and really utilizing our, our solar power and energy and, and ingenuity to see how we can bring those out to communities that otherwise would have been excluded and are excluded, and partly because historic redlining that has taken place, and we see it, it's coming to fruition now. We should be using everything in our arsenal to help repave our parks, blacktops, all of those things with recyclable materials and plastics that are really gonna help to provide incentives. We're doing it now, I know at some of our parks, some of our facilities, but I don't know that we really have caught, we've caught you know, really a wind of how much more we can do. And I hope that we will use whatever abilities we have to get the, uh, not just the uh, Washington administration, Biden administration, but also Gavin Newsom in the state of Sacramento and our legislative team to help us move this, move this along. So I, I'm totally supportive of it. Want to see how we can bring equity to communities that I represent, uh, including uh, places like East Los Angeles, the south uh, south end of my district, southeast end of my district that is very disproportionately impacted. So thank you both for bringing this motion thank to you. us. Look forward to hearing the plan. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't think there was any real questions, but I, I would be remiss, uh, Mr. Pastrella, if we didn't let you uh, say something about what we're talking about. Well, I'll be quick, Chairwoman uh, Hahn, because I know you've had a long day, but um, I really do think this is an opportunity for the departments to go to action on the Climate Action Plan and the Sustainability Plan is what we've been looking for is a, a, a group and a collaborative effort in the department to focus on an incorporated county with equity, as you all have brought up, 
and looking for our most vulnerable communities to treat them and to assess what we can do right now in the face of what is inevitable. And that's a 1.5 degree increase in um, temperature for the entire world, um, which means this place will heat up and we've already seen the effects of that. So we're really pleased, I thank you for the motion and we're very pleased to get going. And I know my fellow department heads are excited to put um, pen to paper and actually boots to the ground to start um, improving the resiliency of the unincorporated communities that we serve. And did you want to introduce your... Yes, thank you, uh, Supervisor Hahn. Um, today I have with me Assistant Director uh, Mickey Esposito. Uh, Mickey um, hails from Lincoln, Nebraska. She was hired a year ago to come and um, head um, the Department of Public Works focus on resiliency and sustainability. She's a representative to the um, Environmental Protection Agency, Federal Env Environmental Protection Agency, and has been working on these issues um, in Lincoln, Nebraska, but also now bringing that um, expertise to serve Hale, here in LA County. She'll be leading this initiative for the Los Angeles County Department of Public Works. Great, thank you. Welcome. Did you want to say anything while you're here? Okay. <laughs> Anytime you're in front of a microphone, you should use it. Um, you never know when we'll call you back. Um, anyway, thank, thank you both. Thank you, colleagues. Um, and are there members of the public that would like to speak on item seven? Will Donald Harlan please come forward and staff will assist you? Moderator, may we have the first remote speaker, please? Our first participant is Eric Previn. You may begin. Thank you. Well, I would, I would describe this as a, a time of spectacular celebration because we had the vice president here just the other day over at the incubator, the Mark Ridley Thomas incubator, been rebranded as the Karen Bass incubator. I just think that this is an opportunity to do a little resource shopping in this space, but also to remember some of the basic ways that Angelinos who live in the unincorporated area, but also the regular part of the county, can save water and can conserve and be effective at reducing the temperature, uh, as Mr. Mastrella pointed out, uh, throughout the world. This is not exclusive to LA County. That's what I like about uh, Supervisor Horvath. She grew up with people being aware of the climate, and that is critical to getting anything done. And all of the political targets that are put way off that Garcetti and the mayor like is really, you know, their goals. We have to we have to be good. We have to hang the towel up to dry. Don't wash five towels oh, every thank week. You. Oh, thank you, Eric. Um, thank you. So gross to what you were saying. Good tip. Uh, next speaker, please. Our next participant is Sarah Deemer. You may begin. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm so grateful for everything that the county is doing. And thank you so much to all the supervisors. I founded and run the Delta Rising Foundation, which is a 501c3 nonprofit. We catalyze our cultural evolution to science-based sustainability systems through many mechanisms, including sustainability products, including sustainability architectural elements, I represent a diverse group of professionals, architects, engineers, AI computer scientists that come together to design sustainability products. And when I saw this call for number seven, I just had to call in. I would very much love to present to Supervisor Hahn's office, Supervisor Horvath's office, anyone at Public Works, the Acting Chief Sustainability Officer, the Department of Public Health, Regional Planning, Parks and Rec, and Emergency Management, whomever would like to meet with me, to present our solutions, which are based in science, but are also quite artful, graceful, and provide shade, feeding, light, plants, and pollinators to areas of cities along transportation corridors. And we've identified three to $5 million of funding we'd love to bring through the county. Thank you. We're ready to thank partner. You. We're, thank, thank you, you so thank much. Thank you for that. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Sir Bailey. You may begin. Grace and peace. Thank you, uh, Board of Supervisors in Los Angeles, for hearing my statement. Um, I'm hoping and full of hope, full of faith and love that we will recognize the possibility of convergence of different items. Reimagining Los Angeles means reimagining how we have from homeless to houseless 
And I uh, propose that we look at eco pioneers because there are people that are moderating their uh, carbon footprint with sacrifice, with heavy sacrifice. And there's opportunity for involvement, for equity, for everyone to get involved from the youth to the houseless. But we know what we need to do. We need to share the resources and the opportunity to be involved, not cutting people off, not cutting people out, but bringing folks in that have lived experience. Thank you for allowing me Thank to you. Share. Next speaker, please. Oh, here we go, in person. Hi, this is for agenda item number seven. Uh, yes. I'm Donald Harlan. Uh, this is about the building climate ready communities and infrastructure in Los Angeles County. Uh, I reject your climate survey. Uh, this is another attempt to illegally claim some CEQA owns some property or there's some type of climate emergency why you need to more build more illegal apartment buildings. Uh, your guys are no good. Your surveys, you're looking for real estate to develop illegally. I know that when you illegally develop a apartment building that the utilities cost more because you haven't invested in those infrastructures. And this is just another attempt to try and attach utilities to your legal developments. Sequit doesn't own those properties. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Oh, how are we letting him speak, I thought? Well, because the infrastructure in Los Angeles is doomed, Janet. That's why. And you know that because of an emergency management that has failed and having Hilda Solis go to Washington and she knows more than the most of you, why are we going through all these crises through emergencies with, with such vulnerabilities as flooding, drought, heat? No one seems to care. The only person who cares is me that comes to every meeting and criticizes the way the infrastructure, not just in Los Angeles, that shithole place down there called Downey, Miss Han, where you represent. A and that mayor there, Miss Fatty Frometa, continues to censor me by not showing me on a monitor like this because people want to know who the fuck is saying this shit okay, because we're on they want to know more top. about uh, the your, drought are, please, and the emergency you're being management. Disruptive. You're not on top. You're being disruptive. Listen, ma'am, Snyder for America's doom. Your time's They're expired. They're going to hell. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Those are all the speakers, Madam Chair. Okay, um, hearing no other comments, item seven is now before us. I will move, seconded by Supervisor Horvath, to approve this item. Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item seven is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Horvath. Aye. Supervisor Horvath, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Okay, now we're gonna move on to items 18 and we're hearing item 21 at the same time. Item 18 is support for Assembly Bills 732, relinquishment of firearms, and 733, sale by government entity. And item 21, support for Assembly Bill 1638, local government use of a foreign language. Supervisor Solis, would you like to make remarks? Yes, thank you so much, Madam Chair. And I wanna thank you also for co-authoring these uh, two motions, item 18 and 21. I especially wanna thank Assembly Member Mike Fong for bringing these bills to my attention, given that our jurisdictions intersect, but more importantly, we're really talking about broad policy issues here that we need to address and have in the past, specifically uh, when it comes to uh, communities that are made up of the Asian Pacific Islander areas. Colleagues, these two motions in front of you are to support three bills authored by Assemblymember Mike Fong, who represents the 49th District, which includes parts of the San Gabriel Valley, including El Monte, Monterey Park, and San Gabriel Valley. Item 18 will direct our CEO, Legislative Affairs and Intergovernmental Relations to support AB 732 and AB 733. Item 21 will direct CEO LAIR to support AB 1638. Let me just talk quickly about item 18. We collectively have supported many gun safety related bills over the past several years. And just this year alone, we passed 11 
different motions related to gun safety, which also includes motions that created new ordinances that prohibits carrying firearms on county property and bans the sale of .50 caliber arms and ammunition. These two bills are in the same thread of trying to keep our residents safe from gun-related violence and harm. There is currently a process to remove firearms from people who engage in offenses who are prohibited from owning them. AB 732 would strengthen the current process and increase coordination between the state, Department of Justice, and local agencies to address the backlog of people who still possess firearms despite being prohibited from doing so. As of January 2022, the state's Armed and Prohibited Person Systems database had 24,509 people on there, and at least 5,000 additional names are added every year. When this database was reviewed, individuals were only remo removed due to their passing away or their prohibition had expired. What lacked, though, was the state and local agencies actively reviewing those lists to ensure that firearms are removed from those who are prohibited to possess them. Just as we need responsive gun ownership, we also need to strengthen processes to ensure state and local agencies are utilizing the systems that are in place that they're intended. On item 18, it also asks the board to direct our legislative affairs to support AB 733. The bill should come as no surprise to this board. Shortly after I heard from the probation department was going to auction surplus firearms, I put forward a motion with Supervisor Hahn as my co-author to end this practice, not just for probation, but countywide. By unanimously supporting this motion, we took a stance that the county should not be in the business of putting more guns on the street by removing them and as allowed by law. The bill would prohibit this practice statewide as it would prohibit them from selling firearms, firearm parts, ammunition, and body armor, and would ensure that government entities are following best practices and they are not playing a role in putting more deadly weapons on the streets in our local neighborhoods. We're going to do all that, I hope, um, because we can try to prevent those incidents that occurred, one in particular in Monterey Park. Lastly, item 21 would support Assemblymember Fong's bill, AB 1638. It has been a long, excuse me, I have been a long time proponent of ensuring our county and its departments are not only culturally competent, but also linguistically inclusive. I put a motion forward in early March to expand language access in the county. In fact, we're expecting a report back in September. Most of our residents, as you know, are immigrants, and English may not be their preferred or first language. For instance, in my district, over 50% are Latino, and 25% are AAPI. We are constantly telling our residents about the bounty of resources that the county has to offer. But what good is it, is it if we're not telling them or using messengers who are sensitive to the cultural languages that they speak? AB 1638 speaks to this, but especially during hard times and emergencies as to what just happened in Monterey Park earlier this year. When the mass shooting occurred, we were all watching and listening hour by hour, sometimes minute by minute, to hear the updates, most of all of which were in English. Helpful to those communities that might not have been impacted, but unhelpful to those communities like Monterey Park and Alhambra, where most of the residents there are 70% AAPI and speak only AAPI languages. This bill would ensure that there should be a time when there is a mass trauma, violence, or emergency in a jurisdiction where 10% of the population or more primarily speak another language other than English. The local public agency should provide information related to the emergency in both English and other languages spoken primarily by that community. Given how large the county is and how diverse, it's incumbent on our leaders and first responders to be culturally competent and linguistically inclusive. And I know that our Department of Mental Health did so by, by deploying some of their therapists right, right away that spoke Cantonese, Mandarin, and other languages. We can't say that about all our other departments yet, but hopefully this will take us in the right direction. Therefore, colleagues, I respectfully ask for your I vote on both item 18 and 21. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me to uh, co-author these motions with you. Um, this board has made it very clear that we'll do whatever 
we can within our power to strengthen gun regulations and keep our communities safe, irregardless of what Congress does or um, most likely doesn't do. Uh, since January, I think you said it, this board has passed 11 uh, motions strengthening or supporting gun violence prevention regulations. Most recently, we directed our Office of Violence Prevention to make sure that people in Los Angeles County know about gun violence restraining orders, uh, which remove guns from people who are at risk of hurting themselves or others. This is one of those laws that's on the book, but a lot of people didn't know it existed, so we want to make sure uh, that they're knowledgeable. This is one tool that we do have in California that gets guns out of the hands of people who may use them to inflict harm. Item 18 on uh, this agenda supports Assembly Bill 732, which if passed is another tool we will have to strengthen the process of removing guns fr from people who are not legally allowed to own them, <clears throat> in this case due to a criminal conviction. There are too many people who have slipped through the cracks and continue to illegally own guns, so this bill would address that issue. The motion also supports Assembly Bill 733, which would make it illegal for local and state agencies to sell firearms, ensuring that government bodies are not contributing to putting uh, these guns back out on the streets and potentially bringing harm to our communities. We're also voting on item 21, <clears throat> which supports Assembly Bill 1638 and um, <coughs> is supporting this um, I approve of. Yeah, I just want to, well, and actually Fezia just left, but I was going to ask because these, these are a classic example of, um, I think what we're referring to, Th there is a board position to your point on the gun. There is a board position on the, li the um, language because you brought that in. And then what was the third one? Um, yeah, so, yeah, the database. So, so, I mean, I guess this is an example of where, I, and I don't know how they make sausage up there. I really don't understand it. Did you know about this legislation already? Uh, good afternoon again, supervisors. Yes, our office was aware, and we did produce analysis for your board offices on AB 732 and AB 7. 33, both bills, we do not have existing uh, policy in the board approved state for federal legislative agendas for us to take a position on those on our own. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Uh, any other, my colleagues would like to speak on this? Okay. Uh, seeing none, are there members of the public that would like to speak on 18 and 21? Will the following individual please come forward? Patricia McAllister. Moderator, may we have the first remote speaker, please? There's nobody on the phone lines queued up. Hey, Judy. Judy. Are there anybody, uh, any, any persons in here in the auditorium? Okay. Thank you. Number, eight, number 18, uh, you want, uh, I guess, the police? to disarm Americans who've been charged with a crime or convicted? Are you insane? You got the border open to eight million illegal aliens since crazy Joe Biden got in office and opened up the border. We got terrorists here being blown up. Uh, the country's being blown up every day, factories hold on, and everything. Hold on a second, hold on a second. The timer is not working, oh. but hold oh, on. Oh, good, okay. Yeah, now we'll give you, okay, we can start it over. Start it one minute. Okay, thank you. Okay, go. Okay, okay, I disagree with number uh, 18 about disarming, taking the weapons of people who have a criminal record. How can you do that at this time when Joe Biden, and I said crazy Joe Biden, has opened the border, eight million illegal aliens, we're getting factories and everything blown up every day, and people are wondering, well, this never happened before. Well, we're we having all these uh, uh, explosions. You, you can't disarm Americans at this particular time. We need our weapons, okay? We've got terrorists in here, we've got the drug cartels, everybody's in this nation. And even I heard you make a statement I read, I do a lot of reading, you said that you wanted these illegal aliens who come in across the border to come to LA County to work and they wouldn't get arrested. Yes, you did, see, I keep up with what's going on. Yes, this, this commission did say that. So we, 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 we need our weapons at this time. If, if we're attacked, 
How are we going to protect ourselves if you've taken our weapons? So it's making me think that the Bolsheviks are here. A lot of you guys come from the former Soviet Union. Thank that's you. That's why we got a lot uh, of communists next, in this Next country. speaker, please. There are no other speakers, Madam Chair. OK, seeing no other speakers, and um, none of my colleagues uh, want to say anything else. Um, item 18, we're taking them separately, right? OK, so item 18 is now before us, moved by Supervisor Solis. I'll second to approve that item. Executive Officer, please call the roll. Aye. Item 18 is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Horvath. Aye. Supervisor Horvath, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Madam Chair, yeah, Madam Chair, uh, yeah. there, there are individuals being harassing. Would you? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, uh, yeah there's a lot of disturbance going on right now. Uh, there should be no harassing of other people here. Everybody has a right to be here. Uh, Herman. Yeah, I, I think he's been disruptive he's, enough. He like, is being disruptive. He's had five warnings okay, and he's continuing we, to be disruptive. We're going to ask you to leave, Herman. Thank you. Yeah, really. We're tired of it. We're trying to conduct a meeting here and we don't need you yelling from the audience. So if it's possible, we'd ask you to leave. Okay, please, please remove him from the auditorium. Oh, time. No. We still have disruption in the in the room with the other individuals. Okay, we don't need any comments from the auditorium. We have already said there's no harassment tolerated. No, we're not. At, we may have to ask you to leave the auditorium too if you're going to keep talking from where you are. Uh, would you remove her from the auditorium, please? You're disruptive. Please remove her from the auditorium. Okay, now we're uh, hearing no other comments. We'll vote on item 21. Moved by Supervisor Solis. Uh, I will second it to approve this item. Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item 21 is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Abstain. Supervisor Mitchell abstains. Supervisor Horvath. Aye. Supervisor Horvath, aye. Supervisor Barger. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Motion carries four to zero with one abstention. Okay, now we'll move on to item 23. Uh, Los Angeles County's fiscal resilient, establishing a policy to prioritize fiscal motions during the budget process, uh, which was held by Supervisor Mitchell. And for members of the public on the telephone, please press one then zero now to comment on this item. Supervisor Mitchell. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Two weeks ago, I read in this motion during specials because I was concerned about the current economic factors that influence our budget. Today's budget presentation confirmed many of those concerns and provided more justification for us to prioritize our most important funding needs. I recognize that this motion will apply to fiscal motions that even that all of us, I included, have brought before this body that were approved but are still unfunded. It also applies to the ones that we all will bring for consideration in the future. Okay. I'm willing to make hard decisions yes, because, to, 
because doing so today and prioritizing how we spend our dollars will help us better lead tomorrow. It also will signal to investors, relevant financial institutions that rely on and track our fiscal solvency, and the public at large, the LA County is fiscally disciplined, focused, and responsible. I think we are all concerned that hard economic times are looming. During the March 2023 Federal Reserve meeting, economists predicted a, quote, mild recession starting later this year, with a recovery over the subsequent two years, end quote. And so government, like every other sector, must prepare for a recession. And to do so, uh, we make hard choices and prioritize. And it must be done with an equity lens, whereby we don't exacerbate the inequities prior members of government years ago, intentionally or unintentionally, imposed on many of our constituents whose voices were systematically silenced and whose representation was systematically non-existent. I think it's important that we consider the level at which we are imposing fiscal mandates in the county that we can't sustain or pay for. There's no worse policy outcome than to create a good program, create expectations of our employees and our constituents that we have to scale back or eliminate because we can't afford it in the long run. Fiscal discipline also means ensuring we spend our dollars effectively, and that happens when we measure the effectiveness of the dollars we invest in programs and services. As I said earlier, with regard to the budget that we heard today, I'd like data and outcome measures to be more prevalent features in our programs and services. Although I'm glad this motion will help to guide to provide guidance on outcome measures for future new programs and program expansions, I think it's just not enough. Let's start measuring the effectiveness of all of our programs so that we can make better decisions on supporting them. I think the use of data to inform programmatic decisions so they produce better outcomes for our residents and to do so optimally using county resources. With that, supervisors, I ask for your I vote. Thank you. Um, yes. You know what, I feel like I lost people on the queue. Uh, Supervisor Burke, yeah, or I, I mean, I. I Supervisor Mitchell, thank you for allowing me to be um, a co-author on this motion. You know, I think that based on the report today we got from our CEO about um, being uh, aware of the fiscal situation moving forward, this, this motion comes at a perfect time. Um, it really is about transparency, but also about planning long term. And to your point, you don't want to implement programs that are not sustainable, especially when we are looking at programs that are going to impact the most vulnerable in the county. And so I wholeheartedly um, support moving this forward. And I think it's something that is going to help us when we plan and prioritize and triage any of the programs that we're moving forward, recommending funding for us. So thank you. Thank you. Um, Supervisor Horvath. Thank you very much. As discussed earlier in our meeting, we know that our county will be facing budget constraints in the future. We will not be able to fully fund all department and board requests. For this reason, discussion and information about these requests will become more important in the future, allowing the board to properly prioritize funding needs. This item uh, focuses on supervisor-initiated items that are unfunded, which comprise less than 10% of our overall budget in speaking with our CEO's office. Our previous motion, unanimously approved by this board, which addressed governance, including budgeting, was all-encompassing and I think will help us get at the root of budgeting responsibly and comprehensively. Um, I believe um, if uh, my colleagues want review of these supervisor initiated items. I'm supportive of referring this to our executive office to include for consideration in that comprehensive process of review, uh, including our budgeting. But I don't want uh, this motion uh, directives to limit our previous direction, which I believe were more all encompassing. And so I would offer, um, I would ask my colleagues to maybe consider this in, in uh, the context of our overall budgeting direction, which this board has previously given. Is that a motion to move it to, to refer it to the executive office? Well, I think there's a motion before us. I'm, off, I'm offering if, they're, if they would consider referring this to the executive office for it to be included um, 
uh, you know, more comp in the more comprehensive review of our budgeting process that we all as a board directed. Why the executive office? They were responsible for that report back. It, it can go to whichever office you the gov this is the yes. This is the governance motion. Yes, the governance motion mm -hmm. was referred to, was uh, in the responsibility of the executive office. Mm -hmm. So if you prefer to go to CEO or somebody else, I'm open to that. But I know our governance motion lives in the executive office as of this moment. And so I think you, you would like to see this motion referred back somewhere. In the context of that mm -hmm. governance motion, yes. Uh, does the author of the motion um, accept that? My initial response is no, only because I don't fully understand. I, I appreciate the, the expansiveness and magnitude of the governance motion in terms of kind of reviewing governance. With regard to our budgeting process, which we're in the middle of, because we've just, and we know that the governance uh, was a report back and will take some time. Um, I, I wish we'd had this conversation because I hadn't given that any thought. Um, I'm going to say no because I'm concerned about timing. Um, Supervisor Barger brought a couple of uh, um, changes to the motion that really allowed us to begin to talk about looking at data collection and looking at the um, performance of past programs. Um, and, and we're clear that not all departments and programs are doing that kind of analysis. So I think that needs to start sooner rather than later. Um, and the governance motion is on a much slower train, I will say. Uh, I am concerned, based on the data that we heard today um, from the CEO, decisions that we have to make in real time by this fall with regard to this budget, um, I would just be concerned in, in moving this to the governance overall conversation. Now, it's not to say that in our governance conversation and deliberations, which will come later after the report backs come, that we couldn't then make some changes to how we do our budgeting process, but I'm not comfortable at this point um, holding it and con con combining it with the report back on that motion. Thank you. Um, Yes, Supervisor. I, just, I would just like to ask clarification from uh, Supervisor Horza. Are, are you, when you said your description of, of what uh, the impact would be, it would be on our discretionary funds, right? Initially, that the that the motion. Be My understanding of this motion. Happy to be corrected if I'm not getting it clearly, but it focuses on. Uh, Spe it specifically names the unfunded motions, which I believe are from um, the respective supervisor offices. And so um, in speaking with the CEO's office in advance of this meeting, I wanted to have an understanding of how much of the budget was projected to really be included. And um, my, un my understanding uh, is that it's less than 10% of our projected budget, um, as opposed to the overall governance motion, which we approved before, which would take into account the entire budgeting process. And I'm clear it would move on a, on a slower timeline. Maybe it wouldn't apply until next year's budget. But the, I, I think um, I was more comfortable with it being part of a, a, a comprehensive process. I, I tend to agree with that because I would, I mean, I, this is the first time hearing about that aspect of it. Mm -hmm, and of too. course, I'm going to be concerned about my discretionary money because I want to have control over that and my project. So I would second your motion. I don't think she made a it's motion. It's not discretionary funding. It's not discretionary. It's well, funding. It's, like no. if you bring in a motion, if I bring in a motion tomorrow saying, um, I want to build a mental health clinic in the Antelope Valley, FESIA, make it happen, and we don't have not identified the resources. Mm -hmm. That's kind of, I mean, that's over-exaggeration, but I think that's what the intent is. But we're doing that now. We do it now. Every single one of us up here has had projects, and we've done that. I, I haven't. Uh, I, I think Maybe what this, past, but yeah, uh, are you, go ahead, are you, well, I'm, I haven't. I'm in favor, I'm in favor of, okay. of having it reviewed, you know, and whatever the process so we look at all governance, because it's taking away potentially my voice, the way I see it, to a I, certain extent. So I'm just saying that it, it, that's where I'm coming from. I, I appreciate that. I think where I am too, Supervisor Mitchell, is uh, again, this is 
a pretty big different um, um, course correction uh, for this board. And I really don't know all the motions that this would cover. Does it cover discretionary? I'm concerned if we declare a state of homelessness, would it, would it cover that? So I, what I would like, and in the spirit of process, I, I would rather see this, um, and I might be more likely to, to vote in favor of it, if we could get a report back showing the motions that this um, initiative would cover, that would, uh, would say, if you move to spend NCC dollars outside of the budget process, it, you would have to wait uh, till the next budget phase to adhere to it. But I'm not sure, is it discretionary? What if there's an emergency? So would you be open to making this um, a report back, at least to hear, like I'd even like to see an analysis, what motions are we talking about that we've all done in the past year, which would have been covered by this? Um, and again, it might be good government, but I'm, um, you know, from since we saw this, I'm not clear on all the motions that it would cover. So, would you be willing to make this a report back so we could look at it before we take up the vote on whether this becomes the policy of this board? Let me provide some clarification first, because I think the use of the term discretionary funds perhaps has been misunderstood. Um, you're right, as we talk about. Um, the number of motions that have been put forward that are unfunded, the fact that we don't know, I'm not sure how that takes your power away because we've given our power, quite frankly, to the CEO to make the decision on what gets funded. We've already done that. So the point of the motion is for us as a body to make the decisions on how we prioritize what gets funded as opposed to look to the CEO to make the decision absent our direct engagement and involvement. We pass motions say go find the money, and then we're not directly involved. Now we pass budgets, we hear budgets, but it's my understanding that there are 30 plus motions that have been passed by this body that didn't identify a funding source, and we are not in charge of deciding which get funded. So the real point is forcing us, quite frankly, to prioritize and to develop the priority list and to to direct as opposed to just see what gets, gets funded and what doesn't. I am not interested in passing a motion and my constituents thinking it's the new law of the land and it's going to happen if that is indeed not the case. I think that's disingenuous. And so for us to continue to be in the driver's seat, um, to make sure that we are weighing in on what the priorities of the, of the residents of the, cal of, of, of the county should be entitled to. If the question is, to make it a report back and to hear from the CEO which motions would have been unfunded, would be impacted by this due process, I'm open to that. And let me just say um, that I think that in terms of how we do the prioritization, everyone seems to be a little afraid and I don't want to give up my stuff. The issue is we need to come up with that process together. Um, you know, conceptually, the CEO could provide reports quarterly to the board and receive and file agenda items that include a list of all motions with the budget impact that haven't been funded through the budget process along with their estimated costs to implement. That's what we were thinking of conceptually. Um, I am happy to have a report back to give you more data and so we are clear about what would be included and what is not and we are talking about NCC. I want to make sure that as right. we talk about discretionary, people aren't confusing that with discretionary funds that you have as a district. But those are NCC monies, but so correct? Su correct, Supervisor. So discretionary funds are NCC funding. Right. I think the question is the use of the word new. So every year the board gets, uh, as part of your equal budget allocation, you have discretionary funding, it's already allocated. The question is, I think, whether there is new funding that would be required. Um, so, but I think there's enough confusion, and I do appreciate it because I, I, and I, you know, it'll be it'll be a bit of work <laughs> for you, but to to even call out how that would have worked, because I, I think there is some concern, you know, after we put this budget to bed, 
you know, if there is a, a motion, especially if there's an emergency, to wait till the next budget phase to even consider it could be, so I mean, I just think, think there's, again, I'm not saying I'm opposed to it, I'm just would really, before I, I'd like to know what I'm voting on as, as a, a policy, because it's a pretty big policy. Absolutely. And um, I, I think it would be helpful to hear what motions fall under this and which, which don't. If I could just respond to some of the things that were said, and again, I've said if you want to um, have the report back, this would not impact discretionary funds, capital projects, or budget adjustments with an identified funding source. It's the motions where we say, go find the money that this would impact. It will be motions that impact NCC for which we don't have budgeted dollars. Emergencies will not qualify under this motion. Uh, Directive two is a report back from the CEO on unfunded motions starting right away in June. And directive one is the prioritization process that begins in February for 24, 25. Um, so th those are the two directives and the way in which we outline them. So if we only do the report backs, mm -hmm. um, we will have time to go back and talk about Directive 1 in a future motion since our, our goal is for it to impact 24, 25. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to be yeah. really clear mm -hmm. about what this motion currently doesn't cover just so people are you know, making their decisions based on what's in the motion. Mm -hmm. It would not impact discretionary funds where Capital where, projects where, where you read, where or you budget read? adjustments with an identified funding source. In my q and I'm not reading directly from the... Oh, okay. I'm, I'm reading from my Q&A. Oh, that's respond not... Respond Yeah, to. you're responding because you knew that that was a concern. So there was enough Im ambiguity, I think, in the motion for some of us to bring this up. So um, I, I um, would you make a substitute motion to get a report back or are we just going to... Or just add a directive that says have the CEO report back in 30 days. Um, it's 30 yeah, days, no. uh, will you be able to get us that? It's, it's a lot of information. It's, and you're working on the budget, huh? <laughs> ironically. Um, I tell you what, so why don't we just take a vote on this motion, and uh, then if it doesn't pass, we'll come back with another motion. Uh, let's just keep it clean, because all that, let's just keep it clean. Okay. Okay. Uh, are there members of the public that would like to speak on this item? Will the following individuals please come forward? Ace Anaya, Dr. Critical Truth Bay, Laura Colohan, Patricia McAllister, and Philip Kim. Moderator, may we have the first remote speaker, please? Our first speaker is Anthony Arenas. You may go ahead. Hi, my name is Anthony Arenas from District 3 and the Justice LA Coalition. And I want to thank Supervisor Mitchell for taking the lead on a motion that will create greater budget transparency for the County of Los Angeles, and especially in the face of budget austerity and budget cuts to vital care first programs that need resourcing for their implementation. And when the county is figuring out which motions will be funded and which ones need to be tabled through the fiscal review process, I really encourage the board to be bold and innovative and prioritize the funding of motions that reduce our reliance on the sheriff's department, on probation, on the district attorney's office, and instead ensuring the full funding of motions that invest in care for solutions, like fully funding CFCI, which is forecasted to be shortchanged this year, fully funding Youth Justice Reimagine, and fully funding the Office of Diversion and Reentry, just to name a few budget priorities. Sorry. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, next speaker, please. Eric Preppen, you may begin. Hey. Hello? Hello. Go ahead, Eric. Thank you. Yes, thank you, thank you. Um, well, I appreciate this conversation. I think the, uh, the idea that we're going to have a little more transparency on the individual personal supervisor slush funds is a great, a great step in the right direction. And I, I want to thank Supervisor Mitchell for that. I also know that um, you've got, you know, maximum transparency on all the requests that have been made is a good area. But if somebody wants to have like one day of poker where the supervisors hash it out in public, we should go this way and post all the details. 
if we want to just have it done quietly with the strong, even hand of time handled by the supervisors politely, you know, in the lounge on the way to Washington, then we could go that way. It's up to you. I think that either way, we have tremendous fiscal conservatives on this team. This is a group who is not uh, going to be, you know, intoxicated by their own spending. This is a group that is fiscally conservative. Thank you. So thank you. Next speaker, please. Madam Chair, there are no other speakers in queue to address the board. Okay, is there anybody in person? Nobody in person, Madam okay. Chair. Okay, uh, hearing no other comments, Executive Officer, please call the roll on item 23. Item 23 is before you, Supervisor Solis. No. Supervisor Solis, no. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Horvath. No. Supervisor Horvath, no. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Uh, it's not that I'm against transparency or fiscal prudence, uh, but I think you, just having your Q&As made me realize that I didn't have the A's to my Q's, and uh, I, I really would like more information on this, so at this point I'm going to have to vote no because I just don't know exactly what's in this motion. Thank you. Supervisor Hahn, no. Motion fails two to three. Should we take up the, are, are you still open to considering the report back? Okay, we, I don't think we can make a motion. We, we can't make it just a motion on the floor now, is correct? Okay. We can introduce it uh, at another time. Okay, let's go on to item 27, support for Assembly Bill 1620, our friend Rick Sabur's uh, motion, uh, bill, uh, apartment swaps for tenants with permanent mobility related physical disabilities, uh, which was held by you, Supervisor Horvath, and for members of the public on the telephone, please press one then zero now to comment on this item. Supervisor Horvath, would you like to make remarks? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm proud to bring forward this motion today in support of AB 1620 by Assemblymember Rick Zaber, um, which is a critical bill that will positively impact many residents, including a number of seniors and older adults. Throughout LA County, I've met countless older adults that are struggling to age in place for financial or physical reasons or both. I hope that this bill, when enacted, will provide relief to our seniors and older adults and others with mobility disabilities by allowing them to move from their existing upper floor rent stabilized apartments to first floor apartments which they can easily access while maintaining their current rent. For many residents, having a rent stabilized apartment with a fixed rental rate increase each year has allowed them peace of mind to stay in their home for decades. However, as many of these residents age, they may find it more and more difficult to access their apartments if they are not located on the ground floor. Without this legislation, many of those residents would be forced to leave their apartments for no fault of their own, except for aging or becoming disabled. This is not fair. We have not, uh, we should not have, uh, we should not treat our seniors this way. Um, we shouldn't treat our uh, disabled in this way. And we have seen countless cases uh, in communities throughout Los Angeles County of uh, older adults who become isolated, who are living alone, um, who don't have a supportive uh, services who cannot afford to li to move to a new unit um, at market rate um, and who are trying to safely age in place but live in fear of their ability to even leave their homes because of accessibility issues. Enacting this common sense legislation will not negatively impact landlords but will significantly benefit some of our most vulnerable residents, which is why I'm proud to support this legislation and ask our County Legislative Affairs Division to advocate for its passage. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Horvath. <clears throat> Supervisor Mitchell. Thank you very much. While the uh, uh, intent and integrity of the bill absolutely sounds admirable, it's my understanding that there has been uh, a, we have not had a local impact analysis done by our own ledge team, nor has there been an analysis done by the legislature at this point. And so I'll be abstaining just until I'm able to see an analysis to determine impact on LA County. Thank you, Supervisor Solis. Yes, thank you so much, Madam Chair. And I wanna thank Supervisor Horsbath for bringing the motion forward. When we talk about equitable strategies to reduce housing insecurity, we should not forget about people living with disabilities. 
Because the stressors impacting the vulnerable community, they can often find themselves falling into homelessness, which we know is heartbreaking. Studies, as we know, have shown that people with disabilities live in poverty at twice the rate of people without disabilities and are more likely to experience chronic homelessness. Fortunately, housing stabilization policies can help safeguard affordability and prevent displacement for individuals who suffer from disabilities. Accessible housing units are often limited in number and can be difficult to find, particularly in areas with high housing demands. By allowing individuals to move from an upper floor to a ground level, landlords would preserve much needed stability, social connections, and existing supports ultimately ensuring that they are not at greater risk of being unfairly evicted from their homes. For this universe of vulnerable populations, their home and the importance of not being displaced is key. Supporting this legislation will not only help prevent worsening our homelessness crisis, but also will afford people with disabilities the dignity and respect that they deserve. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, I just wanna also um, add my uh, support for this and thank our our friend Rick Saver for bringing this forward. But uh, it is such a, a mobility uh, for those with disabilities um, is so important. And to be on a higher level unit uh, when you're, you've lost uh, your mobility, it not only impacts, you know, just your everyday activities, but in the, in the event of an emergency, uh, paramedics have to come. Obviously, being on a ground floor is uh, much safer, uh, safer both, you know, for the first responders as it is for the person with the, with the mobility uh, disability. So the, the idea um, allowing them at the same uh, rate to, to move to a ground floor, I think, makes a lot of sense. So thank you for bringing that forward. Um, are there members of the public that uh, would like to speak on item 27? Will the following individual please come forward? Dr. Critical Truth Bay. Moderator, may we have the first remote speaker, please? We will go to our first uh, participant is Diego Rodriguez. You may begin. Good afternoon, Supervisor. My name is Diego Rodriguez and I am the CEO of Alma. We serve a significant number of physically disabled individuals experiencing housing insecurity. I would like to thank Supervisor Horvath for this motion. Allowing individuals with permanent mobility-related physical disabilities living in rent-stabilized units to move to ground floor units without rent increases or threats of eviction is critical for the following reasons. Ground floor units are more accessible, enabling disabled tenants to maintain their independence, enhancing their quality of life. In case of emergencies, navigating stairs can be challenging or impossible for those with mobility-related disabilities. Ground floor units also allow for quicker and safer evacuation. Providing accessible housing options to individuals with disabilities promotes their physical and mental well-being. They are less likely to experience isolation, depression due to inaccessible living environments. And lastly, ensuring that tenants with disabilities have access to appropriate housing accommodations is not only ethically important, but also a legal requirement under the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Fair Housing Act. I respectfully ask for unanimous support to ensure that these individuals can continue to live in affordable housing. Thank you, uh, thank you. your time is up. Thank you, stability. thank you for calling thank in. You. Next speaker, please. Michelle King, you may go ahead. Actually, I think I got skipped. I was calling on item 23. Oh, yeah, we've already uh, put that one um, to bed, so to speak. Um, you could call back during general public comment and we will hear your comment. So, sorry we skipped you. Okay, thank you. Okay, next speaker, please. Eric Preppen, you may begin. Thank you. Um, which one is this then? Just to refresh my memory. We're on 27, Eric. Support right. for Assembly so Bill 1620. It's, it's, it's Horvath's motion. Right, it's Horvath's motion. Yes. And I love it because it's about accessibility and nobody loves accessibility more than me. And I think, uh, you know, I have some experience with people who have a hard time moving up and down from the second floor. So this is a great, this is a great one uh, for accessibility. I think maybe we should ask county council who are always busy 
with disability lawsuits if they have any other ideas about what ways we can make it easier for the folks and you know not so easy for the folks who are building the structures that don't have access i know it's a it's an endless there's an endless supply of accessibility that we could provide but we have to find the right balance but this is absolutely a ground floor this is a no-brainer so once again good work and thank, thank you. you thank you eric next speaker please Hello. Madam Chair, Hello? there are no other speakers oh. in queue to address the board. Okay, anybody here in person? No? It's okay, so hearing no comments, colleagues, item 27 is now before us. Moved by Supervisor Horvath, seconded by Supervisor Solis. To approve this item, Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item 27 is before you. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Abstain. Supervisor Mitchell abstains. Supervisor Horvath. Aye. Supervisor Horvath, aye. Supervisor Barger, she's absent. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Motion carries four to zero. No, there was, a, oh, there I'm was sorry. no, that's not true. There's three with three. one abstention. I'm sorry. Three. three with one exception. That's correct. Sorry. Right. Okay. <laughs> Um, uh, item 29 is proclaiming April as Sexual Assault Awareness Month, and it was held by Supervisor Horvath. For members on the of the public on the telephone, please press 1, then 0 now to comment on this item, item 29. Supervisor Horvath. Thank oh. you. Yes, Supervisor Horvath. Yes. Thank and then you, Madam Chair, and thank you to Supervisor Solis for co-authoring this motion. And I know she invited me to co-author on our denim day, which I think is also another item right in this vein, which is why I'm wearing my denim jacket today. April is Sexual Assault Awareness Month. During this month, people across the United States raise awareness about sexual violence, how to prevent it, and how to support those who are affected by it, especially our courageous survivors. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, over half of women and almost one in three men have experienced sexual violence during their lifetimes. One in four women and about one in 26 men have experienced rape or attempted rape. Women and racial minority groups experience higher rates of sexual violence, and these numbers are even higher for people of color and members of the LGBTQ community. The theme of Sexual Assault Awareness Month 2023 is drawing connections, prevention demands equity. This year's campaign calls on all individuals, communities, organizations, and institutions to change ourselves and the systems surrounding us to build racial equity and respect. This is a time for advocates, survivors, their loved ones, and the community at large to come together to talk openly about sexual violence, to support survivors, increase knowledge and awareness, and identify strategies and resources to prevent sexual violence. There are a number of ways to get involved. Spread the word on social media using the hashtag SAAM2023. Change your Zoom background to a teal ribbon background to show your support. Participate in the hashtag 30 days of SAAM on Instagram, daily prompts that encourage creative ways for you to raise awareness, educate, and connect with others, and donate to your local rape crisis center or an organization that provides services to survivors in your area. You can go to nsvrc.org slash SAAM for more resources. In his proclamation on National Sexual Assault Awareness and Prevention Month 2023, President Biden proclaimed freedom from sexual assault is a basic human right. Sexual Assault Awareness Month is an important time to speak out, to stand with courageous survivors, and finally change the culture that has allowed sexual violence to exist for far too long. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Solis. Yes, thank you so much, Madam Chair. I want to thank Supervisor Horvath for allowing me to co-author the motion to proclaim April as Sexual Assault Awareness Month. 
I want to thank Supervisor Horvath for also co-authoring the related motion to proclaim April 26 as Denim Day with me. Earlier today, we had Patty Giggins in the audience who comes regularly every year to help us celebrate this. So I know she, she may be listening to us right now, but we want to thank her and her advocacy on, on behalf of all, of all of our women. Sexual assault is a serious public health issue that can affect anyone and continues to impact the lives of so many in our society. Sexual violence has been used to exercise power and control and to create fear. By recognizing this month as Sexual Assault Awareness Month, we emphasize our commitment to supporting survivors of sexual violence. We also acknowledge that in order to prevent sexual assault, we have to spread awareness and engage in open discussion about sexual violence. We stand together with sexual assault survivors and speak with one voice to say that we will not tolerate sexual violence in any form at any time. For the past 24 years, Peace Over Violence has run its Denim Day campaign on Wednesday, April, in honor of Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Wearing jeans on Denim Day has become a visible means to both support survivors and protest against the misconceptions around sexual violence. In further solidarity with sexual assault survivors and in honor of Sexual Assault Awareness Month, we encourage all LA County residents to wear denim on Wednesday, April the 26th. And I guess guys can wear them too. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, and thank you both for bringing this forward. It's, it's, it's an important um, uh, thing to realize, to um, make the awareness about this Sexual Assault Awareness Month. And uh, April 26th being Denim Day uh, is also very important. Um, you usually get asked questions about why you're wearing them and you can uh, talk about the original story of the rape victim um, in Italy. Now, we're supposed to be in Washington, D.C. on April 26th. Okay, I was going to say, because I think that's the day we were also, they were requesting us to meet in the White House uh, with the president, but I'll wear mine if you wear yours. Okay. Uh, that'll be, uh, well, you know, we'll just have to explain, tell the story. Are there members of the public that would like to weigh in on item 29, proclaiming April as Sexual Assault Awareness Month? Will the following individuals please come forward? Patricia McAllister and Shamir Grant. Moderator, may we have the first remote caller, please? Our first participant is Eric Preppen. You may begin. Thank you. Again, uh, hats off to Patty Giggins. Uh, of course, Peace Over Violence and Denim Day, but also to the entire category, which is we need to do a lot of work across society uh, in kind of reporting and not enabling. I wrote an article called The Enabler in Chief because I was concerned that Mayor Garcetti got away with the problem in his office that he really should have known about. And I know uh, Dolores Huerta would agree with me on that and many of the activists across America. But, you know, for the purposes of this one, um, I think that the more we can do to recognize and protect people who are exposed to this kind of activity, uh, the better. And we should just remember uh, an equity lens for this because though it's very popular to imagine that men are always beating up on women, there are scenarios, believe it or not, especially with annoying men, and I speak from experience Thank you. on this. Thank you, Eric. Beating up on the Thanks. Welcome. Next speaker, please. Next, we will go to Roy Humphreys. You may begin. Especially poignant uh, when it's not acknowledged by the, our supervisor, I think it was Ms. Arbass, about the $3 billion for the assaults out there in the juvenile facilities. Isn't that that could be being sued on uh, for that particular situation. And then culturally, and there's a, a major article by major psychologists so forth, about how we've accepted in our society that in the prisons and our jails and our lots of, uh, to be sexually assaulted is uh, an acceptable uh, issue here. And, and uh, just the absurdity of this whole thing, it, it's just obnoxious and disingenuous. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Are we going here? Okay. Patricia McAllister, I agree with this. We need this. I think we also need a Sexual Assault Awareness Month for children, uh, since pedophilia now is being um, something that America 
we're not used to this. Grooming children is a form of sexual assault. And it's also physical and psychological. Okay, children, can you imagine? I know when I was a child, like especially a teenager, I'm always in the mirror looking at this and that. Can you imagine a little girl having her breast cut off at seven years old and a boy having his penis cut off at, say, eight? And once they become adults, there's going to be a lot of psychological problems here. I mean, they were just babies when it happened. So uh, I've looked at the statistics. The, the suicide rate for homosexuals has always been very high. In the US, I don't know, I think in Europe too. So you can imagine if adults can't handle being that way, what will children turn out to be? So we're going to have a lot of problems in this country if this continues. So I'm just waiting for President Trump to get back in office because he said he will pass some laws against Our this. Next speaker, please. There are no other speakers, Madam Chair. Okay, seeing no other comments, or I mean, hearing no other comments, <clears throat> item 29 is now before us, moved by Supervisor Horvath, seconded by Supervisor Solis to approve this item. Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item 29 is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Horvath. Aye. Supervisor Horvath, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Okay, we'll now move on to item 50, report on the county's stormwater infrastructure, which was held by Supervisor Horvath. For members of the public on the telephone, please press one, then zero now to comment on this item, item 50. And we have um, Mark Pastrella, our Director of Public Works. I also have on here Mickey S. Esposita, our assistant director, Keith Liley, deputy director, um, are here, but looks like it's just you. So you'll be available for comments. Supervisor Horvath, would you like to make some remarks? Thank you. This is a, a follow-up on a previous report, and I thank you for being present to share the information. I know each of our districts are full of people who are interested in knowing more about how we are investing in our stormwater infrastructure, what our plans are, and um, especially in light of the recent uh, storms, what we're doing to make sure that we are capturing every opportunity to fight drought and care for our sustainable future as it relates to water. Um, I just had a couple of questions uh, in follow-up to this report. Um, I understand during the course of this winter, uh, we received twice the normal amount of rainfall after experiencing three years of drought, which is considered our new normal or weather climate whiplash. Unfortunately, we did not experience any major storm damage. Fortunately, we did not experience any major storm damage to our county public works infrastructure. However, if this pattern continues, how can we ensure that uh, we'll be able to protect our communities and what additional steps uh, is your department planning to take? Thank you, Supervisor Horvath, uh, for the opportunity to address the board on this issue. The good news, as you said this year, is that the um, system that the supervisors have been funding for over 100 years performed out in an outstanding manner. And that's because of the hard work of the staff at Public Works, uh, both our crews who have been working 12-hour you know, shifts, 24 hours a day um, for the last three months to maintain and clear the debris and other things that keep us from being able to actually capture stormwater and pass it safely through our communities. Um, in fact, we captured enough water so far for two and a half million people for a year. This is a significant down payment on, the, on drought busting, as you said. The other part of that, of course, the other part of the equation is flood fighting. And every year, um, the Board of Supervisors have supported the budget of the Flood Control District to continue to maintain that system. The system is, if it is being impacted by climate in an, in an interesting way. And to get to it very quickly, because I know you've had a long day, we've had a lot of sediment, increased sediment in the system due to fires, to the drying of the system, fires, and then that debris making its way into the system. In fact, during this, over this entire storm season, We've, we've received almost 15 million cubic yards into the reservoirs that are the main backbone system that provides flood protection for most of LA County or at least the greater Los Angeles basin. In fact, those, those reservoirs are what provide the benefits for our lower reaches of LA County where we have typically ponding that occurs if we're gonna have funding. What we're going to be investing in and focused on in this um, going forward, and we are always focused on it, is clearing the reservoirs and recapturing the capacity that we've lost over this season. In fact, we're seeking, um, we're seeking uh, money from the recent declarations. Um, we're looking to the federal government for aid with that. 
and we're of course tapping into our regular um, assessments that we make um, on an annual basis to provide the money that would um, be necessary to, to make that investment. Are we okay? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, the other, being an emergency management person, I got to I know, I know. Like, um, where's, so. where's Kevin McGowan? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, the other thing that we were, I'm proposing, supervisors, is that we make a down payment on make our communities more situationally aware about their flood condition or their hydrology in their neighborhood. And this is a service of the flood control district because we do maintain the science and technology and shop and working with our academic partners to know more and more about what's going on with our hydrology, the way water flows, how much flows, and how it impacts our, our daily lives. So what we're proposed to do is partner with the federal agency, FEMA, as well as Cal OES, and our local agencies and cities to gather those folks and actually um, educate the public and at, all the way down the neighborhood level, not only in the unincorporated area, but across the cities in Los Angeles County in preparing them for a flood future, a new flood future that includes the impacts of climate change. And uh, a specific project in our district, the Sun Valley Watershed Multi-Benefit Project, um, which is currently under construction, is a considered an approach to mig mitigating flood risk. Can you talk a little bit about this project and um, perhaps what lessons can be learned as, sure. as it applies countywide? Sure, thank you for bringing the project up. It's, it's an iconic project brought to the County of Los Angeles many years ago under the philosophy of watershed management and utilizing green infrastructure as well as gray infrastructure to treat for and actually capture stormwater all the way down to the property level. Well, there's 22 or 20 projects total in this um, area, the Pacoima area in Sun Valley, um, that would change the way that we drain and is changing the way that we drain the community and capture their water. We're using green infrastructure like opening up parks and putting cisterns underground. And currently we have a very special project that's coming um, forward, it's, as you said, it's under construction, um, in which um, we are, uh, the Rory Shar project, which we are looking to actually expand upon our storage by taking what used to be an inert landfill and turning it into a pond, a park-like feature, and then capturing that water on an annual basis so that we can drain it and move it into the groundwater as we do in our other spreading grounds. It's, a, it's an excellent example of the way that we operate these days in, the, in, this, in this century or this, this decade and, and for the future, looking at our water as a resource and not as a waste. Yeah, we heard a lot from that part of the district um, uh, in the recent rain, so I'm glad to know there are even more projects underway to mm -hmm. address what they were seeing on the ground, because um, I know that there is great concern. My last question really has to do with budget, and I sort of mentioned earlier, and I know the CEO addressed how we are investing in our infrastructure, and I want I, I know that you're continuing to engage our federal government in trying to leverage federal dollars, so if you could talk a little bit about um, how our recent climate impacts have affected your budget and what we're doing sure. with our budget and your department's budget to attract more dollars into the building of infrastructure. So I think this stuff tells nice with item seven today, looking at resiliency in our infrastructure. You probably heard that we um, are looking at what we should be attacking first. It's actually a prioritization. There definitely isn't enough money in anyone's budget these days to improve everything we think needs to be done. Um, so that process of prioritizing, looking at vulner under, based on vulnerability, equity, um, uh, we will be coming back to the board with those priorities. Currently, the flood control district's current priority, as I said previously, is to get the sediment out of that system because that has a system-wide benefit. And actually, what's interesting is it's benefiting the most vulnerable in our um, community that um, are affected by flooding. And that tag on that dollar amount, which gives me the opportunity to tell you, is something like $500 million um, over a five-year period. In our report, we actually list um, a whole page and a half of um, agencies that we're looking to partner with, both federal and state and local agencies, and um, opportunities that we've, uh, we've identified as um, potential sources for grant funding for um, the purposes of the flood control district purposes, including water conservation and flood protection. But it is important for me to mention to the board that um, I have been looking for some time under my responsibility as a as the steward of these funds um, at the potential for um, borrowing money under a general obligation bond, um, which the flood control district is actually debt free at this point, um, paid off our last bond, I think it was in um, 2017. The district's um, bond rating is excellent, um, as good as, or maybe even better than the county's. 
And um, actually, frankly, it, it's important that we do secure some debt and move forward. What that would do is pay, um, pay for capital improvements that we currently um, have on the books that you would be looking at and improving and prioritizing. That's a go forward. And then it's important for me to also mention that at some point in the future, it would be important for the board to cons consider increasing the fees for, flood for the flood control district's efforts um, in the future. Probably two to three years out, we'd be coming back to the board with some kind of um, proposal to the board for the board to consider after a lot of outreach with the community about what this is something that they would want to pay for. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Supervisor Solis, do you, no, Supervisor Mitchell, are you guys not on this one? Oh, Supervisor Mitchell. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, I appreciate it. I had a recent conversation with um, Insurance Commissioner Ricardo Lara, um, who talked about his affiliation with the National Association of Insurance Commissioners and how they're looking at um, you know, various products to help protect uh, hardly reached underrepresented communities who um, in some instances across the country and here in LA County are more vulnerable and success, susceptible to flood as a result of climate change. So I'm wondering what um, we're doing um, to engage and provide resources and strategies to some of our perhaps newer vulnerable communities to flood risk. Well, it's an excellent question, Supervisor. Thank you. Now, first, as background, the County of Los Angeles, along with the other 87 cities or 88 cities in the County of Los Angeles, are all members of the National Flood Insurance Program. And that program seeks to provide affordable um, insurance, lowering the liability for the federal government when these major events happen, but also securing property owners' um, property and insuring property against such hazards. Now, I'm proud to report to the board that the County of Los Angeles flood management agency within LA County Public Works representing the county unincorporated area has some of the lowest act, not the lowest flood insurance rates in the, in the county of Los Angeles. Could you give me, I'm curious, having owned a home in a flood zone and had been you know, required to buy flood insurance to, 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 to get a mortgage, it, it was by no means what I would consider affordable. Hmm, so when okay. you say yeah. those products are affordable, give me a, a general idea. Right? Yeah, so the FEMA products can range from, you know, based on where the location of the property is, the risk assessment of it. Um, you're looking, some people are paying as little as $60 a year for flood insurance. Uh -huh. Other people are paying as much as $100 a month for flood insurance. So most definitely it matters where you're living and how, what the risk is within your area. You may remember the debate at the federal debate regarding whether or not we should expand the flood zone areas beyond this 100 year event. One of the things that concerns me, Supervisor, is when we make it mandatory that we have flood insurance, mm -hmm. that whether that's even affordable for residents, um, vulnerable residents, right. Um, that we know about that can't that, that choose not to pay couldn't pay or afford to pay mm -hmm. um, ten dollars a month for that right, matter. Right. So one of the things that's been a complaint about an NFIP is that it hasn't been affordable through the years. Mm -hmm. What we've been doing is to stay as good partners in um, that program and get it as, as affordable as possible. But the word affordable is most definitely, mm -hmm. uh, by definition, uh, okay. you know, variable dependent upon where you live. Mm -hmm. um, so for instance, I don't know how many of you have earthquake insurance. But I have never had earthquake insurance. Oops. Don't tell anyone. My God. Because the premium is so high. Mm -hmm. The flood insurance, why flood insurance is an important consideration for people is if they are in a zone that is, that is likely to flood. And so we do a lot of work on is what is the probability of the house being, um, being flooded. Um, if it's very low probability, having a homeowner understand that risk and make a risk decision. And that's what I'd like to do is inform community members on the risk they currently have and what potential risk is uh, increasing or not. For instance, if it's gonna flood six inches around the home, there just isn't any reason to buy flood insurance, but it is available mm -hmm. and could be unaffordable. <laughs> so, and, 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 and so I guess my question is, the, the analysis that you do to determine the level of risk is, is being adjusted or keeping current with our new normal. That's in terms of the yes. change in yes. climate. So, so I'm really happy to report that FEMA has done a much better job in their analysis um, of flooding across the United States. There are actually programs, Risk, risk 2.0, they call it as a mapping program that anyone can go on. And if you look in a report, you can see a referral to the website to see even at your address what it would cost you for flood insurance. 
Um, of course, uh, the federal government has high interest in people having flood insurance, but that's not necessarily what you want to do. So what I think is important, and one of the pleasures of my job is able to share our knowledge about that risk in an open way without scaring people, but just being factual about what we know. And I think this is industry-wide, one of the problems for civil engineers in general is we haven't done a good job of actually communicating the risk in a calm, understandable way so that people can make a choice how best to protect themselves. And this is something I'm proud to say that our department has the capacity to do, and we just need to turn around and do that with our federal and state partners. So that's my proposal, um, letting people make a choice for themselves, making them aware of their hydrology, so to speak, and then um, being proud of the system that we do maintain, by the way, the backbone system, that uh, our flood control system, the LA River, for instance, has had huge investments in it and, it, and we are heavily reliant in the basin to keep us flood free. And again, over the last you know, 30 years, we've had no loss of life, no major property damage, and it's because we've been maintaining and operating such a you know, really world-class flood control system here in Los Angeles County. Because it isn't like it doesn't rain when it rains. I mean, it seriously rains here. So um, the changes to climate are something of interest that to all of us, you've probably been seeing some academic reports out about um, what people expect um, could happen in LA County. I want you to know that our staff engineers are all over that, looking at it, working with local academia as well as UCI, U USC, UCLA, Cal Poly Pomona, Cal State um, LA, um, coordinating and thinking about um, and really getting paid to um, know, you know what, right down to the lot level, what is my risk? And this, but this is again something we as an industry haven't been that good at is actually putting it out there and saying this is the true risk that we expect to be coming. Thank you. Uh, are there any other members like to comment on this? Okay. Um, executive officers, please call the member of the public who have signed up to speak on this item. Madam Chair, there are no in person speakers signed up for this item. Okay. No one on the phone either? Moderator, may we have the first remote caller, please? Madam Chair, there are no other speakers in queue to address the board. Okay, this report will be received and filed. Hearing no objections, that will be the order. Now we're on to 78E, uh, supporting efforts to widen Medicaid and Affordable Care Act health coverage to deferred action for childhood arrival recipients, which was held by Supervisor Solis. And for members of the public on the telephone, please press one then zero now to comment on this item. Supervisor Solis, would you yes. like to make some remarks? Yes, thank you so much, Madam Chair, for that introduction and for co-authoring this motion along with me. Colleagues, last week I was thrilled to see President Biden's announcement that the Department of Health and Human Services will soon propose a rule that would allow DACA recipients to be eligible for Medicaid oh. and the Affordable Care Act health care plans. DACA recipients, oh, so or dreamers as they are known, okay. embody the value of our nation through their work ethic, optimism, and dedication to this country. They are our neighbors, our co-workers, our lawyers, our engineers, and many were essential workers serving on the front lines during the pandemic. Dreamers are American in every way except on paper. Just this past weekend, I met two dreamers. One is a lawyer who finished top of her law school class and is now working to ensure justice for injury victims. The other leads a Latino advocacy organization here in California. Their commitment to service and improving their communities is what gives this nation the strength that it deserves. Unfortunately, DACA recipients have lived with uncertainty for many years as court rulings and administrative actions under the last administration have altered the provisions of their legal protections. This uncertainty is unconscionable. It's critical that we show dreamers that we stand with them and that we fight to preserve and expand their rights. I'm grateful that the board has long supported our DACA recipients as we did back in 2021 when we approved my motion to support the president's rule to preserve and support the DACA policy. And with the continued absence of meaningful action from Congress, I applaud President Biden for his leadership on the issue and for committing his support to our dreamers. Extending health care benefits to DACA recipients is not only humane, it's the right thing to do, but it also is common sense. If this proposed rule were to go through, over 600,000 DACA recipients and their U.S. citizen children would be able to secure health insurance through the ACA or Medicaid. Fortunately, in California, thanks to the leadership of Governor Gavin Newsom, all residents aged 55 or above already are eligible for Medicaid regardless of their documentation status. 
and the goal is to expand this to all income eligible adults by 2024. But for those who no longer <clears throat> are income eligible for Medicaid but would otherwise struggle to afford a health insurance plan on the private marketplace, this proposed rule would provide them with access to subsidies through the ACA, allowing them to purchase a quality health insurance plan. I recognize at this point a proposed rule will be subject to a robust public debate and feedback process. And it's imperative that Los Angeles County, given the rich diversity of our residents, provide meaningful input on the immigration rulemaking process. That's why this motion instructs County Council to work with our CEO, DHS, DPSS, and our Office of Immigrant Affairs to submit official public comment in support of the proposed rule immediately upon its release and to send official letters to support President Biden and Secretary of Health and Human Services, Becerra. Colleagues, I know we all value our DACA residents in each and every one of our districts, and I ask that you stand with them today and vote yes on the motion. Again, I'd like to recognize our co-chair, Madam Janice Hahn. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Supervisor Solis, for asking me to co-author this motion with you. It gives me great pleasure to know that uh, the Biden-Harris administration is demonstrating their commitment to provide the dreamers the opportunities and the support that they need to succeed. Every day counts, and luckily this new rule will make DACA recipients eligible for Medicaid and the Affordable Care Act coverage for the very first time. And as you've said so clearly, our um, DACA recipients contribute greatly um, to this country and to this county of Los Angeles. And they, as you said, they are American in every way, uh, except on paper. Uh, my own uh, staff member, Carlos Ariela Carr, uh, who's my board operations deputy, who's down here on the floor with us all the time. When he joined uh, our district team, he was a DACA recipient and his work has helped so much in the services that we provide all our residents. Um, he's my key person on budget deliberations um, now, and he's been such an invaluable member of our team, and again, uh, providing services to, to the residents of LA County. This motion will continue to demonstrate LA County's stance towards being as accessible and welcoming as possible to all our residents. Um, now I'd like to um, call on Supervisor Mitchell. I think that's a holdover, but I absolutely support the motion. Well, there you go. You took, you took the moment. You met the moment. Uh, okay. Are there members of the public who would like to speak on item 78E? Will the following individuals please come forward? Alex Sinamorado and Oso Bear. Moderator, may we have the first remote caller, please? Our first participant is Diego Rodriguez. You may begin again, supervisors, I would like to speak in strong support of item 78E. Uh, Diego Rodriguez, CEO of Alma. I would like to thank Supervisor Solis and Hunt for this motion. Studies have shown high DACA recipients often come from low-income households and are at a higher risk of facing health disparities. Research has also shown that access to health care can lead to better outcomes, including reduced poverty rates. By extending health coverage to DACA recipients, communities as a whole can reap economic benefits from a healthier and more productive workforce. From a public health perspective, ensuring that DACA recipients have access to care can contribute to the overall wellness of communities by fostering healthier living conditions. Furthermore, access to health care enables individuals to seek preventive care, which can lead to early detection and treatment of illnesses, ultimately reducing the cost for health care systems in the long run. This action will ensure that over 600,000 DACA recipients and their U.S. citizen children benefit from health insurance through the ACA or Medicaid. I strongly advocate for unanimous support thank for you. this action. Uh, thank you. That's thank your you. time is up. Next speaker, please. Uh, Madam Chair, there are no other speakers in queue to address the board. Okay, we'll go in person. Welcome. Hi, my name is Alex Namorado. I represent the um, District 4, where Janice Han, city of Karehe. Been living there for over 30 years. I was born in Guatemala, but I just wanted to, I am in support 
of 78E. I just wanted to also address the comments of someone that said earlier that we are illegal aliens. There's no such thing as an illegal alien on stolen land. Um, another thing, a lot of people wonder why we had to um, come to this country. For example, I'm from Guatemala. In 1954, the U.S. intervened and overthrew Guatemala's um, government. And we had a good president, and he was overthrown. And that caused the quote-unquote immigration crisis. So uh, a lot of people that speak on illegal aliens also do not know their history, knowing that the majority of Guatemalans and the majority of Mexicans are actually indigenous to this continent. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next speaker, please. Well, most importantly, I want to thank God for being here, giving me another day of life. Uh, I, I do support 78E. Uh, I'm struggling right now. I did have a work permit. Um, unfortunately, it was my fault. I, I was a procrastinator. I let that expire. But I'm here trying to uplift myself. I'm trying to uh, build something from the ground up. And it would it would impact the whole community. Anybody that that's struggling with with DACA, they wanna they wanna do something great. Sometimes they're they're timid. But we're here. We're here to to work. We're here to since I was a little kid, I said I wanted to be in the work community, and here I am. I'm, I'm trying to work. I'm trying to do my things right, but there's there's discouragement, and and I understand that we're not born here, but we still want to work. We still want to we want to build opportunities, and overall, we just we just want to be here, uh, like safe, not unprotected. If you guys can help us with that, thank you. Thank you for coming and speaking. And um, are there other speakers? No other speakers. Okay, and no more on the phone. Uh, Ms. Mitchell. Thank you very much. I just um, think it's really important in our communication that we craft um, that we, you know, call on our colleagues, quite frankly, in other border states who've never expanded Medicaid. Here in California, uh, Medi-Cal covers DACA. California's done our part. So I hope in our communication we call on our um, elected colleagues in those other states that have fallen woefully short up to now and encourage them to make sure that they take advantage of this opportunity being afforded to them, the federal government. You know, sometimes the federal government makes programs available and it's up to states to choose the option. So I hope in our communication, we encourage those states to choose the option so DACA recipients in those states have the benefit of the DACA recipients in California. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, I would just add that I know that there is a movement nationally to do that. And there are many dreamers across this country that are right now organizing and have been in front of the Supreme Court, in front of the Congress, and, they, and voices that we heard here today are, are exemplary and they need to be also promoted. So thank you for coming out here today and spending your, your whole day with us. If you need any assistance, we do have an Office of yes, Immigrant Affairs I was gonna say that, that yeah. we have created and they can provide assistance, referral, and if you're eligible, possibly even for defense. But our office, somebody here can refer yeah. you in the back if you're interested. Okay, con mucho gusto. Thank you. Yes, make sure because we do have a, we have an entire office dedicated to support um, and helping our immigrant community. And if you wanna just go in the back there and talk to somebody, we can um, get you connected. Okay, um, seeing no other, no other uh, comments, item 78E is now before us. Uh, moved by Supervisor Solis. I will second to approve this item. Executive Officer, please call the roll. 78E is before you. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Horvath. Aye. Supervisor Horvath, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Okay, now we're gonna move to item 1D, uh, approved funding for five projects recommended through notice of funding availability round 28, which was held by Supervisor Barger. And for members of the public on the telephone, please press one then zero now to comment on this item, item 1D. Uh, Supervisor Barger. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm introducing the amended motion today because I have heard some major concerns from one of um, my community residents regarding the transparency of the NOFA award for the 740 East Foothill Boulevard property. In order to allow more time to properly engage uh, in, in discussions with the community members, the adjacent city partners and the developer, I'd like to delay the award of the NOFA funds for this particular development only and have it scheduled to come back on, I wanted a date certain for it to come back, and that would be on uh, May 16th. To that end, 
I have a friendly amendment for this item which uh, my staff has circulated uh, that will remove the project of 740 East Foothill Boulevard from today's board motion. I really do believe, and I've said this, transparency and community and get education are critical elements that I believe in. And in this case of this by right development, I want to facilitate more open discussion with all parties involved. Um, I will bring this back before the board, as I said, on May 16th. Um, once the discussions have taken place, I don't want it to be an open-ended continuance. I want to give them an opportunity to weigh in. They did not know it was on the agenda today. So with that, um, I would ask for your approval. Okay. Uh, Supervisor Solis, did you want to comment on this? Okay. I'm supportive. Yeah. Um, are there any other supervisors that would like to make uh, remarks? Okay. Um, are there members of the public that would like to speak on item 1D? Will the following individuals who signed up for 1D please come forward? Donald Harlan and Mike Greenspan. Moderator, may we have the first remote speaker, please? Our, our first participant is Danita Bauket Champ. You may go ahead. Board of Supervisors, um, I ask that you table this issue until the local cities that are involved for this project, City of Laverne and City of San Dimas, have more time to uh, discuss w amongst their own cities as it would uh, affect both cities directly. Um, as Catherine, uh, um, Supervisor Barger knows, uh, City of Laverne is a very involved city. Um, when the juvenile camps um, for Afrobot Page was um, on your agenda, uh, our, nearly our entire city was involved in some way, shape, or form, whether written or verbal or making phone calls or um, during that time of COVID, they would uh, participate on the phone calls. So I really wish that there could be more time so that more details can be provided to the residents that are going to be adjacent to this project. I think that um, the lack of communication in such a short period of time, um, you know, won't sit well with the residents. Oh, we've always had good communication with Catherine Barger's office and now uh, Hilda Solis in the Southern Port of Laverne. And so I ask that this uh, item be postponed so that more residents who are truly, who care about the city and, oh, thank and you. want to participate. Um, thank you very much. Your time details. has expired. Thank Next you. speaker, please. Uh, Madam Chair, there are no other speakers in queue to address the board. Okay, we'll go here in person. Welcome. Hi. Hi, I'm Donald Harlan. I'm speaking on agenda item number 1D, special district agenda. This is for the funding for five projects from the uh, LA County Development Authority. Uh, yeah, you guys don't need more money to develop more illegal real estate. Just about every project funded using this funding was an illegal real estate development. Uh, LA County De Development Authority has their names over on all kinds of illegal developments. Um, it says there's five apartment projects. I didn't look at each individual one. I don't know exactly, but I have a pretty strong feeling that there's no succession of ownership for that real estate. You can't prove the ownership. It says another $27 million for illegal real estate. Thank you. Next Anybody speaker, stop? please. There are no other speakers, Madam Chair. Okay. He, see no, hearing no other comments. Item 1D is, as amended, is before us. Moved by um, Supervisor Barger, uh, seconded by Supervisor Solis. Approve this to approve this art, uh, item. Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item 1D is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor as amended. Aye. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Horvath. Aye. Supervisor Horvath. Aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Motion carries five to zero. Okay, at this time, it would be appropriate to hear from supervisors on items not posted on the agenda, but I don't believe we have any specials today. So now we will hear from members of the public wishing to address this board on all the remaining items not held by supervisors and general public comment. For members of the public on the telephone, please press one then zero now to comment on these items. How many items are there? 
Okay. Um, you must indicate the agenda item numbers that you wish to address, including general public comment, in order for us to allocate the appropriate amount of time. Executive officer, please call those members of the public who have signed up to speak on the remaining items and general public comment. Members of the public, you will have up to three minutes to address the board on all remaining items and general public comment. You will have one minute for one item, two minutes for two or more items, and one additional minute for general public comment. Please state your name and clearly indicate the agenda items you will be addressing. You may only address the board on these items. We will now call in-person speakers, and while they are coming forward, we will take telephonic speakers. Okay, first speaker, please. The following individuals, please come forward. Osvaldo Montes, Ryan, Alex Inamorado, Donald Harlan, A. Sanaya, Alika Valdez, Eden Inamorado, Matt Geller, Byron Jose, Loretta Lorraine, Anthony Simpkins, Baron Jose, Samuel Monroe Jr., Matt Inoye, Dr. Critical Truth Bay, Freedom Washington, Teresa Mathenia, Talaba Coffey, Thomas Bell, Fuan Paula, Teresa Soria, Crystal Booker, Freddie DeGreat, Shamir Grant, Lauren Natoli, Jaime, Jaime Alvarez, Dwight Thompson, D. Banks, Eden Alex, Jessina Williams, Melissa Waters, Philip Kim, Laura Colohan, Mike Greenspan, Patricia McAllister, Antigone Robinson, Lauren Natoli, Jaime Alvarez, and Loretta Lorraine. Moderating, moderator, may we have the first remote speaker, please? Thank you. Our first participant is Cassandra Aranda. Please state the item numbers you are addressing today and whether you will address on general public comment. You may begin. Go ahead. All right, good afternoon, board members. I am Cassandra Bonda, a District 2 resident and director of On Our Feet Collective. I am here to address an urgent issue affecting vulnerable tenants in incorporated cities here in LA County. It has been over six months since the board voted to host the Tenants' Rights Summit to provide support for the implementation of permanent protections for tenants, and yet we have seen no progress. You must hold yourselves accountable for this failure to act. We also urge the board to support a codified right to counsel for tenants facing eviction. Every tenant deserves a legal representation in these proceedings, and it's crucial that the board prioritizes sustained funding for this tenant protection during budget discussions. Moreover, the city of Los Angeles has already passed this um, right to counsel ordinance and it's time for this county to follow suit. As women leaders, you should be implementing and celebrating these wins for tenants and not letting them expire while we wait for the other shoe to drop. We urge you to take action and provide real sustainable solutions for tenants in LA County. You need to hold yourselves accountable and make sure that vulnerable tenants receive the protections they deserve. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Diana Beard Williams, please state the item numbers you are addressing today and whether you'll address on public comment. You may begin. So I'm speaking about 1920 and public comments. Um, in the spirit in which 19 and 20 are put forward. I would like to say to this board that again, I am in the Antelope Valley and have been here for 30 plus years. I have come to you before about the quality of health care in this valley provided by Kaiser Permanente. And to this date, I have not had any kind of serious conversations with the supervisor of the fifth district or her staff. It seems to me that if we are talking about a public health issue and I have information and evidence I would like to present to the board that yes, I'm happy to help any immigrant, I'm happy to help any tenant, I'm happy to help anyone, but the Antelope Valley continues to be ignored, not taking seriously, Barger, and something needs to be done. We are circulating a petition to ask this board to please hear our issue about health care since our supervisor does not seem to be as concerned about it as I am who lost a husband because of negligence. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Madam Chair, there are no other speakers in queue to address the board. 
Do we have someone in person? Hi, my name is Osvaldo Montes. Um, I'm here to speak about the 78E. So the 78E, as I left off, um, I had a work permit. I'm trying to build something from the ground up. Uh, last, last week, you guys were uh, having a meeting of the CPC. Overall, it was the vendors. So I was informed about the vendors. Um, I'm affected a, in a big way because I'm a vendor myself. I street vend, I sell mole. So as I said, I was, I'm trying to uplift uh, a, real, a real business. I'm really trying to esc um, elevate it to, to a business perspective. I want to do legit business things. I want to do charities with that mole. So in the end of the, in the future, I, I want to, I want to give back and I want to multiply my earnings and I want to just build opportunities. So now that you guys were able to let me uh, get some help for the 78E, thank you guys. I would just appreciate you guys if you help the street vendors, make a budget for the street vendors, make advertisements or do great things besides just pushing the, uh, the street vendors. We want to do greater things, not just thank not you. just get paid. Thank, thank you very you. much. Next speaker, please. Madam Chair, he can talk to my staff right here. Okay. Please give you information on what we're doing. Great. Please talk to uh, Supervisor Solis's staff. They'll try to help. Okay, next speaker, please. Alex Enamorado, and I'm speaking on public comment and also 78F, if I'm not mistaken. So if I could get two minutes, please. Okay, so as we know, Senate Bill 972 passed last year, but I'm a street vendor advocate for street vendors here across the county and across the nation. As we see every weekend, we see street vendors getting their food dumped by the Department of Public Health. The Department of Public Health shows up with their employees, not willing to educate the vendors without any communication, wearing political attire, dumping their food and throwing away with no questions asked and very aggressively. These vendors have gone through enough. We are still under a post-pandemic or under a pandemic, and a lot of these vendors used to have brick and mortars, and now they're fending on the streets and they're trying to make a living. Now, um, in Senate Bill 972, Miko was not involved, and this is the micro enterprise home kitchen operation. So Riverside County has it. Why don't we have it? Why doesn't LA County have it? If we're trusting these vendors to feed their children from their kitchen, why can't we trust them to feed and make a living? So please implement micro enterprise home kitchen into code. For example, if you're in a lotero and you're selling corn, you have to have an industrial kitchen or a commissary. They're very, very expensive. Um, DPH is on board. We had a meeting with uh, Mr. Dragan and he's on board with this as well. Uh, Riverside County, like I said, is on board. And also the grants that we're giving out if you don't have a social security number, none of the vendors from Alpine Village qualified. No one, absolutely no one. You have to have a social security number. Mm. Um, also, a deputy wrote us from California High School, called a, uh, one, one of the students, told them to go back to Mexico. She no longer is working at California High School, but where is she gonna work at now? Please uh, pay attention, and that's in the city of Whittier. But going back to the street vendors, like I said, this is traumatizing. The vendors are living day by day. They're not living paycheck to paycheck. They're living day by day. I have vendors calling me crying every weekend that they're losing all of their food. And what are they going to do? This is unacceptable. Please protect our street vendors. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Um, hi, I'm going to be speaking on 78F as well. So if I could get two minutes, please. All right, so my name is Ryan. Today I came here with the list of demands. I came here considering taking a different approach while speaking and talking to the board on the importance of each and every one of these demands. But the reality is that they already know. They already know that implementing the home enterprise kitchen would be great for the vendors. They already know that implementing the home enterprise kitchen will allow many vendors to qualify for permits. They already know that stopping the sweeps and raids on the street vendors will allow the vendors to have a chance at working in peace without that fear. They know that the attacks on street vendors has increased insanely. They know giving the street vendors their permits will truly help them. They know that street vending is a constant struggle that people take on because opportunities are truly limited. They know, they are aware of it all, but I'm going to keep it real. These people in front of us today, the whole board takes part in a system that oppresses the people. They take part in a system that terrorizes our people. They take part in a system that will forever be against our people of color and they do it willingly and proudly. And the reality is if they wanted to do something, they would have. But that's why I'm here today to tell each and every one of the board members that each and every one of your faces are now on camera. The people know how it really is. Do something, something, because you had this meeting canceled last week and CPC threatened the vendors about showing up too. And now the people are realizing how the Board of Supervisions is not 
for the street vendors, but very much against them. So when these re-elections come up, I will make sure that the people truly know. And to the people, whenever you see the police, the Department of Public Health, Public Safety, or anyone harassing the vendors, record them. Make sure you record them. And when you record any public official, ask them to identify themselves because that is your right and their policy. Record it all. Get their faces on that camera so the people know. If they want to keep messing with the street vendors, they are going to be held accountable and be exposed. This is for the people. This is for the people without the same opportunities as everyone else. The people that have no other choice but to try to hustle and work and street vend in order to feed their families. Think about it good, Board of Supervisions, because we're going to keep showing up to these meetings, to the stations, to the Departments of Public Health, and hold all of you accountable. Accountable. And to every city official out there, expect a visit whenever you want to fuck with the working class. Do not let this slip through one year and out the other, because each and every one of the choices from here on out is you. going to be follow up Thank with community you. accountability. Thank Madam you. Chair, Th Madam yes. Chair, can we get a report back from Public Health on that SB? I was yes. just about to yeah, say. you know, but and SB, you know, we asked for you to hold them accountable. Me, excuse me, SB nine seven two. I'd like to find out because actually I just read it really quickly. I think it's something the Public Health should give us a report back on okay. doing. It's already been signed into law. Yeah, I, I I would also agree and ask for Consumer and Business Affairs, Rafael yeah. Carvajal, mm -hmm. who's actually involved with all of this. Yes, maybe they can come and report at our meeting. next meeting. And if yeah. I can provide a point of clarification, uh, I think microenterprise grants require social security numbers because it's, coming, it's money coming from the state, so we should follow up. But let me clarify, we did not ask for socials for any of the vendors from Alpine Village wasn't state money used, so that is not true. They were not asked for Social Security, and hundreds of grants were issued to Alpine Village. So point of clarification, no Social Security number was asked for. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. One, just one last question for you, Ms. Janice. You know, you guys complain about, you know, homelessness and the rates of unemployment in um, Los Angeles County, but yet you guys are here letting the, um, you guys are letting the city officials attack the vendors, disrupting their work. Okay, so stop you. being clowns. Thank you. Thank Janice you. and Hilda, you guys okay. are clowns. Next speaker, please. Hi, I'm Donald Harlan. I'd like to speak on agenda item 6, 7, 22, 39, 41, 45, 42, 43, 48, 49, 51, 56, 78, 78D, 12, 13, 67, 68, uh, and a general public comment. Go ahead. Uh, uh, agenda item number 6. Uh, uh, about the data collection, uh, I would be careful about inviting new government agencies in to collect your data. Every time there's a new guy shows up, they want to start a new data set. Uh, you know that uh, when they leave office or they get busted out, they sell everybody's data. And the people they're selling it to think they own those people and that they get attacked. Uh, OK, uh, agenda item number 67, zoning amendments for three addresses on Willowbrook Avenue. Those are nuisance properties. They have fake addresses. They have modified assessor reports. All those properties there are there illegally. There's overlay. Agenda item number 68, planning and zoning disaster recovery. Uh, planning and zoning, uh, this is a theft of disaster recovery resources. I know you have a lot of illegal real estate developments and you owe money for disaster recovery emergencies infrastructure, but you shouldn't be stealing it. That's agenda item number 68. Uh, number 78, uh, supplemental agenda, uh, unemployment to undocumented workers. Yeah, you guys shouldn't be giving unemployment to undocumented workers. Uh, agenda item number 78D, housing, housing subsidies for illegal real estate development. Yeah, uh, you shouldn't be spending government money giving housing subsidies subsidies for illegal real estate development. You know, if a county supervisor is having a repeat conflict of interest, uh, handling the funding for the housing, that they're sponsoring it, endorsing it, then the county supervisor should be blocked from handling any finances concerning funding for housing. It should be blocked completely. Um, agenda item number seven, I reject your climate survey. It's looking for more illegal CEQA properties. Agenda item number 22, the 210 freeway, that's private property. Uh, number 39, real estate fraud notices from Core Logistics. 
Uh, Core Logistics is absolutely the wrong people to be handing out notices for anything. Those are the people you're trying to protect the data from. Uh, workforce innovation, number 41, workforce innovations and opportunity, local area plans. Yeah, uh, it looks like they're doing quite a bit more than innovating and creating opportunities that they're doing something else. Uh, and okay, number 45, the Santa Anita Canyon Road. Uh, can I get a general comment? Thank you. No, you, we, we gave you your time. Next speaker, oh. please. All available items and public comment, please. Highlighting agenda three, 78A, B, C, public comment. All right, um, expanding prevention services to support family first prevention. Um, you are directing, this is Han and Horvath, director of children and family services to enter a funding agreement for a strategic partnership, and what does it look like? What programs with these uh, nonprofits are you gonna support? A lot of the families, um, due to the federal funding, are incentivized for DCFS to snatch these kids under false pretenses and keep them for 15 months to get federal dollars. So or is that gonna address prevention as well? For families who are just maybe poor, that they're targeted, so I just want you to FYI, then Miss, um, sorry, Holly Mitchell, I forgot your name for a minute. Um, your parents worked in the DCFS sector, right? So you know the agenda that it is to keep kids for money in the system. So let's really be transparent on agenda number three. 78B and C, recognizing Armenian genocide. I'm gonna put this out here. Right? So I know Barger, Solis, and everyone else likes to highlight Armenian genocide, but where is the smoke for Black History Month? For black families in general, what happened to chattel slavery that we're still figuring out through reparations? But yet the Holocaust survivors that didn't happen here got their reparations. Everybody else got their Japanese internment camp survivors, got their reparations. Armenian genocide is talked about during Black History Month. I'm saying no shade to the Armenians, but stop skipping over chattel slavery in the history that this country afforded people like you a better life in the suburbs while we have to live in the hood, right? With less education, dirty streets, and then you keep blaming black people for being so violent when you put the guns and drugs in our neighborhoods, right? So I need us to be transparent. Please do not put any more Armenian anything without talking about chattel slavery. I don't see any of that on any agenda any time of the year. While you're rolling your eyes, Ms. Hilda Solis, it doesn't apply to you. I want you to be very careful on how you approach us who is talking here to speak on public issues. Respect the black woman, respect a black man working just the same. And I'm very proud of Ryan, Alex, and Osvaldo speaking up for undocumented. It's very important that we gotta work together. Government wants to divide black and brown, and I'm telling you right now, the politicians, the way it's set up is going to crumble. It is power to the people. So you either work for the people's interest. Thank I you. put you in those seats. Thank you. Next All speaker, right. please. Milo, I'm speaking on a public comment. Uh, my name is Alika Valdez. Aloha. Hey, so why are we doing this? Why are we still doing this um, BS, uh, um, harassing street vendors? Why? Actually, got stuff this way. So I think when the meeting started at 9.30 a.m. In, um, in the morning, um, I think we should do the same as um, uh, LS, L, a, LASD uh, um, gang sheriff or wh whatever you call those um, those um, baby name kind of thing. We should, uh, so if they um, harass one of our equipment as well, or neither anybody, it's in the government uh, official, anybody that you hire affiliated with the government official, try to touch their property. Um, we don't need this. We don't need any of this. We don't need you guys. No, nada. You know what? As in Hawaii, we're gonna take it back. We're gonna we're gonna 
We can do this. We're going to fight against you guys. We're going to throw you guys out. So, uh, so are you here, here the Solis? We're going to do that. We're going to replace you. We're going to overthrow you. Thank you. Mahalo. Next speaker. Oh, we're going to go to the telephone now. May we have the next speaker on the telephone? We'll go to Roy Humphreys. Uh, please state your item numbers that you would like to address today. And if you want to speak on general public comment. Mr. Humphreys, you are open. One more try, Mr. Humphreys. Uh, moving along, we will go to the line of Anthony Arenas. Uh, please state the item numbers you wish to address and whether you want to speak on public comment. Please go ahead. My name is Anthony Arenas from District 3 in the Justice LA Coalition, and I want to speak on item 1555 and general public comment. For item 15, I think that the problem with overcrowding at the IRC is not furniture layout or, um, or new paint. The problem is the volume of people that the county is processing into jail every day. And no state-of-the-art jail will ever help the county reduce its incarceration problem. The inhumane conditions inside the IRC has to be addressed at the root, so long as houseless people are arrested for acts of survival, so long as people with mental health needs are being arrested instead of connected with services, so long as black people are being arrested for simply existing, no amount of remodeling will ever improve conditions. And for item 55, I think that the county has had a nearly endless string of warnings and last chances yet the county continues to be tangled up in labor agreements that prioritize employee demands instead of the needs of the nearly 400 young people that are in detention and hobbled by inconsistent leadership and oversight. And I think it's tragic that the Board of State and Community Corrections got cold feet and voted to keep the halls open for a few more weeks. And this board should, the board should know that by now, LA County's juvenile probation operation is fully beyond repair. And um, for general public comment, just reiterating some direct and immediate investment needs, the full funding of CFCI has to be a top priority for LA County. We need the full funding of CFCI in order to close Men's Central Jail. And our county's budget is a reflection of our county's values and leadership. The Board of Supervisors and the CEO's office spend billions of dollars on policing, surveillance, prosecution, and incarceration. And for decades, community members and community-based coalitions have pushed the county to shift spending away from the prison industrial complex in order to reflect the values of Angelines. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Madam Chair, there are no other speakers in queue to address the board. Okay. Um, Seeing uh, no speakers, um, please, uh, Executive Officer, indicate the agenda items on which we'll be voting. The following items are before you. One through three, four with Supervisor Mitchell and Barger abstaining from the vote. Six, eight and nine, 11 through 17. 19 with Supervisor Mitchell and Barger abstaining from the vote. 20, 22, 24 and 25. 26 with Supervisor Mitchell and Barger abstaining from the vote. 28 with Supervisor Mitchell and Barger abstaining from the vote. 30 through 41. 42 with Supervisor Barger recusing herself from the vote pursuant to government code 84308. 43 through 49. 51 through 62. 63 with Supervisor Barger recusing herself from the vote pursuant to Government Code 84308. 64 through 77, 78A through 78C. 78D with Supervisor Mitchell abstaining from the vote. 78F with Supervisor Mitchell and Barger abstaining from the vote. 78G with Supervisor Bar Barger recusing herself from the vote pursuant to Government Code 84308, 78H, 2D through 5D, 1P. Thank you. Um, moved by Supervisor Solis, seconded by Supervisor Horvath to approve these items with exceptions noted by the Executive Officer. Executive Officer, please call the roll. 
Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Horvath. Aye. Supervisor Horvath. Aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Aye. Motion carries five to zero. Okay, at this time it would be appropriate to hear adjournments, and I will begin mine. Um, and I wanted to start with one. I know a family member has been sitting in the audience uh, most of the day uh, to be here when we adjourned uh, for his father. So I move that when we adjourn today, we, we adjourn in the memory of uh, Fred Crevea, uh, who was part of our county family. He was a senior capital projects manager with our Department of Public Works. Fred grew up in the San Gabriel Valley, attended USC, where he obtained a bachelor's degree in, in architecture, and was a licensed architect with over 35 years of experience. He lived in San Pedro and was a diehard USC and Chargers football fan. Fred was an outstanding county employee and served its residents with pride and dignity. He was very diligent, hardworking, lovable, always wearing a welcoming smile. Some of his major projects included Rancho Los Amigos Sports Center, Rancho Los Amigos South Campus Demolition, San Pedro Health Center, Interim Housing, San Pedro Courthouse Redevelopment, and so much more. Fred was instrumental in the delivery of the San Pedro Health Center Interim Housing in my district. And we completed this project in record time uh, because Fred worked so tirelessly to make that happen. He will be missed. He left an indelible mark at the county for his contributions. I will say that so many of those uh, projects uh, were in my district, and I was able to um, go to openings and ribbon cuttings of the projects that he worked on. He is survived by his son, Matthew, uh, who I believe is with us, um, his daughter-in-law, Ashley, three adorable granddaughters, Ayana, Anaya, and Myla, and his sister, Lisa. And I think it would be appropriate uh, for all members since he was part of our county family. That's all right with everybody. Thank you. Um, I also move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in the memory of Tony Miera, who was a much respected public servant as well as a church and community leader um, he passed away uh, April 6th. He was a fixture at Los Angeles City Hall and a pillar of the community in his home of Monterey Park um, and Miraculous Metal Church. Tony served in the U.S. Navy from 1949 to 1953. He served as a corpsman at the San Diego Naval Hospital, participated in underwater demolition training, played on the U.S. Navy baseball team in the Pacific Theater, and saw combat duty in the Korean War. After Korea, Tony enrolled in the University of New Mexico, where he was an All-American on the UNM Lobos basketball team and earned a bachelor's degree in business. He worked for eight years as an accountant for the county uh, before the city of Los Angeles recruited him to work at the Data Service Bureau, which is now called ITA over at the city. And after several years, he earned a promotion to the City of Los Angeles Controller's Office, where he remained until retirement. He worked in management roles at the Los Angeles City Controller's Office, where he eventually was promoted to the top non-elected position of Chief Deputy Controller. He worked for four controllers, starting with Charles Navarro, Ira Reiner, Rick Tuttle, and my brother, Jim Hahn. He truly was a leader in Los Angeles city government who will be remembered for his over 40 years of public service. No one in the city had a bad thing to say about him and my brother uh, really wanted us to take a moment and honor him today at our meeting. He was a devout Catholic. He was a parishioner of Our Lady of the Miraculous Medal for 65 years and served as an usher for over 40 years and as the controller for finance. At Miraculous Metal, Tony served as Scoutmaster for over 20 years, where he transformed Troop 375 into one of the outstanding troops in the country. He shepherded over 50 boys to the rank of Eagle Scout. Tony was recognized by the Boy Scouts of America as an exemplary leader. Tony survived by his wife of 67 years, Lupita, his children, Anthony and Paul, and grandchildren, Sophia, AJ, and Natalie. We thank him for his service 
um, for all those years to the city of Los Angeles. Um, and then I'd also uh, like to adjourn in the memory of a dear friend of mine, Lisa Jimenez. Uh, Lisa uh, began her life as a newly adopted baby in San Pedro on March 23rd, 1955. She attended local schools, graduated from San Pedro High in 1972 at the age of 17. She attended Los Angeles Harbor College. She proudly attained her nursing degree and became an RN. Lisa was a dynamic woman. She was an operating room nurse by profession and also worked in other hospital departments throughout her career. In her first marriage um, to Joel uh, Borkowitz, she helped raise two young girls, Crystal and Alicia. After their divorce, she widened her work experience as a galley cook on local sport fishing boats out of San Pedro. Lisa then met Julian Jimenez in 1995, and they married. Julian was an employee for LA City Department of Rec and Parks, and Julian and Lisa were best known as the last residents of the Point Furman Lighthouse. They actually lived there for many years. And Lisa began uh, being involved in restoring that lighthouse, restoring the Redman Lodge, and became involved in supporting pyrotechnic teams, putting on local firework shows until Julian's passing. Lisa was an officer of the Point Furman Lighthouse Society, head Pocahontas for the Redman Lodge, where she represented San Pedro at the State of California Conventions. And after she retired, she became a volunteer at Little Company of Mary, where she encouraged young nurse interns to continue their career paths. During what would be the last chapter of her life, Lisa was in a loving relationship with Joseph Bustamante, another San Pedro local who works for the city of LA as an LAPD equipment mechanic, taking care of motorcycles and all types of vehicles in the city. They were going to get married eventually. Lisa was a great cook, a cat lover. She had a green thumb. She was an amazing person. She loved San Pedro. She dedicated her life to working in and around town. Uh, she walked in the morning, and when I would do my walk, I would always see her, uh, and we would exchange greetings. Her sudden passing on March 19th leaves a large hole um, in the San Pedro community, and I know she leaves a large hole in her fiance, Joe. She was a gift to all of us, and she'll be greatly missed. Thank you. My turn. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that when we adjourn today, we do so in memory of Yang Bing Yi, founder of a popular restaurant chain, Din Te Fung, who passed away on March 26, 2023, at the age of 96. Born in 1927 in China, Mr. Yang fled to Taiwan in the summer of 1948 when civil war erupted on the mainland. <clears throat> in Taiwan, he worked as a delivery man for Hang Tai Fung, a small shop that sold cooking oil. He later took charge of the shop's accounts and the inventory. When he was 28, he married Miss Lei Pen Mai, a co-worker. The couple worked together until the shop closed and opened Din Tai Fung as a cooking oil shop. Yang opened the modest storefront in 1958 in Taiwan, and the restaurant is now in 170 locations across Taiwan and available in 13 countries. It offers a menu that includes such specialties as wontons in red chili oil, shredded tofu and seaweed, seafood salad, and steamed truffle and pork dumplings. Tin Tai Fung is credited with introducing its famous soup dumpling, which was known to the global market outside of China. In 1993, Din Tai Fung was included in the New York Times list of 10 top-notch tables from around the world. He will, deeply, he will be deeply missed across the globe for his remarkable contributions. Yang is survived by his sons, Kevin and Warren. Also that we adjourn in memory of Kelly Ann Gargan, who passed away on March 10th, 2023. She is the daughter of longtime Los Angeles County Department of Parks and Recreation employee, Jonathan Gargan, who serves as the deputy director of the North County Community Services Agency. Kellyanne worked at the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department for 23 years from 2000 to 2023. She enjoyed crafts, needlepoint, and watching the Rams and NASCAR. She will be remembered as a devoted daughter, wife, and mother, and being a vibrant member in service to her community. Kellyanne is survived by her husband, Danny Millard, their sons, Hunter and Hayden, 
her parents, Terry and Jonathan Gargan, as well as her sisters and extended families. Also that we adjourn in memory of Virginia Samples uh, Gillot, who went by Ginny and was a resident of Laverne and passed away on March 23rd at the age of 96. Jenny was born August 18th, 1926 in Edison, Nebraska. She was artistically gifted from a young age. She played the French horn in her school band and won first place at a state competition. She married John Gelotte in 1948 and the couple moved to Claremont where they raised their three daughters. She was a talented designer and seamstress designing gowns for girls and costumes for local musical theater companies. In 2001, she and John moved to Hillcrest, a retirement community in Laverne. There, she co-founded the Thespians Hillcrest Theater Group. She was also a mentor at Camp Afrobaugh Page, where she enjoyed working with the boys and had a special knack for communicating with them, helping them with crafts and providing guidance and socialization skills. Jenny was preceded in death by her husband, John, sister, Twyla, and brothers, Gifford and Paul. She survived by her three daughters, Robin, Susan, and Lori, three grandchildren, Marty, Jonathan, and Catherine, and several great-grandchildren, nieces, and nephews. She will be deeply missed. Also, we adjourn in memory of Kent R. Keller, a Los Angeles-based attorney who passed away on April 9, 2023. Born in Springfield, Missouri, he received his JD from Washington University in 1968 and moved to LA to begin his 55-year career as a litigator. In 1976, he was founding partner of Barger and & Woolen and its managing partner from 1994 to 2014. He was an accomplished trial and appellate lawyer, respected by co-counsel and opposing counsel alike. Joining Wilshire Country Club in 1979, he served two terms as president. As an avid golfer, he was the winner of Wilshire's Macbeth Invitational and served on the board of Southern California Golf Association. Kent is survived by his wife, Jean Scott, who's also a reserve sheriff's deputy, daughter, Angela Keller, son, Brian Keller, and granddaughter, Adrian Keller Feld. Also, we adjourn in memory of Will Willis Meeks, a Pasadena resident and JPL's first Ameri African American flight manage project manager who passed away March 21st, 2023 at the age of 85. Willis Meeks was born on January 19, 1938, in Harlan, Kentucky. He enlisted in the US Air Force after graduating high school in 1956. He was trained as a missile guidance system specialist and a cryptology, cryptology supervisor, working in the development and testing of the Minuteman Intercontinental Ballistic Missile, which was and remains the United States' first line of defense from enemy attack. Willis was honorably discharged in 1964 and worked at the Air Force Western Test Range. He earned his bachelor and master's degree from Cal State LA in eight years while juggling marriage and raising four children. He later, later studied international business at Stanford University. He landed at JPL in 1966, serving as network controller for NASA's Deep Space Tracking Network, then serving as project engineer for planetary space missions such as the Surveyor, Surveyor, Mars, and Venus missions, and Helios, the first and closest mission to the sun. In 1990, Willis became JPL's first African-American flight project manager, leading the U Ulysses Probe, a $750 million partnership between NASA and the European Space Agency to assess Earth's solar environment. U Ulysses operated for 15 years and was the longest running spacecraft operated by the ESA. While at JPL, Willis developed programs to recruit underrepresented minorities from historically black colleges and universities and other minority institutions. He also mentored at-risk youth, starting adopt-a-school programs throughout Los Angeles, Pasadena, and Altadena. He retired in 1996, ending a 37-year aerospace career. In retirement, he went on to serve family, church, and the community. He will be deeply missed. Willis is survived by his wife, Magdalene Powell Meeks, and four children, Larry Meeks, Pamela Moore, Eric Meeks, and Shauna Ricks, as well as six grandchildren and seven great-grandchildren. And then also, I think we're all gonna wanna join in on this one. Um, I'm moved that when we adjourn today, we do so in memory of Vartkis Nigerian, father of Glendale City Council member Ara Nigerian, who passed away on April 15th, 2023 at his home in Glendale. He was born April 4th, 1930 in Kassab, Syria, 
to Haga and and Evangelic, help me, I cannot, I'm tongue twisted, to a minister and Rebecca. At an early age, the family moved to Beirut, Lebanon. After attending the Armenian high school, he graduated from the Armenian University of Beirut and received a scholarship to enter the AUB Medical School. He graduated from medical school in 1957 and, became, and came to the United States to continue his medical training. After an internship in New Jersey, he went to Chicago, where he trained under the famous Dr. Humper Kalikian. In 1958, while in Chicago, he married Mary Kravorkian, a registered nurse and an AUB graduate. He completed his orthopedic training at Mount Sinai Hospital in Cleveland, Ohio, where he settled down and raised four children, Arm, Ada, Armin, Rafi, and Mono. In 1980, the family moved to California to be closer to his extended family in the flourishing Armenian community. He started his private orthopedic practice in Glendale, where he pioneered the first weekly successful health program on Armenian television. Throughout his life, he always made sure to give back to the people of Armenia. In 1988, he started a humanitarian organization, medical outreach for Armenians to facilitate his many charitable activities. In 1991, Dr. Najarian and his friends in Los Angeles purchased and delivered Alankio radio systems to the army, which was crucial in turning the tide to victory for the Armenian and Artsakh forces. Farkas received many awards throughout his life, including the Vachtin Humanitarian Medal from Artsakh, the Soviet Medal of Honor, the Nell Reagan Award, the Fritchin Nansen Award from the Russian International Humanitarian Organization, the Ellis Island Medal of Freedom, and Presidential Medal of Honors from Artsakh President Ardi Gogushian, Bako Shashikian, and Armenian President Sarj Sarkikian. His contributions to the medical field and the Armenian community will not be forgotten. He is survived by his wife, Mary, his sons, Ara, Armin, Rafi, and Morrow, as well as several grandchildren and great-grandson, great all members on that one. And then last, uh, I move that, well, I've got two more, I'm sorry. We, I'm, we move today, move in memory, adjourn in memory of John Monroe, better known as Jack, who was a longtime resident of Claremont, Jack was born October 22, 1938, in Girard, Ohio. He attended the University College of Notre Dame, where he studied education. He was a member of the Notre Dame Hounds football team that won the uh, provincial championship in 1957. He transferred to the University of Ottawa, where he earned his BA in 1961 and received his MA from the University of Laverne. In 1962, he married the love of his life, Carol, and the pair moved to California. He was a cherished ed educator at Nogales High School in La Puente for 38 years. For many of those years, he was also known as the voice of the nobles as he announced the school's home football games. With their three children, Jack and Carol, frequently traveled to the United, through, across the United States and Mexico. He was a lively conversationalist and was passionate about driving positive change in his community. He is survived by his wife, Carolee, their three children, Murray, Gabe, and Mary, and six grandchildren. Last, we adjourn in memory of Jefferson Jeff Wheeler, longtime resident of Santa Clarita. He lived a life full of love, family, and service to the community. Jeff worked for the Los Angeles County Department of Parks and Rec for 33 years, serving the community of the North Region through many roles, including regional recreation director, regional operations manager, and retiring as the assistant director in 2001. Jeff also worked on the first Parks and Recreation Commission for the city of Santa Clarita. He survived by his wife, Carol, and their children, Scott and Jennifer, as well as many grandchildren and extended family. Those are my adjournments. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, oh, Supervisor Solis, I see is not here. Um, Supervisor Mitchell. Thank you very much. Um, Madam Chair, first of all, I'm, I'm sorry they left, I wanted to thank the LASA team that were here um, in the boardroom today and, and for their efforts to, to back up our staff in providing um, assistance to some of our unhoused um, witnesses that came today. So thank you to the LASA team who was here. Uh, this is a, a former member of the county family, so I hope that you will all uh, uh, join me in this 
adjournment, and I ask that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in the memory of Ginger Irvine Barnard. Ms. Irvine Barnard was born on December 8, 28, 1942, in La Crosse, Washington, and passed away April 4th at the age of 80 in Playa del Rey. In 1960, she relocated to California to attend San Diego State University, where she graduated in 1964 with a Bachelor of Arts in Sociology and English. Shortly after graduating, she began working for LA County as a social worker for the Bureau of Public Assistance, now known as the Department of Public Social Services. After 10 years with DPSS, she promoted to the role of legislative analyst and then the chief legislative analyst for the chief administrative office. In preparation for the 1984 Olympics and at the direction of, the, of a board motion, Ms. Irvine Barnard helped stand up the county's office of protocol where she served as the deputy chief protocol officer for 22 years before retiring in 2005 completing her 41 years of dedicated service to the county. She co-founded the Protocol and Diplomacy International Protocol Officers Association and the first professional association for protocol officers from around the world. She was a board member of the International Visitors Council of LA from 1984 to 2013 and a proud member of the Junior League of Los Angeles for 27 years. In 2019, she received the Spirit of Volunteerism Award she also served as the 63rd president of the Wilshire E. Bell from 2018 to 2020. Ms. Irvine Barnard loved traveling, world affairs, and fine dining. She will be remembered as a devoted wife, mother, grandmother, sister, friend, and mentor, as well as a world traveler, volunteer, and fashionista. She is survived by her husband of over 50 years, John her son, Scott, three grandchildren, Chloe, Kai, and Morgan, three sisters, Angel, Georgine, and Janice, as well as a host of extended family and friends who will miss her dearly, as well as the members of the county family who honor her service. Thank you, Madam Chair. May I join in on that? I mean, yes, I, I would of, like to join in too. I know yeah. she worked with my dad. Yeah, and when I think of protocol, I mm -hmm. think of Ginger. I mean, mm -hmm. she epitomized mm -hmm. um, what, you know, what we want to mm -hmm. uh, achieve when we host um, dignitaries from other countries, mm -hmm. and she, she thrived. She loved mm -hmm. doing it. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Well, I'd ask, given her uh, uh, mm -hmm. extended tenure as a county employee, that we all sign on. Mm -hmm. That would be possible. Good idea. Thank you so much. Okay, Supervisor Horvath. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have two adjournments today. Uh, first, I would move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Shaul G. Masri, who died on April 11th at 92. He was a resident of Beverly Hills. Dr. Shaul Masri was a pioneer in renal medicine and professor emeritus at USC's Keck School of Medicine. Dr. Masri's impact on the medical field was enormous through his breakthrough research on renal disease. He taught, mentored, and conducted research in the field for over 60 years with his longest service as Chief of Nephrology at USC from 1974 to 2000. He also held roles at UCLA and Cedars-Sinai. He was a passionate advocate for organ transplants as an alternative to dialysis. He successfully reached out to Jewish, Islamic, and Catholic leaders, including the Pope, to garner their support for transplantation. Dr. Masri and his wife, Myra, uh, founded the Shaul G. Masri Foundation in 1996, a nonprofit that promotes education and research in nephrology, physiology, and related fields. Born in Iraq in 1930, Dr. Masri fled Iraq to Israel in 1950, where those of the Jewish faith could attain citizenship. His mother and siblings followed one year later. He completed his medical education in Jerusalem. He, he met his wife while conducting breakthrough research in the Negev Desert on the impact of heat on human physiology. With their two children, the couple came to America for a fellowship at Georgetown University. Los Angeles became home after receiving a prestigious, prestigious role with the American Heart Association. Once in LA, the couple welcomed two additional children to their family. Dr. Masri contributed immensely to the field of medicine, a career he loved deeply. So much so, he often commented that it was his hobby. He was eternally grateful to have such a wonderful life partner of 62 years, who he is survived by, in addition to their four children, Effie Kogan, Guy Masri, Yael Masri, and Dina Masri, and seven beloved grandchildren. 
And I would also move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of George H. Moreland, the San Fernando Valley's first African-American physician in private practice. George, Moore, George H. Moreland died on March 24th. He was 97. I'm honoring Dr. Moreland because of his many years of dedicated service providing medical care to the San Fernando Valley. His first office was located on Van Nuys Boulevard in Pacoima, and he later moved his family practice office to Silmar. Dr. Moreland was born in Pawnee, not Indiana, Pawnee, Oklahoma, to a family of celebrated educators. We attended where he attended Southwestern College in Kansas before being drafted into the US Navy where he served for three years. Upon returning to school and graduating, he moved to Los Angeles in the late 1940s. While working at UCLA Harbor General Hospital, he met Claudia Bishop. They married in 1952. Dr. Moreland was invested in his local community. He was a lifelong member of the NAACP. He was a founder of the Pacoima First Methodist Church and president of the LA chapter of Sigma Pi Phi Fraternity. He was also on the board of the California Community Foundation. He was preceded in death by his wife of 61 years. He is survived by his daughters, Pamela and Judith, and many nieces and nephews. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, that concludes, uh, oh no, we will take all those motions as seconded, and if there's no objection to unanimous vote, that will be the action. That concludes uh, today's meeting. We will have a special closed session on Monday, April 24th, and then our next regular meeting of the board will be held on Tuesday, May 2nd, 2023.